Chitra by Rabindranath Tagore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Characters Gods Madana, Eros Read by Thomas Peter Vasanta, Licorice Read by Alan Mapstone Mortals Chitra, daughter of the king of Manipur Read by Avai Arjuna, a prince of the house of the Kuros. He is one of the Kshatriya, or warrior caste, and during the action is living as a hermit retired in the forest. Read by Todd Villagers from an outlying district of Manipur Read by Sonia Stage directions, read by phone Note The dramatic poem Chitra has been performed in India without scenery, the actors being surrounded by the audience. Proposals for its production here having been made to him, he went through this translation and provided stage directions, but wished these omitted if it were printed as a book. Scene 1 Art thou the god with the five darts, the god of love? I am he who was the firstborn in the heart of the Creator. I bind in bonds of pain and bliss the lives of men and women. I know, I know what that pain is, and those bonds. And who art thou, my lord? I am his friend, Vasanta, the king of the seasons. Death and decrepitude would wear the world to the bone, but that I follow them, and constantly attack them. I am eternal youth. I bow to thee, Lord Vasanta. But what stern vow is thine, fair stranger? Why dost thou wither thy fresh youth with penance and mortification? Such a sacrifice is not fit for the worship of love. Who art thou, and what is thy prayer? I am Chitra, the daughter of the kingly house of Manipur. With godlike grace, Lord Shiva promised to my royal grandsire an unbroken line of male descent. Nevertheless, the divine word proved powerless to change the spark of life in my mother's womb. So invincible was my nature, woman though I be. I know. That is why thy father brings thee up as his son. He has taught thee the use of the bow and all the duties of a king. Yes, that is why I am dressed in a man's attire and have left the seclusion of a woman's chamber. I know no feminine wiles for winning hearts. My hands are strong to bend the bow, but I have never learned Cupid's archery, the play of eyes. That requires no schooling, fair one. The eye does its work untaught, and he knows how well who is struck in the heart. One day, in search of game, I roved alone to the forest on the bank of the Purna River. Tying my horse to a tree trunk, I entered a dense thicket on the track of a deer. I found a narrow, sinuous path meandering through the dusk of the entangled boughs, the foliage vibrated with the chirping of crickets, when of a sudden I came upon a man lying on a bed of dried leaves across my path. I asked him haughtily to move aside, but he heeded not. Then with the sharp end of my bow I pricked him in contempt. Instantly he leapt up with straight, tall limbs like a sudden tongue of fire from a heap of ashes. An amused smile flickered round the corners of his mouth, perhaps at the sight of my boyish countenance. Then, for the first time in my life, I felt myself a woman and knew that a man was before me. At the auspicious hour I teach the man and the woman this supreme lesson to know themselves. What happened after that? With fear and wonder I asked him, Who are you? I am Arjuna, he said, of the great Kuru clan. I stood petrified like a statue and forgot to do him obeisance. Was this indeed Arjuna, the one great idol of my dreams? Yes, I had long ago heard how he had vowed a twelve-year celibacy. 
many a day my young ambition had spurred me on to break my lance with him to challenge him in disguise to single combat and prove my skill in arms against him ah foolish heart whither fled thy presumption could i but exchange my youth with all its aspirations for the clod of earth under his feet i should deem it a most precious grace i know not in what whirlpool of thought i was lost when suddenly i saw him vanish through the trees o oh, foolish woman neither didst thou greet him nor speak a word nor beg forgiveness but stoodest like a barbarian boar while he contemptuously walked away next morning i laid aside my man's clothing i donned bracelets anklets waist chain and a gown of purple red silk the unaccustomed dress clung about my shrinking shame but i hastened on my quest and found arjuna in the forest temple of shiva tell me the story to the end i am the heart-born god and i understand the mystery of these impulses only vaguely can i remember what things i said and what answer i got do not ask me to tell you all shame fell on me like a thunderbolt yet could not break me to pieces so utterly hard so like a man am i his last words as i walked home pricked my ears like red-hot needles i have taken the vow of celibacy i am not fit to be thy husband oh the vows of a man surely thou knowest thou god of love that unnumbered saints and sages have surrendered the merits of their lifelong penance at the feet of a woman i broke my bow in two and burned my arrows in the fire i hated my strong lithe arms scored by drawing the bowstring o oh, love god love thou hast laid low in the dust the vain pride of my manlike strength and all my man's training lies crushed under thy feet now teach me thy lessons give me the power of the weak and the weapon of the unarmed hand i will be thy friend i will bring the world conquering arjuna a captive before thee to accept his rebellion sentence at thy hand had i but the time needed i could win his heart by slow degrees and ask no help to the gods I would stand by his side as a comrade, drive the fierce horses of his war chariot, attend him in the pleasures of the chase, keep guard at night at the entrance of his tent, and help him in all the great duties of a kshatriya, rescuing the weak and meeting out justice where it is due. Surely at last the day would have come for him to look at me and wonder, what boy is this? Has one of my slaves in a former life followed me like my good deeds into this? I am not the woman who nourishes her despair in lonely silence, feeding it with nightly tears and covering it with the daily patient smile a widow from her birth. The flower of my desire shall never drop into the dust before it has ripened to fruit. But it is the labour of a lifetime to make one's true self known and honoured. Therefore I have come to thy door, thou world-vanquishing love, and thou, Vasanta, youthful lord of the seasons, take from my body this primal injustice, an unattractive plainness. For a single day make me superbly beautiful, even as beautiful as was the sudden blooming of love in my heart. Give me but one brief day of perfect beauty, and I will answer for the days that follow." lady i grant thy prayer not for the short span of a day but for one whole year the charm of spring blossoms shall nestle round thy limbs scene two was i dreaming or was what i saw by the lake truly there sitting on the mossy turf I mused over bygone years in the sloping shadows of the evening, when slowly there came out from the folding darkness of foliage an apparition of beauty in the perfect form of a woman, and stood on a white slab of stone at the water's brink. It seemed that the heart of the earth must heave in joy under her bare white feet. 
methought the vague veilings of her body should melt in ecstasy into air as the golden mist of dawn melts from off the snowy peak of the eastern hill. She bowed herself above the shining mirror of the lake and saw the reflection of her face. She started up in awe and stood still, and then smiled, and with a careless sweep of her left arm unloosed her hair and let it trail on the earth at her feet. She bared her bosom and looked at her arms, so flawlessly modeled and instinct with an exquisite caress. Bending her head, she saw the sweet blossoming of her youth and the tender bloom and blush of her skin. She beamed with a glad surprise. So, if the white lotus bud on opening her eyes in the morning were to arch her neck and see her shadow in the water, would she wonder at herself the live-long day? But a moment after, the smile passed from her face, and a shade of sadness crept into her eyes. She bound up her tresses, drew her veil over her arms, and, sighing slowly, walked away like a beauteous evening, fading into the night. To me, the supreme fulfillment of desire seemed to have been revealed in a flash, and then to have vanished. But who is it that pushes the door? Enter Chitra, dressed as a woman. Ah! It is she! Quiet, my heart. Fear me not, lady. I am a Kshatriya. Honored sir, you are my guest. I live in this temple. I know not in what way I can show you hospitality. Fair lady, the very sight of you is indeed the highest hospitality. If you will not take it amiss, I would ask you a question. You have permission. What stern vow keeps you immured in this solitary temple, depriving all mortals of a vision of so much loveliness? I harbor a secret desire in my heart, for the fulfillment of which I offer daily prayers to Lord Shiva. Alas, what can you desire, you who are the desire of the whole world? From the easternmost hill on whose summit the morning sun first prints his fiery foot to the end of the sunset land have I travelled. I have seen whatever is most precious, beautiful, and great on the earth. My knowledge shall be yours. Only say for what or for whom you seek. He whom I seek is known to all. Indeed. Who may this favorite of the gods be, whose fame has captured your heart? Sprung from the highest of all royal houses, the greatest of all heroes is he. Lady, offer not such wealth of beauty as is yours on the altar of false reputation. Spurious fame spreads from tongue to tongue like the fog of the early dawn before the sun rises. Tell me who, in the highest of kingly lines, is the supreme hero. Hermit, you are jealous of other men's fame. Do you not know that all over the world the royal house of the Kurus is the most famous? The house of the Kurus? And have you never heard of the greatest name of that far-famed house? From your own lips let me hear it. Arjuna, the conqueror of the world. I have culled from the mouths of the multitude that imperishable name and hidden it with care in my maiden heart. Hermit, why do you look perturbed? Has that name only a deceitful glitter? Say so, and I will not hesitate to break this casket of my heart and throw the false gem to the dust. Be his name and fame, his bravery and prowess false or true. For mercy's sake, do not banish him from your heart, for he kneels at your feet, even now. You? Arjuna? Yes, I am he, the love-hungered guest at your door. Then is it not true that Arjuna has taken a vow of chastity for twelve long years? But you have dissolved my vow, even as the moon dissolves the night's vow of obscurity. Oh, shame upon you! What have you seen in me that makes you false to yourself? Whom do you seek in these dark eyes, in these milk-white arms, if you are ready to pay for her the price of your probity? Not my true self, I know. Surely this cannot be love. This is not a man's highest homage to woman. Alas, that this frail disguise, the body, should make one blind to the light of the deathless spirit. Yes, now indeed, I know, Arjuna, the fame of your heroic manhood is false. Ah, 
I feel how vain is fame, the pride of prowess. Everything seems to me a dream. You alone are perfect. You are the wealth of the world, the end of all poverty, the goal of all efforts, the one woman. Others there are who can be but slowly known, while to see you for a moment is to see the perfect completeness once and for ever. Alas, it is not I, not I, Arjuna. It is the deceit of a god. Go, go, my hero, go. Woo not falsehood, offer not your great heart to an illusion. Go. Scene 3 no, impossible, to face that fervent gaze that almost grasps you like clutching hands of the hungry spirit within, to feel his heart struggling to break its bounds, urging its passionate cry through the entire body, and then to send him away like a beggar. No, impossible. Enter Madonna and Fasanta. Ah, God of love, what fearful flame is this with which thou hast enveloped me? I burn, and I burn whatever I touch. I desire to know what happened last night. At evening I lay down on a grassy bed strewn with the petals of spring flowers and recollected the wonderful praise of my beauty I had heard from Arjuna, drinking drop by drop the honey that I had stored during the long day. The history of my past life, like that of my former existences, was forgotten. I felt like a flower which has but a few fleeting hours to listen to all the humming flatteries and whispered murmurs of the woodlands, and then must lower its eyes from the sky, bend its head, and at a breath give itself up to the dust without a cry, thus ending the short story of a perfect moment that has neither past nor future. The limitless life of glory can bloom and spend itself in a morning. Like an endless meaning in the narrow span of a song. The southern breeze caressed me to sleep. From the flowering Malati bower overheard, silent kisses dropped over my body. On my hair, my breast, my feet, each flower chose a bed to die on. I slept. And suddenly, in the depth of my sleep, I felt as if some intense eager look, like tapering fingers of flame, touched my slumbering body. I started up and saw the hermit standing before me. The moon had moved to the west, peering through the leaves to espy this wonder of divine art wrought in a fragile human frame. The air was heavy with perfume, the silence of the night was vocal with the chirping of crickets, the reflections of the trees hung motionless in the lake, and with his staff in his hands he stood, tall and straight and still, like a forest tree. It seemed to me that I had, on opening my eyes, died to all realities of life and undergone a dream birth into a shadow land. Shame slipped to my feet like loosened clothes. I heard his call, Beloved, my most beloved, and all my forgotten lives united as one and responded to it. I said, take me, take all I am, and I stretched out my arms to him. The moon set behind the trees, one curtain of darkness covered all. Heaven and earth, time and space, pleasure and pain, death and life, merged together in an unbearable ecstasy. With the first gleam of light, the first twitter of birds, I rose up and sat leaning on my left arm. He lay asleep with a vague smile about his lips like the crescent moon in the morning. The rosy red glow of the dawn fell upon his noble forehead. I sighed and stood up. I drew together the leafy lianas to screen the streaming sun from his face. I looked about me and saw the same old earth. I remembered what I used to be, and ran, and ran like a deer afraid of her own shadow, through the forest path strewn with shepali flowers. I found a lonely nook, and sitting down covered my face with both hands, and tried to weep and cry. 
but no tears came to my eyes. Alas, thou daughter of mortals! I stole from the divine storehouse the fragrant wine of heaven, filled with it one earthly night to the brim, and placed it in thy hand to drink. Yet still I hear this cry of anguish. Chitra, bitterly. Who drank it? The rarest completion of life's desire, the first union of love, was proffered to me, but was wrested from my grasp. This borrowed beauty, this falsehood that enwraps me, will slip from me, taking with it the only monument of that sweet union, as the petals fall from an overblown flower, and the woman ashamed of her naked poverty will sit weeping day and night. Lord, love, this cursed appearance companions me like a demon, robbing me of all the prizes of love, all the kisses for which my heart is athirst. Alas! How vain thy single night had been! The bark of joy came in sight, but the waves would not let it touch the shore. Heaven came so close to my hand that I forgot for a moment that it had not reached me. But when I woke in the morning from my dream, I found that my body had become my own rival. It is my hateful task to deck her every day, to send her to my beloved and see her caressed by him. O oh God, take back thy boon. But if I take it from you, how can you stand before your lover? To snatch away the cup from his lips when he has scarcely drained his first draught of pleasure, would not that be cruel? With what resentful anger he must regard thee then? That would be better far than this. I will reveal my true self to him, a nobler thing than this disguise. If he rejects it, if he spurns me and breaks my heart, I will bear even that in silence. Listen to my advice. When, with the advent of autumn, the flowering season is over, then comes the triumph of fruitage. A time will come of itself when the heat-cloyed bloom of the body will droop and Arjuna will gladly accept the abiding fruitful truth in thee. O oh, child, go back to thy mad festival. Scene 4 Why do you watch me like that, my warrior? I watch how you weave that garland. Skill and grace, the twin brother and sister, are dancing playfully on your fingertips. I am watching and thinking. What are you thinking, sir? I am thinking that you, with this same lightness of touch and sweetness, are weaving my days of exile into an immortal wreath to crown me when I return home. Home? But this love is not for a home. Not for a home? No, never talk of that. Take to your home what is abiding and strong. Leave the little wild flower where it was born, Leave it beautifully to die at the day's end among all fading blossoms and decaying leaves. Do not take it to your palace hall to fling it on the stony floor, which knows no pity for things that fade and are forgotten. Is ours that kind of love? Yes, no other. Why regret it? That which was meant for idle days should never outlive them. Joy turns into pain when the door by which it should depart is shut against it. Take it, and keep it as long as it lasts. Let not the satiety of your evening claim more than the desire of your morning could earn. The day is done. Put this garland on. I am tired. Take me in your arms, my love. Let all vain bickerings of discontent die away at the sweet meeting of our lips. Hush, listen, my beloved. The sound of prayer bells from the distant village temple steals upon the evening air across the silent trees. Scene 5 I cannot keep pace with thee, my friend. I am tired. It is a hard task to keep alive the fire thou hast kindled. Sleep overtakes me, the fan droops from my hand, 
and cold ashes cover the glow of the fire i start up again from my slumber and with all my might rescue the weary flame but this can go on no longer i know thou art as fickle as a child ever restless is thy play in heaven and on earth things that thou for days buildest up with endless detail thou dost shatter in a moment without regret but this work of ours is nearly finished pleasure winged days fly fast and the year almost at its end swoons in rapturous bliss scene six i woke in the morning and found that my dreams had distilled a gem i have no casket to enclose it no king's crown whereon to fix it no chain from which to hang it and yet have not the heart to throw it away my kshatriya's right arm idly occupied in holding it forgets its duties enter chitra tell me your thoughts sir my mind is busy with thoughts of hunting to-day see how the rain pours in torrents and fiercely beats upon the hillside the dark shadow of the clouds hangs heavily over the forest and the swollen stream like reckless youth overleaps all barriers with barking laughter on such rainy days we five brothers would go to the chautauqua forest to chase wild beasts those were glad times our hearts danced to the drumbeat of rumbling clouds the woods resounded with the screams of peacocks timid deer would not hear our approaching steps for the patter of rain and the noise of waterfalls the leopards would leave their tracks on the wet earth betraying their lairs our sport over we dared each other to swim across turbulent streams on our way back home the restless spirit is on me i long to go hunting first run down the quarry you are now following are you quite certain that the enchanted deer you pursue must needs be caught no not yet like a dream the wild creature eludes you when it seems most nearly yours Look how the wind is chased by the mad rain that discharges a thousand arrows after it. Yet it goes free and unconquered. Our sport is like that, my love. You give chase to the fleet-footed spirit of beauty, aiming at her every dart you have in your hands. Yet this magic deer runs ever free and untouched. My love, have you no home where kind hearts are waiting for your return? a home which you once made sweet with your gentle service and whose light went out when you left it for this wilderness why these questions are the hours of unthinking pleasure over do you not know that i am no more than what you see before you for me there is no vista beyond the dew that hangs on the tip of a kinsuka petal has neither name nor destination it offers no answer to any question. She whom you love is like that perfect bead of dew. Has she no tie with the world? Can she be merely like a fragment of heaven, dropped on the earth through the carelessness of a wanton god? Yes. Ah, that is why I always seem about to lose you. My heart is unsatisfied. My mind knows no peace. Come closer to me, unattainable one. Surrender yourself to the bonds of name and home and parentage. Let my heart feel you on all sides and live with you in the peaceful security of love. Why this vain effort to catch and keep the tints of the clouds, the dance of the waves, the smell of the flowers? Mistress mine, do not hope to pacify love with airy nothings. Give me something to clasp, something that can last longer than pleasure, that can endure even through suffering. Hero mine, the year is not yet full and you are tired already. Now I know that it is heaven's blessing that has made the flower's term of life short. Could this body of mine have drooped and died with the flowers of last spring, it surely would have died with honour. Yet its days are numbered, my love. Spare it not, press it dry of honey, for fear your beggar's heart come back to it again and again with unsated desire, like a thirsty bee when summer blossoms lie dead in the dust. Scene 7 
Tonight is thy last night. The loveliness of your body will return tomorrow to the inexhaustible stores of the spring. The ruddy tint of thy lips, freed from the memory of Arjuna's kisses, will bud anew as a pair of fresh Ahsoka leaves, and the soft white glow of thy skin will be born again in a hundred fragrant jasmine flowers. O oh gods, grant me this my prayer. Tonight, in its last hour, let my beauty flash its brightest, like the final flicker of a dying flame. Thou shalt have thy wish. Scene 8 Who will protect us now? Why, by what danger are you threatened? The robbers are pouring from the northern hills like a mountain flood to devastate our village. Have you in this kingdom no warden? Princess Chitra was the terror of all evildoers. While she was in this happy land, we feared natural death, but had no other fears. Now she has gone on a pilgrimage, and none knows where to find her. Is the warden of this country a woman? Yes, she is our father and mother in one. Exeunt. Enter Chitra. Why are you sitting all alone? I am trying to imagine what kind of woman Princess Chitra may be. I hear so many stories of her from all sorts of men. Ah, but she is not beautiful. She has no such lovely eyes as mine, dark as death. She can pierce any target she will, but not our hero's heart. They say that in valor she is a man and a woman in tenderness. That, indeed, is her greatest misfortune. When a woman is merely a woman, when she winds herself round and round men's hearts with her smiles and sobs and services and caressing endearments, then she is happy. Of what use to her are learning and great achievements? Could you have seen her only yesterday in the court of the Lord Shiva's temple by the forest path, you would have passed by without deigning to look at her. But have you grown so weary of woman's beauty that you seek in her for a man's strength? With green leaves wet from the spray of a foaming waterfall, I have made our noonday bed in a cavern dark as night. There the cool of the soft green mosses thick on the black and dripping stone kisses your eyes to sleep. Let me guide you thither. Not today, beloved. Why not today? I have heard that a horde of robbers has neared the plains. Needs must I go and prepare my weapons to protect the frightened villagers. You need have no fear for them. Before she started on her pilgrimage, Princess Chitra had set strong guards at all the frontier passes. Yet permit me for a short while to set about a Kshatriya's work. With new glory will I ennoble this idle arm, and make of it a pillow more worthy of your head. What if I refuse to let you go, if I keep you entwined in my arms? Would you rudely snatch yourself free and leave me? Go then. But you must know that the liana, once broken in two, never joins again. Go, if your thirst is quenched. But if not... Then remember that the goddess of pleasure is fickle and waits for no man. Sit for a while, my lord. Tell me what uneasy thoughts tease you. Who occupied your mind today? Is it Chitra? Yes, it is Chitra. I wonder in fulfillment of what vow she has gone on her pilgrimage. Of what could she stand in need? Her needs? Why, what has she ever had, the unfortunate creature? Her very qualities are as prison walls shutting her woman's heart in a bare cell. She is obscured, she is unfulfilled. Her womanly love must content itself dressed in rags. Beauty is denied her. She is like the spirit of a cheerless morning, sitting upon the stony mountain peak, all her light blotted out by dark clouds. Do not ask me of her life. It will never sound sweet to man's ear. I am eager to learn all about her. I am like a traveller come to a strange city at midnight. Domes and towers and garden trees look vague and shadowy, 
and the dull moan of the sea comes fitfully through the silence of sleep. Wistfully he waits for the morning to reveal to him all the strange wonders. Oh, tell me her story! What more is there to tell? I seem to see her, in my mind's eye, riding on a white horse, proudly holding the reins in her left hand, and in her right a bow, and like the goddess of victory dispensing glad hope all round her. Like a watchful lioness, she protects the litter at her dugs with a fierce love. Woman's arms, though adorned with naught but unfettered strength, are beautiful. My heart is restless, fair one, like a serpent reviving from his long winter's sleep. Come, let us both race on swift horses side by side, like twin orbs of light sweeping through space. Out from this slumberous prison of green gloom, this dank, dense cover of perfumed intoxication, choking breath. Arjuna, tell me true, if now at once by some magic I could shake myself free from this voluptuous softness, this timid bloom of beauty shrinking from the rude and healthy touch of the world, and fling it from my body like borrowed clothes, would you be able to bear it? If I stand up straight and strong with the strength of a daring heart spurning the wiles and arts of twining weakness, if I hold my head high like a tall young mountain fir, no longer trailing in the dust like a liana, shall I then appeal to man's eye? No, no, you could not endure it. It is better that I should keep spread about me all the dainty playthings of fugitive youth and wait for you in patience. When it pleases you to return, I will smilingly pour out for you the wine of pleasure in the cup of this beauteous body. When you are tired and satiated with this wine, you can go to work or play, and when I grow old I will accept humbly and gratefully whatever corner is left for me. Would it please your heroic soul if the playmate of the night aspired to be the helpmeet of the day, if the left arm learned to share the burden of the proud right arm? I never seem to know you are right. You seem to me like a goddess hidden within a golden image. I cannot touch you. I cannot pay you my dues in return for your priceless gifts. Thus my love is incomplete. Sometimes in the enigmatic depth of your sad look, in your playful words mocking at their own meaning, I gain glimpses of a being trying to rend asunder the languorous grace of her body, to emerge in a chaste fire of pain through a vaporous veil of smiles. Illusion is the first appearance of truth. She advances towards her lover in disguise. But a time comes when she throws off her ornaments and veils and stands clothed in naked dignity. I grope for that ultimate you, that bare simplicity of truth. Why these tears, my love? Why cover your face with your hands? Have I pained you, my darling? Forget what I said. I will be content with the present. Let each separate moment of beauty come to me like a bird of mystery from its unseen nest in the dark, bearing a message of music. Let me forever sit with my hope on the brink of its realization, and thus end my days. Scene 9 Chitra and Arjuna Chitra, cloaked My lord, has the cup been drained to the last drop? Is this indeed the end? No, when all is done, something still remains, and that is my last sacrifice at your feet. I brought from the garden of heaven flowers of incomparable beauty with which to worship you, God of my heart. If the rites are over, if the flowers have faded, let me throw them out of the temple. Unveiling in her original male attire. Now, look at your worshipper with gracious eyes. I am not beautifully perfect as the flowers with which I worshipped. I have many flaws and blemishes. I am a traveller in the great world path. My garments are dirty and my feet are bleeding with thorns. Where should I achieve flower beauty, the unsullied loveliness of a moment's life? The gift that I proudly bring you is the heart of a woman. Here have all pains and joys gathered, the hopes and fears and shames of a daughter of the dust. Here love springs up struggling toward immortal life. 
Herein lies an imperfection which yet is noble and grand. If the flower service is finished, my master, accept this as your servant for the days to come. I am Chitra, the king's daughter. Perhaps you will remember the day when a woman came to you in the temple of Shiva, her body loaded with ornaments and finery. That shameless woman came to court you as though she were a man. You rejected her, you did well. My lord, I am that woman. She was my disguise. Then, by the boon of gods, I obtained for a year the most radiant form that a mortal ever wore, and wearied my hero's heart with the burden of that deceit. Most surely I am not that woman. I am Chitra. No goddess to be worshipped, nor yet the object of common pity to be brushed aside like a moth with indifference. If you deign to keep me by your side in the path of danger and daring, if you allow me to share the great duties of your life, then you will know my true self. If your babe, who I am nourishing in my womb, be born a son, I shall myself teach him to be a second Arjuna, and send him to you when the time comes, and then at last you will truly know me. Today I can only offer you Chitra, the daughter of a king. Beloved, my life is full. End of Chitra The Vampire Cat by Gerard Van Etten This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Vampire Cat, a play in one act, from the Japanese legend of The Nabashima Cat, by Gerard Van Etten. Cast of Characters Prince Heisen, Lord of Nabashima, read by Thomas Peter. Buzen, his chief counsellor, read by Todd. Rui Ten, a priest, read by T. J. Burns. Ito Soda, a common soldier, read by Chuck Williamson. Kashiku, a maid, read by Sonia. Otoyo, wife of the prince, read by Abai. Narrator, read by Ian King. Time, Medieval Japan. Scene, the room of Otoyo in the palace. Time of action, between 10 and 12 p.m. Note, according to the old Japanese legend, the soul of a cat can enter a human being. The Vampire Cat. Scene, at right is a dressing table. Upon it, a steel mirror, toilet articles, and two lighted candles with ornate shades. Right upstage, a section of shoji leads to another room. This section is now closed. At right centre, a large section of shoji is open, giving a view of the garden. To the right of this entrance is a small shrine and Buddha. At left of the room is a sleeping mat and headrest. By the headrest, a lantern now unlighted. Down left is an open section of shoji leading to the prince's apartments. Just above it stands a screen. As the curtain rises, the prince is standing right centre, looking out into the garden. Ruiten is down right, and Buzen slightly above him. Buzen crosses left. Prince comes down between Ruiten and Buzen. Settle for me tonight my sickness and my fears. To Buzen. Settle them for me, Sir Buzen, Councillor Crafty. To Ruiten. Settle them for me, priest Ruiten, the prayerful. So we are trying in all ways thy pain to relieve, yet naught seems availing. Racked is my body with tortures unending, born of the dreams that are surging forever, backward and forward through my brain, weary. Buzen, indicating door left. Around thy bed each night have I placed thy samurai, in number one hundred to guard thy sleep. Zealously have I prayed in the temple called Miyo-in. 
and during the night hours have knelt at thy house shrine praying to buddha the lord of the world yet have i not slept entirely untortured slow are thy prayers and fruit bearing slow because contending with evil approaches prince with evil in form strange and subtle over this house hangs a spirit never resting and ready always for dire deeds such a spirit there must be but what evil takes many forms but the form of a cat is favored by many devils prince startled the others watch him closely a cat ay truly and if a cat stopped here that evil thing must we kill yet such is their power malignant that they take other forms than the forms of cats even human forms ha and the spirit that visits me may have that only twice hath it failed of its visit and those lost visits when the last two nights Bizen, swelling with pride then o oh prince the cure may be found better than prayers is the cure eyeing ruiten for prayers have not ears have not eyes have not weapons better than prayers is it tell me this cure is it grudged sir priest ruiten bowing a cure for my lord could not be grudged well spoken say on sir Buzan. first i must beg clemency for thy one hundred samurai for faithful they are to the bone yet yet why clemency for what on guard they slept slept ay soundly as though deep in sake and none roused they were as dead from shortly after the hour of ten until dawning awakening they knew they had slept yet knew not when the poppy was thrown in their eyes even as one man none knew and were deeply amazed and full of shame each night it was the same prince angrily so they slept while i on my couch through the hours writhed writhed and twisted weakening ever not sleep yet dreaming ah oh, horrible dreams of what were these horrible dreams what was their substance prince mystified at the memory there would come a soft stealing as of draperies hushed and lifted for silence and walking like soft silken draperies wrapped about stealthy limbs then a shape clothed for sleep as women are clothed sinuous and vague in movement then taking form slowly the form a lie a lie covers his face and goes up stage the form prince turns oh toyo ruiten and buzen rubbing their hands ah prince comes down right ruiten and buzen are together a little left came she to me leaned o'er me caressed me yet soothed not her lips to mine her lips but not sweet then here on my throat would she place them and all my life seemed to smother out of me flowed the life-blood in a deep stream like a tide forced by the gods against its will to flow far away and yet farther so does a vampire sucking her victim draw from him his blood and his marrow guard thy words as my strength ebbed she drew back red-lipped and smiling smiling and laughing that her laughter was silent then with a final shimmer of silent silks she vanished so was it done 
So, always the dream? If dream it were. The dream. I think yet it was a dream. So was it always. But the last two nights? Came she as usual, flowing over the floor like a specter, robed and beautiful. But as she bent over me, she paused as if startled, and, slowly gazing about, turned and was gone. Last night she paused as if speaking to someone, though I could see no one. But the cause of her turning. Turned she startled? Turn she slowly? Turn she wonderingly? Slowly, as if she felt a strange presence. Feared she? She left me. But trembling or calm? Calmly, as from a thing hated and more powerful than she, whom she would not rouse to action. Buzen, rubbing his hands. Good. What is good? That which thou speakest of. How so? Buzen comes forward towards the prince. It proves that I have humbly succeeded. Grudgingly. Through the help of another, tis true, but yet succeeded in bringing my lord honourable help. Indeed, it is so. Say on, very wise counsellor. Buzen, puffing up. Without more words than are fit, this, then, is the way of the cure. When long had thine illness ravaged and worn thee, and many nights had you tossed by weird visions enthralled, no cures affecting, no prayers availing thee. Glances at Ruiten. Then counseled I with thy wise ones, and, too, with priest Ruiten. I you should name first. For without my prayers, your wisdom was not. To continue briefly, all our heads together brought no solution. True, true. Buzen, bowing. Humbly I acknowledge my head empty and brainless. Yet even from idiot's lips, wisdom oft falls unexpected, and therefore more wonderful. Now it is told in old tales of how a Yahiyasu met. Short. Abrupt is thy tale. The cure, Sir Buzen. The hour passes. Buzen, bowing. I crave honorable leniency to be brief. I brief. Discouraged and sick at heart at the sufferings of my great lord, I was retiring to my room by way of the garden, and the hour was the hour of the fox. I heard a splashing in the pool, and drawing near, saw a young soldier washing. I spoke to him, asking, Who art thou? Retainer to my lord Nabashima, prince of Hizan, he answered. And then I talked with him. Of thy sickness we talked, and he was ashamed of thy samurai sleeping. He begged to be allowed to guard thy sleep also, for, being a common soldier, it was not permitted. So earnestly talked he that I promised to consult with the other counsellors and see what could be done. So tell me your name, young sir, I said. Ito Soda is my name, honourable sir, and for your kind words I thank you. So I consulted, and the result was we granted his request. And he too has watched the two nights past? Aye, and he slept not. Though the samurai were heavy with sleep fumes. I will tell. Ruiten elbows Buzen out of the way and comes forward. You are honorably hoarse. He slept not, as I say. How kept he awake? Since many slept spellbound, how broke he the spell? With him he brought oiled paper and laid it down on the matting, sitting upon it. When over his eyes sleep stole and wearily waited them, he drew out his sharp dirk, and in his thigh thrust it, by pain driving the poppy fumes off. Ever and again he twisted the dirk in the raw wound, and the thick blood drops soiled not the matting. Because of the oiled paper, 
Indeed, this is no common soldier, this Ito Soda. Indeed not. To continue. Retires upstage, disgruntled. Buzen, pushing forward. As I was saying, O Prince, his eyes never closed. During the reign of the rat he heard, in this room, O Toyo, tossing and moaning as if in great fear of something she could not escape from. Even at the same moment as the beginnings of her moanings came a cat call from the garden, then nearer, then ghostly paddings as of padded claws on matting, and an evil presence seemed hovering and lurking near in the darkness. O Toyo gave a low scream, then all was silence. Soon she came stealthily through the soji, cat-like her step, glassy her eyes, claw-like her hands. Bent she over you with curled lips. Then she turned, even as you have said, and seeing a waking watcher, left as she came. Rua Ten comes down. The second night of Itosoda's watching, she threatened him in low words, but he made as to stab her, and she melted before him, laughing a little, and he heard the rustle of her garments as she regained this room, though he saw not her passage hither. Thicker with each word the horror about me. Turns away to write. Doubts to beliefs, beliefs to actions, love unto hate. Turns to them almost pleadingly. Tell me it is not Otoyo. I questioned her maid, Kashiku, and found that Otoyo's couch was empty, even at the time of the weird visit to thee. Prince, overwhelmed. So, it was Otoyo, in the soul of a flower, a demon, on the sweet lips, poison. There is only one course. The one road. And I take it. Buzen moves toward door left. The samurai are gathered. Summon Ito Soda. Buzen exits left. Hard is the fate of man here on this dark earth. Many the shapes and the shadows stalking abroad. Yet ever the gentle Buddha from the lotus fields watches and guards every life that lives. Prince puts one hand on Ruiten's shoulder. Priest, have not many vampires bleeding them and dream it is another thing? The soul is often a vampire to the body. And that evil thing must we kill. Itosoda enters left, kneels before the prince. Ruiten takes up right a little, and Buzen, re-entering after Itosoda, goes up centre. Honourable prince, humbly I answer thy summons. Rise, Itosoda. Faithful beyond words art thou. This no I as all hath been told me. No longer call thyself a common soldier but a samurai of the Prince of Heisen, and the two swords will I give thee on the morrow. On my knees, I humbly thank thee. Rises. Now time presses, or Toyo will be coming in from the garden. As usual, shall the hundred sleepy samurai guard my coach. Let Ito Soda remain here hidden and watchful. When O Toyo rises to enter my chamber, your dirk is sharp, Ito Soda. Itosodo draws Dirk. As a moonbeam on a cold night. And you know how to use it. I will place this screen thus. Goes to screen left and opens it so as to form a hiding place between the sleeping mat and the door left. So will I wait the moment. So be it. It is a good plan, and on the one road, let us about it. Exits left, followed by Buzen and Ruiten. Itosoda goes behind the screen. Otoyo is heard singing in the garden. Otoyo, outside. Moonlit convolvus through the night hours. When are their faces ghostly sweet? Richer by daylight, drinking of sunshine, as thirsty souls drink at a shrine. 
Fair are the faces, glassed in the quiet pools, Maidens low bending, vain ones. The singing stops abruptly. Kashiku, is not that a cat stealing stealthily there? She snarls. Quick! Otoyo enters right center quickly and very frightened, turns and looks back, hurries Kashiku in. Kashiku follows, much less disturbed at any fear of a cat than over her mistress's fright. Kashiku shuts the shoji right center and comes to Otoyo. You are all a tremble. Quick, let me be safe in slumber. Crosses to dressing table. Kashiku follows her and attends to her hair while Otoyo kneels before the glass. Several nights lately have I heard my lady moaning, as though even in sleep were she troubled. The worry over your honourable lord hath disturbed thee. Your ears are over keen. I am happy when I sleep. How can I moan being happy? You are dull. Perhaps it was the wind or the echo of my lord's moaning. Moaning? Or was it singing? I would it were singing, for singing is sweeter on the lips of those dying. Dying? When those whom we love are passing, even under our hands are passing, and our love weans them from life, and our kisses suck out the blood life, then would we touch them no more, then would we kiss them no more, but a power greater than we, and a power that we fear, forces us on in our love-killing. There is in your voice a vibration, as even the winds in the pine-tops, when in the autumn they echo the summer's death-song. There is in your eyes a strange light, as if the soul of another looked out from your curtaining lashes and dimmed the sweet light there abiding. Oh, mistress, surely you are different than what you once were. Otoyo crosses center slowly. Even now comes the hour and the struggle, and I do the bidding of that which is in me. Ah, how I hate the feel of his flesh quivering under my lips, and the loathsome taste of the blood drops thick on my lips that would soothe him and cannot. Can anything soothe more than thy lips, more than the lips that love him? I cannot understand the words of your saying. You are happy and tearful all in a moment. Your soul seems a sky full of sunshine and clouds. Coming to her. Even now as my hand touches you, you are trembling. Is it the cat that crept upon us, whose shape still frights you? Thou hast said it. My soul is as thou sayest. My dreams are sweet and again bitter. Once came a dream horrible above all dreams. What dream, my lady? The night when you found me there on the floor. Do you remember? Well, you were all distraught, and the bosom of your gown was torn open, and you clutched your throat as if you were wounded there. But there was no mark. And you let wild words fall from your lips, and none knew their meaning. The prince and I walked in the garden, and there at the shoji I left him. As I entered, there entered with me a spirit, and its breath fell upon me, dumb my tongue in my mouth and frozen my marrow. Suddenly it leapt upon me, and as I fell downward flashed the spirit into mine eyes, a cat two-tailed and hairy, and its teeth sank in my throat here. Can you see a mark? Exposes her throat to Kashiku. The skin is as smooth as satin and perfect. Then came darkness upon me, and so you found me. So strong is the dream within me, I wonder if it be a dream or no. You had walked that evening in the garden. I had rather dreamed I walked. Say I dreamed it. The prince was with... Yet it was a dream, question it not. I would go to rest peacefully. He too shall rest peacefully. 
I shall not kiss my lord tonight. Crosses left. Not kiss him? I think not I shall kiss him. I would not pain his slumbers. He has paled so, and his face is so thin. In the night he lies like a strong flower, and a strange flower, bled of its life, like a strong flower weakened. And at its sight my dreams are bitter, but as I gaze a change comes over all things, and I hold in my hands a beautiful flower, which I kiss with my lips, holding my lips long to it, draining its sweetness, and a cloud passes over, and on my lips are clots of blood. Such dreamings are not good. I find the silken coverlets tossed in the morning, twisted and thrown about, as if you slept ill. It is not Otoyo who tosses them. It is the dream, Otoyo. Two nights lately have I imagined you called to me, but entering you were not here, but there with your lord, soothing his sufferings. Drinking at strange fountains and unknown springs, drinking of sacred waters, sacred to unknown gods. And as I drink, another life becomes my life, and he is mine, utterly mine, at last. You frighten me. Be not frightened, you have no need. Now I shall sleep. He too is sleeping. Perhaps, perhaps he is suffering. Shall I touch him with my hands? Perhaps he is hungry for my kisses. Shall I kiss him? It were a fitting thing to kiss thy lord. You know not what you say, Kashiku. My lady. You have not heard me say strange things, Kashiku. I have heard. Nothing. Nothing, my lady. Put out the lamps. Kashiku blows out candles on dressing table. Go now, Kashiku, and do you sleep deeply, breathing poppies. My lady. Go. Kashiku opens Shoji right and goes out, shutting it after her. Otoyo crosses too and lies on the sleeping mat. The room is almost in total darkness. I shall kiss him. I shall kiss him. The lantern at the head of the sleeping mat glows more and more brightly until a cat's head appears on it. At this moment, a cat call comes from the garden. With the increase of light, Otoyo has begun to moan and toss. And at the moment of the cat call, she rises as in a trance and goes towards the door left. As she passes the screen, Ito Soda steps out from behind it and plunges his dirk into her back. She falls with a little stifled cry. Instantly, in utter darkness, the curtain falls. End of the play. End of The Vampire Cat by Gerard Van Etten. The Countess of Escarbagna by Molière. Translated by Charles Heron Wall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Persons represented. The Count, son to the Countess. Read by Philip Gould. The Viscount, in love with Julia. Read by Todd. Mr. Thibaudier, counsellor, in love with the Countess. Read by Thomas Peter. Mr. Harpin, receiver of taxes, also in love with the Countess. Read by Nemo. Mr. Bobinet, tutor to the Count. Read by Eva Davis. Juno, servant to Mr. Thibaudier. Read by Alan Mapstone. Cricket, servant to the Countess. Read by Jasmine Selma. The Countess of Escarbanias. Read by T.J. Burns. Julia, in love with a Viscount. Read by Leanne Yao. André, maid to the Countess. Read by Sonia. Stage directions. Read by Sandra Schmidt. 
The scene is at Angoulême. The Countess of Escarbagna. Scene 1. Julia, the Viscount. What? You are here already? Yes, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself, Cleant. It is not right for a lover to be the last to come to the rendezvous. I should have been here long ago if there were no important people in the world. I was stopped on my way here by an old boar of rank, who asked me news of the court, merely to be able himself to detail to me the most absurd things that can well be imagined about it. You know that those great newsmongers are the curse of provincial towns, and that they have no greater anxiety than to spread everywhere abroad all the tittle-tattle they pick up. This one showed me, to begin with, two large sheets of paper full to the very brim with the greatest imaginable amount of rubbish, which, he says, come from the safest quarters. Then, as if it were a wonderful thing, he read full length and with great mystery all the stupid jokes in the Dutch Gazette which he takes for gospel. He thinks that France is being brought to ruin by the pen of that writer, whose fine wit, according to him, is sufficient to defeat armies. After that he raved about the ministry, spoke of all its faults, and I thought he would never have done. If one is to believe him, he knows the secrets of the cabinet better than those who compose it. The policy of the state is an open book to him, and no step is taken without his seeing through it. He shows you the secret machinations of all that takes place, whether the wisdom of our neighbors tends, and controls at his will and pleasure all the affairs of Europe. His knowledge of what goes on extends as far as Africa and Asia, and he is informed of all that, is discussed in the Privy Council of Prester John. You make the best excuse you can, and so arrange it that it may pass off well and be easily received. I assure you, dear Julia, that this is the real reason of my being late. But if I wanted to say anything gallant, I could tell you that the rendezvous to which you bring me here might well excuse the sluggishness of which you complain. To compel me to pay my addresses to the lady of this house is certainly reason enough for me to fear being here the first. I ought not to have to bear the misery of it, except when she whom it amuses is present. I avoid finding myself alone with that ridiculous countess with whom you shackle me. In short, as I come only for your sake... I have every reason to stay away until you are here. Oh, you will never lack the power of giving a bright colour to your faults. However, if you had come half an hour sooner, we should have enjoyed those few moments. For when I came, I found that the Countess was out, and I have no doubt that she has gone all over the town to claim for herself the honour of the comedy you gave me under her name. But, pray... When will you put an end to this, and make me buy less dearly the happiness of seeing you? When our parents agree, which I scarcely dare hope for. You know as well as I do that the dissensions which exist between our two families deprive us of the possibility of seeing each other anywhere else, and that neither my brothers nor my father are likely to approve of our engagement. Yes, but why not profit better by the opportunity which their enmity gives us? And why oblige me to waste under a ridiculous deception, the moments I pass near you. It is the better to hide our love. And besides, to tell you the truth, this deception you speak of is, to me, a very amusing comedy, and I hardly think that the one you gave me today will amuse me as much. Our Countess of Escabanias, with her perpetual infatuation for quality, is as good a personage as can be put on the stage. The short journey she has made to Paris has brought her back to Angoulême more crazy than ever. The air of the court has given a new charm to her extravagance, and her folly grows and increases every day. Yes, but do you not take into consideration that what amuses you drives me to despair, and that one cannot dissimulate long when one is under the sway of love as true as that which I feel for you? It is cruel to think, dear Julia, that this amusement of yours should deprive me of the few moments during which I could speak to you of my love. And last night I wrote on the subject some verses that I cannot help repeating to you. So true is it that the mania of reciting one's verses is inseparable from the title of a poet. Iris, too long thou keepest on torture's rack, one who obeys thy laws, yet whispering chides in that thou biddest me boost a joy I lack and hush the sorrow that my bosom hides. Must thy dear eyes, to which I yield my arms, from my sad sighs draw wanton pleasure still? 
Is it not enough to suffer for thy charms, that I must grieve at thy capricious will? This double martyrdom a pain affords, too keen to bear at once thy deeds, thy words, work on my wasting heart a cruel doom. Love bids it burn, constraint its life thus chill, if pity soften not thy wayward will. Love, feigned and real, will lead me to the tomb. I see that you make yourself out much more ill-used than you need. But it is the way with you poets to tell falsehoods in cold blood, and to pretend that those you love are much more cruel than they are, in order to make them correspond to the fancies you may take into your heads. Yet I should like you, if you will, to give me those verses in writing. No, it is enough that I have repeated them to you, and I ought to stop there. A man may be foolish enough to make verses, but that is different from giving them to others. It is in vain for you to affect a false modesty. Your wit is well known, and I do not see why you should hide what you write. Ah, we must tread here with the greatest circumspection. It is a dangerous thing to set up for a wit. There is inherent to it a certain touch of absurdity which is catching, and we should be warned by the example of some of our friends. Oh, nonsense, Cleant. I see that, in spite of all you say, you are longing to give me your verses, and I feel sure that you would be very unhappy if I pretended not to care for them. I unhappy? Oh, dear, no. I am not so much of a poet for you to think that I... But here is the Countess of Escabanus. I'll go by this door, so as not to meet her, and we'll see that everything is got ready for the play I have promised you. Scene 2. The Countess, Julia... André and Criquet in the background. What, madam, are you alone? Ah, what a shame, all alone. I thought my people had told me that the Viscount was here. It is true that he came, but it was sufficient for him to know that you were not at home. He would not stop after that. What, did he see you? Yes. And did he not stop to talk with you? No, madam. He wished to show you how very much he is struck by your charms. Still, I shall call him to account for that. However much any one may be in love with me, I wish them to pay to our sex the homage that is due to it. I am not one of those unjust women who approve of the rudeness their lovers display towards other fair ones. You must in no way be surprised at his conduct. The love he has for you shows itself in all his actions, and prevents him from caring for anybody but you. I know that I can give rise to a strong passion. I have for that enough beauty, youth, and rank, thank heaven. But it is no reason why those who love me should not keep within the bounds of propriety towards others. Seeing Criquet. What are you doing there, little page? Is there not an anteroom for you to be in until you are called? It is a strange thing that in the provinces we cannot meet with a servant who knows his place. To whom do you think I am speaking? Why do you not move? Will you go outside, little knave that you are? Scene 3. The Countess Julia André Come hither, girl. What do you wish me to do, ma'am? To take off my headdress. Gently, you awkward girl. How roughly you touch my head with your heavy hands. I do it as gently as I can, ma'am. No doubt. But what you call gently is very rough treatment for my head. You have almost put my neck out of joint. Now, take also this muff. Go and put it with the rest into the closet. Don't leave anything about. Well, where is she going now? What is this stupid girl doing? I am going to take this into the closet, as you told me, ma'am. Ah, oh, heavens! To Julia. Pray, excuse her rudeness, madam. To André. I told you my closet, great ass. That is the place where I keep my dresses. Please, ma'am. Is a cupboard called a closet at court? Yes, dunce. It is thus that a place where clothes are kept is called. I will remember it, ma'am, as well as the word furniture warehouse for your attic. Scene 4. The Countess Julia Ah, 
What trouble it gives me to have to teach such simpletons. I think them very fortunate to be under your discipline, madam. She is my nurse's daughter, whom I have made lady's maid. The post is quite new to her as yet. It shows a generous soul, madam, and it is glorious thus to form people. Come, some seats, I say. Here, little page. Little page! Little page boy! Truly, this is too bad not to have a page to give us chairs. My maids! My page! My page! My maids! Oh, somebody! I really think that they must be all dead, and that we shall have to find seats for ourselves. Scene 5. The Countess Julia André. What is it you want, ma'am? You do make people scream after you, you servants. I was putting your muff and headdress away in the cup, uh, in the closet, I mean. Call in that rascal of a page. I say, cricket. Cease that cricket of yours, stupid, and call out page. Page, then, and not cricket. Come and speak to missus. I think he must be deaf. Crick, uh, page, page. Scene 6. The Countess Julia André Cricke. What is it you want? Where were you, you rascal? In the street, ma'am. Why in the street? You told me to go outside. Oh, you are a rude little fellow. And you ought to know that outside among people of quality means the anteroom. André, mind you ask my equerry to flog this little rogue. He is an incorrigible little wretch. Whom do you mean by your equerry, ma'am? Is it Mr. Charles you call by that name? Be silent, you impertinent girl. You can hardly open your mouth without making some rude remark. To Criquet. Quick, some seats. To André. And you, light two wax candles in my silver candlesticks. It's getting late. What is it now? Why do you look so scared? Ma'am. Well, ma'am, what is the matter? It is that... What? I have no wax candles... But only dips. <gasps> the simpleton. And where are the wax candles I brought a few days ago? I have seen none since I have been here. <gasps> Get out of my presence, rude girl. I will send you back to your home again. Oh, bring me a glass of water. Scene 7. The Countess and Julia making much ceremony before they sit down. Madam. Madam? Ah, madam. Oh, madam. Madam, I beg of you. Madam, I beg of you. Oh, madam. Oh, madam. Pray, madam. Pray, madam. Now, really, madam. Now, really, madam. I am in my own house, madam. We are agreed as to that. Do you take me for a provincial, madam? Oh, heaven forbid, madam. Scene 8. The Countess, Julia, André, who brings a glass of water, Criquet. The Countess to André. Get along with you, you hussy. I drink with a salver. I tell you that you must go and fetch me a salver. Cricket, what's a salver? A salver? Yes. I don't know. The Countess to André. Will you move or will you not? We don't either of us know what a salver is. <sighs> know then that it is a plate on which you put the glass. Scene 9. The Countess Julia. Long live Paris. It is only there that one is well waited upon. There a glance is enough. Scene 10. 
the countess julia andre who brings a glass of water with a plate on the top of it criquet is that what i asked you for you dunderhead it is under that you must put the plate that is easy to do <gasps> she breaks the glass in trying to put it on the plate you stupid girl you shall really pay for the glass you shall i promise you very well ma'am i will pay you for it but did you ever see such an awkward loutish girl such a i say ma'am if i am to pay for the glass i won't be scolded into the bargain get out of my sight scene eleven the countess julia really madam small towns are strange places in them there is no respect of persons and i have just been making a few calls at houses where they drove me almost to despair so little regard did they pay to my rank why could you expect them to have learnt manners they have never been to paris still they might learn if they would only listen to one but what i think is too bad is that they will persist in saying that they know as much as i do i who have spent two months in paris and have seen the whole court what absurd people they are unbearable in the impertinent equality with which they treat people for in short there ought to be a certain subordination in things and what puts me out of all patience is that a town upstart whether with two days gentility to boast of or with two hundred years should have impudence enough to say that he is as much of a gentleman as my late husband who lived in the country kept a pack of hounds and took the title of count in all the deeds that he signed they know better how to live in paris in those large hotels you must remember with such pleasure the hotel of mouchy madame that hotel of lyon that hotel of holland what charming places to live in it is true that those places are very different from what we have here you see there people of quality who do not hesitate to show you all the respect and consideration which you look for one is not under the obligation of rising from one's seat and if one wants to see a review or the great ballet of psyche your wishes are at once attended to i should think madam that during your stay in paris you made many a conquest among the people of quality you can readily believe madam that of all the famous court gallants not one failed to come to my door and pay his respects to me i keep in my casket some of the letters sent me and can prove by them what offers i have refused there's no need for me to tell you their names you know what is meant by court gallants i wonder madam how after all those great names which i can easily guess you can descend to mr Thibaudier, a counsellor and mr halpon a collector of taxes the fall is great i must say for your viscount although nothing but a country viscount is still a viscount and can take a journey to paris if he has not been there already but a counsellor and a tax-gatherer are but poor lovers for a great countess like you they are men whom one treats kindly in the country in order to make use of when the need arises they serve to fill up the gaps of gallantry and to swell the ranks of one's lovers it is a good thing not to leave a lover the sole master of one's heart lest for want of rivals his love go to sleep through overconfidence i confess madam that no one can help profiting wonderfully by all you say your conversation is a school to which i do not fail to come every day in order to learn something new scene twelve the countess julia andre criquet criquet to the countess here's janelle mr tibaudier's man who wants to see you ma'am ah oh you little wretch this is another of your stupidities a well-bred lackey would have spoken in a whisper to a gentlewoman in attendance the latter would have come to her mistress and have whispered in her ear here is the footman of mr so-and-so who wants to speak to you madam 
To which the mistress would have answered, Show him in. Scene 13. The Countess Julia André Criquet Janot. Come along in, Janot. Another blunder. To Janot. What do you want, Page? What have you there? It is Mr. Thobordier, ma'am, who wishes you good morning. And, before he comes, send you some pears out of his garden. With this small note. Scene 14. The Countess, Criquet, Janot. The Countess giving some money to Janot. Here, my boy. Here is something for your trouble. Oh, no. Thank you, ma'am. Take it, I say. My master told me not to take anything from you, ma'am. Never mind. Take it all the same. Excuse me, ma'am. Take it, Janot. If you don't want it, you can give it to me. Tell your master that I thank him. Criquet, to Janot, who is going. Give it to me, Janot. Yeah, you catch me. It was I who made you take it. I should have taken it without your help. What pleases me in this Mr. Thibaudier is that he knows how to behave with people of my quality and that he is very respectful. Scene 15. The Viscount, the Countess, Julia Criquet. I come to tell you, madam, that the theatricals will soon be ready and that we can go into the hall in a quarter of an hour. Mind, I will have no crowd after me. To Criquet. Tell the porter not to let anybody come in. If so, madam, I give up our theatricals. I could take no interest in them unless the spectators are numerous. Believe me, if you want to enjoy it thoroughly, tell your people to let the whole town in. Page, a seat. To the Viscount, after he is seated. You have come just in time to accept a self-sacrifice I am willing to make to you. Look, I have here a note from Mr. Thibaudier, who sends me some pears. I give you leave to read it aloud. I've not opened it yet. The Viscount, after he has read the note, to himself. This note is written in the most fashionable style, madam, and is worthy of all your attention. Reads aloud. Madam. I could not have made you the present I send you if my garden did not bring me more fruit than my love. You see clearly by this that nothing has taken place between us. The pears are not quite ripe yet, but they will all the better match the hardness of your heart, the continued disdain of which promises me nothing soft and sweet. Allow me, madam, without risking an enumeration of your charms, which would be endless, to conclude with begging you to consider that I am as good a Christian as the pears which I send you. For I render good for evil, which is to say, to explain myself more plainly, that I present you with good Christian pears in return for the choke pears which your cruelty makes me swallow every day. Your unworthy slave, Tobaldier. Madam, this letter is worth keeping. There may be a few words in it that are not of the Academy, but I observe it in a certain respect which pleases me greatly. You are right, madam, and even if the Viscount were to take it amiss, I should love a man who would write so to me. Scene 16. Mr. Thibaudier, the Viscount, the Countess, Julia Criquet. Come here, Mr. Thibaudier. Do not be afraid of coming in. Your note was well received, and so were your pears. And there is a lady here who takes your part against your rival. I am much obliged to her, madam. And if ever she has a lawsuit in our court, she may be sure that I shall not forget the honour she does me in making herself the advocate of my flame, near your beauty. You have no need of an advocate, sir, and your cause has justice on its side. This nevertheless, madam, the right has need of help, and I have reason to apprehend the being supplanted by such a rival, and the beguiling of the lady by the rank of the Viscount. I had hopes before your note came, sir, but now I confess fears for my love. 
here are likewise a few little couplets which i have composed to your honour and glory madam ah i had no idea that mr tibaldier was a poet these few little couplets will be my ruin he means two strophes to criquet page give a seat to mr tibaldier aside to criquet who brings a chair a folding chair little animal mr tibaldier sit down there and read your strophes to us mr tibaudier reads a person of quality is my fair dame she has got beauty fierce is my flame yet i must blame her pride and cruelty i am lost after that the first line is excellent a person of quality i think it is a little too long but a liberty may be taken to express a noble thought the countess to mr tibaudier let us have the other mr tibaudier reads i know not if you doubt them i love be sincere yet this i know that my heart every moment longs to leave its sorry apartment to visit yours with fond respect and fear after all this having my love in hand and my honour of superfine brand you ought in turn i say content to be a countess gay to cast that tigress skin away which hides your charms both night and day i am undone by mr tibaldier do not make fun of it for the verses are good although they are country verses i madam make fun of it though he is my rival i think his verses admirable i do not call them like you two strophes merely but two epigrams as good as any of marshall's what does marshall make verses i thought he only made gloves it is not that marshall madam but an author who lived thirty or forty years ago mr tibaldier has read the authors as you see but madam we shall see if my comedy with its interludes and dances will counteract in your mind the progress which the two strophes have made my son the count must be one of the spectators for he came this morning from my country seat with his tutor whom i see here scene seventeen the countess julia the viscount mr thibaudier mr bobinet criquet mr bobinet i say mr bobinet come forward i give the good evening to all this honourable company what does madame the countess of escarbanias want of her humble servant bobinet what time mr bobinet did you leave escarbanias with the count my son at a quarter to nine my lady according to your orders how are my two other sons the marquise and the commander they are heaven be thanked in perfect health where is the count in your beautiful room with a recess in it madam what is he doing mr bobinet madam he is composing an essay upon one of the epistles of cicero which i have just given him as a subject call him in mr bobinet be it according to your command madam exit scene eighteen the countess julia the viscount mr thibaudier mr thibaudier to the countess that mr bobinet madam looks very wise and i think that he is a man of esprit scene nineteen the countess julia the viscount the count mr bobinet mr thibaudier come my lord show what progress you make under the good precepts that are given you bow to the honourable company the countess showing julia come count salute this lady bow low to the viscount salute the counsellor i am delighted madam that you should grant me the favour of embracing his lordship one cannot love the trunk without loving the branches goodness gracious mr thibaudier what a comparison to use 
Really, madam, his lordship the Count has perfect manners. This is a young gentleman who is thriving well. Who could have believed that your ladyship had so big a child? Alas, when he was born I was so young that I still played with dolls. He is your brother and not your son. Be very careful of his education, Mr. Bobonet. I shall never, madam, neglect anything towards the cultivation of the young plant, which your goodness has entrusted to my care, and I will try to inculcate in him the seeds of all the virtues. Mr. Bobonet, just make him recite some choice piece from what you teach him. Will your lordship repeat your lesson of yesterday morning? Omne viro soli quod convenit est overile. Omne viri. Fie, Mr. Bobinet, what silly stuff is that you teach him? It is Latin, madam, and the first rule of Jean de Potter. Truly, that Jean de Spartier is an impudent fellow, and I beg you to teach my son more honest Latin than this in the future. If you will allow him to say it all through, madam, the gloss will explain the meaning. There is no need. It explains itself sufficiently. Scene 20. The Countess, Julia, the Viscount, Mr. Thibaudier, the Count, Mr. Bobinet, Criquet. The actors sent me to tell you that they are ready. Let us take our seats. Showing Julia. Mr. Thibaudier, take this lady under your care. Criquet places all the chairs on one side of the stage. The Countess, Julia, and the Viscount sit down, and Mr. Thibaudier sits down at the Countess's feet. It is important for you to observe that this comedy was made only to unite the different pieces of music and dancing which compose the entertainment, and that... Ah, never mind. Let us see it. We have enough good sense to understand things. Begin then at once, and see that no troublesome intruder comes to disturb our pleasure. The violins begin an overture. Scene 21. The Countess, Julia, the Viscount, the Count, Mr. Arpin, Mr. Thibaudier, Mr. Bobinet, Criquet. By George, this is fine, and I rejoice to see what I see. How? Mr. Receiver, what do you mean by this behavior? Is it right to come and interrupt a comedy in that fashion? By Jove, madam, I am delighted at this adventure. And it shows me what I ought to think of you, and what I ought to believe of the assurances you gave me of the gift of your heart, and likewise of all your oaths of fidelity. But really, one should not come thus in the middle of a play and disturb an actor who is speaking. Ha! <laughs> Zounds! The real comedy here is the one you are playing, and I care little if I disturb you. Really, you do not know what you are saying. Yes, damn it. I know perfectly well. And... Mr. Bobinet, frightened, takes up the count and runs away. Criquet follows him. Fie, sir! How wrong it is to swear in that fashion! Ah, Zadath. If there is anything bad here, it is not my swearing, but your actions. And it would be much better for you to swear by heaven and hell than to do what you do with a viscount. I don't know, sir, of what you have to complain, and if... I have nothing to say to you, sir. You do right to push your fortune. That is quite natural. I see nothing strange in it, and I beg your pardon for interrupting your play. But neither can you find it strange that I complain of her proceedings. We both have a right to do what we are doing. I have nothing to say to that and I do not know what cause of complaint you can have against her ladyship, the Countess of Escabanus. When one suffers from jealousy, one does not give way to such outbursts, but one comes peaceably to complain to the person beloved. I complain peaceably. Yes. One does not come and shout on the stage what should be said in private. I came purposely to complain on the stage. Zadath. It is the place that suits me best, and I should be glad if this were a real theater, so that I might expose you more publicly. Is there need for such an uproar? 
because the Viscount gives a play in my honor? Just look at Mr. Thibaudier, who loves me. He acts more respectfully than you do. Mr. Thibaud J does as he pleases. I don't know how far Mr. Thibaud J has got with you, but Mr. Thibaud J is no example for me. I don't like to pay the piper for other people to dance. But, Mr. Receiver, you don't consider what you are saying. Women of rank are not treated thus. And those who hear you might believe that something strange has taken place between us. Confound it all, madam. Let us cast aside all this foolery. What do you mean by foolery? I mean that I do not think it strange that you should yield to the Viscount's merit. You are not the first woman in the world who plays such a part, and who has a receiver of taxes, of whom the love and purse are betrayed, for the first newcomer who takes her fancy. But do not think it extraordinary that I do not care to be the dupe of an infidelity so common to coquettes of the period, that I come before good company to say that I break with you, and that I, the receiver of taxes, will no more be taxed on your account. It is really wonderful how angry lovers have become the fashion. We see nothing else anywhere. Come, come, Mr. Receiver, cast aside your anger and come and take a seat to see the play. I sit down? Zadath. Not I. Showing Mr. Thibaudier. Look for a fool at your feet, my lady countess. I give you up to my lord the viscount. And it is to him that I will send the letters I have received from you. My scene is ended. My part is played. Good night to all. We shall meet somewhere else, and I will show you that I am a man of the sword as well as of the pen. Right, my good Mr. Thibaud J. Exit. Such insolence confounds me. The jealous, madam, are like those who lose their cause. They have leave to say anything. Let us listen to the play now. Scene 22. The Countess, the Viscount, Julia, Mr. Thibaudier, Jeannot. Jeannot to the Viscount. Sir... Here is a note which I've been asked to give to you immediately. The Viscount reads, As you may have some measures to take, I send you notice at once that the quarrel between your family and that of Julia's has just been settled, and that the condition of this agreement is your marriage with Julia. Good night. To Julia. Truly, madam, our part is also played. The Viscount, the Countess, and Mr. Thibaudier all rise. Oh, Cleant! What happiness is this? Our love could scarcely hope for such a happy end. What is it you mean? It means, madam, that I married Julia. And if you will believe me, in order to make the play complete at all points, you will marry Mr. Tibaldier and give André to his footman, whom he will make his valet de chambre. What? You deceive thus a person of my rank? No offence to you, madam. But plays require such things. Yes. Mr. Thibaudier, I will marry you to vex everybody. You do me too much honor, madam. Allow us, madam, in spite of our vexation, to see the end of the play. The End End of the Countess of Escarbagna by Molière Translated by Charles Heron Wall Playgoers, a domestic episode by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Persons of the Play The Master, read by Todd. The Mistress, read by Sonia. The Cook, read by Linda Olsen Vitak. The Kitchen Maid, read by Jasmine Selma. The Parlour Maid, read by Son of the Exiles. The Housemaid, read by T.J. Burns. The Useful Maid, read by Devorah Allen. The Odd Man, read by Alan Mapstone. Stage Directions, read by Thomas Peter.
the scene is the morning room in a house in london prettily decorated and furnished facing the spectator there is a broad window through which the sunlight enters from a street and in the right-hand wall a double door opens into the room from the hall on the left opposite the door there is the fireplace no fire is burning and the grate is hidden by ferns growing in pots on the right there is a settee at the further end of the settee is a small table with books and newspapers upon it and on the left of the table there is an armchair a writing table stands near the window with a chair before it on the left of the room there is a breakfast table upon which are the remains of a breakfast laid for two persons there is a chair at the further side of this table another on its left and at the nearer side some little distance from the table is a fauteuil stool an armchair stands at the further side of the fireplace and another chair of a lighter sort at the near side of the door other articles of furniture bookcases corner cupboards a cabinet etc occupy spaces against the walls note throughout right and left are the spectators right and left not the actors the master and the mistress a good-looking young couple are seated at the breakfast table he is reading a newspaper she is sipping her tea and softly trilling a song the master at the further side of the table lowering his paper very merry this morning pussy the mistress on the left of the table i always am dearest on stock exchange holidays when you are mine for a whole day the master indulgently kiss me the mistress rising and putting her lips to his brow besides i have a reason for feeling happy just now every day reason the servants have you noticed them i've noticed they're a new lot scowling rotters a brand new lot and please don't call them rotters moving to the right darling i am convinced that at last our miseries are ended and that we are in for a run of luck the master lighting a cigarette good business if that's the case at the present moment ernest dear we have a staff of domestics which in my opinion is as near perfection as is humanly possible hurrah the mistress sinking into the armchair on the left of the small table <laughs> but oh my gracious yes it has been a devil of a time i couldn't have gone on much longer as we have been going on clenching her hands oh the torture of the past eight months the first eight months of our married life when everything should have been rosy and ideal the master rising and approaching her my poor dear morma ring the bell old boy the master going to the fireplace right -o. what do you think i am going to do the master ringing the bell ask me an easier one i worked it out in my brain last night i am going to give them a treat give who a treat the servants of course oh tosh when did this new gang come in how unobservant you are a week ago hadn't you better wait a bit the mistress jumping up no i intend to act on a different system with this gang as you term it and to begin early joining him in the middle of the room i mean to show all these cheerful willing people that we are their friends as well as their employers and that we consider it our duty to provide them with food for their minds as well as for their you know dear the master nodding um the mistress slipping her arm through his ernest perhaps we have been a little remiss in this respect up to now the master withdrawing his arm hush the parlour-maid enters carrying a tray she is a great deal more ladylike than any lady who has ever breathed the mistress sweetly thank you i didn't ring for you to clear beechcroft i wish to see the servants the parlour-maid elevating her eyebrows see the servants 
all of you, here. The parlour-maid, with a shade of hauteur. Really? Nothing wrong, I trust? The mistress, smiling. Nothing. Quite the contrary. I'll bring them up as soon as we've finished our lunches. Uh, do. I am sorry to have disturbed you. I won't hurry them, or they'll be eating their prawns without removing the skins. She retires. The mistress glowingly. Isn't she a refined girl? Extremely. But I say, Pussy, is it absolutely necessary to hold this confounded parade? Not absolutely, but I want to study the expression of their faces while you are making the announcement. Walking about. Oh, Ernest, is there anything in this world equal to the joy of giving pleasure to others? Oh, I make the announcement, do I? Certainly. But I haven't heard yet what form of the blessed treat is to take. A theatre. Theatre? Yes. We are going to send them to the play, darling. My dear Norma, there are no pantomimes at this time of year. Pantomimes? These are grown-up intelligent women, not a parcel of children. The master, grumblingly. Well, anyhow, it'll be deucedly inconvenient for us. The mistress, halting. Why, pray? Who is to cook and serve our dinner? <laughs> Do we never dine at a restaurant? Often. But we're not in the habit of marching out of the house and leaving it totally unprotected. The mistress, coming to him and speaking very incisively. My dear husband, will you have the common fairness to tell me whether I have said they are all to go to the theatre on the same night? Uh, uh, oh, I beg pardon. I have planned the affair in my head down to the smallest detail. As a matter of fact, they are to go in botches. I fancy you mean batches? <laughs> Don't be so fond of catching me up. Batches. Some one night, some another. Melting. Oh, Ernest, I am so excited about it. Tum dee tum dee She seizes him, and they do a glide round the room. The door opens again, and the parlour-maid returns, followed by the cook, the useful maid, the housemaid, and the kitchen-maid, all with their mouths full. The master and the mistress stop dancing in some confusion. The master, under his breath, Dash! The parlour maid to the mistress. Here they are. They thought they'd rather get it over. Delighted. To the cook. Good morning, Mrs. Hackett. The cook, a stolid, ponderous woman. Good morning, Mum. The mistress in the middle of the room. Will you sit down, please? Will everybody sit down? Mr. Dorrington has something to communicate to you. Sit on the settee, some of you. To the housemaid, pointing to the chair against the right-hand wall. Worringham, bring that chair forward. That's right. I want you all to be comfortable. Obviously oppressed by the mystery shrouding the proceedings, the cook, the kitchen maid, and the useful maid seat themselves upon the settee. The parlour maid enthrones herself in the chair on the left of the small table, while the housemaid fetches the chair from the right, as directed, and sits in it at the near end of the city. The mistress to the master, in a whisper, gently pushing him towards the middle of the room. Now, darling. She sits upon the fauteuil stool, and eagerly watches the servants' faces. The master addressing the servants. Uh, um, I should like you to understand that this is an idea of Mrs. Dorrington's, her idea entirely. Uh, uh, Mrs. Dorrington desires me to say, uh... To the cook, who is steadily munching, irritably. I'm afraid you're not nearly through with your lunch. The cook, moving her jaws regularly, regards him with dull eyes and offers no reply. The mistress reprovingly. Ernest! The master with an effort. I repeat, 
I am desired by Mrs. Dorrington to say. The odd man enters quietly, closes the door, and advances to the back of the settee, where he takes up an attitude of deep attention. He is a genial, beery-looking individual in a linen jacket and baize apron, and with a dirty leather in his hand. Who's this? The odd man, dear. My hat. Do you wish to include him? The mistress vaguely. N no, I hadn't thought of doing so. The master to the odd man. What do you want? The odd man pointing to the parlour maid. I'm here in obedience to a message brought by this young lady while I was having a snack in the hall. Uh, to the mistress, turning away. Oh, you take this on, Norma. The mistress rising. Look here. I forget your name. Gage. Gale, mum. G-A-L-E. Gale. Think of wind. Thank you. There is no need for me to think of wind. Look here, Gale. My message was to the servants. Exactly, ma'am. Don't interrupt me. I meant the regular servants, those who sleep in the house. I've dropped off to sleep in the house more than once. To the cook. Haven't I, Mrs. Ackett? Then you oughtn't to have done so. However, I can't discuss the point now. Be good enough to remain downstairs in case the tradesman's or the visitor's bell rings. The odd man lingering. Right you are, ma'am. It's been a misunderstanding on my part. That's all it's been. The best of us is liable to mistakes. The master rejoining the mistress. To the odd man. Go away! Go away! The odd man touching his forehead. First time I've had the pleasure of seeing you, sir. The loss has been mutual. That is, to have a conversation, so to speak. Yes, yes, go away. The odd man producing a soiled and torn paper from his pocket. Where's my list of duties? You've got it. Run along. The odd man whistling. Phew, luckily I'm not required here. My busy morning. He departs. The mistress to the master, reseating herself upon the fauteuil stool. Start afresh, darling. The master resuming his address. Uh, um, as I have already informed you, I am desired by Mrs. Dorrington to, uh... To the cook, who is still munching. For heaven's sake, Mrs. Thingamy, swallow and have done with it. Ernest! The cook gulps painfully. Oh, Ernest! Sorry, sorry. Oh, dear. To the master. Once more. The master to the servants. I am desired by Mrs. Dorrington to say that, uh, in consideration of, um, your long and valued services... Ernie. Eh? Only a week. I, I know, I know. To the servants. In consideration of the long and valuable services which we have every reason to, um, uh, hope and to, um, expect. The mistress prompting him. You will render us. The master to the servants. Every reason to hope and expect that you will render us, it is her wish, our joint wish, in fact, to give you occasionally a little, how shall I describe it? Treat. Distraction. Wholesome amusement. And this being our intention, we propose to begin by sending you all to the play. The theatre. The theatre. And, uh, and, um... To the mistress. That's all, I believe, Norma? Thank you, dearest. Beaming upon the servants. Well? Well? There is silence. The parlour maid tidies her hair fastidiously. The housemaid, a solemn-visaged young woman, looks down her nose and tightly compresses her lips. The cook's face remains a blank. The useful maid, a thin, anemic girl, stares into space with watery eyes. The kitchen maid, crushed into the further corner of the settee by the cook, 
is almost completely hidden. Well? The useful maid, suddenly breaking into sobs and searching for a handkerchief. <gasps> The master to the mistress. Eh? What the? The mistress to the master. Shh. To the useful maid, soothingly. Now, Trinda, Trinda, do try to control yourself. The useful maid, wiping her eyes. Oh, oh, such wonderful kindness I've never experienced in any situation I've been in. The master to the mistress, in a whisper. Is she always? The mistress in the same tone, nodding. Inclined to be a little hysterical. Uh huh. The useful maid to the mistress. You're the nicest lady I've had anything to do with. <laughs> the mistress gently. Trinda, Trinda. Mr. Dorrington, too. Oh, what a th th thorough gentleman. The master to the mistress. The useful maid, isn't she? The mistress nodding again. Yes. <laughs> Ernest. The useful maid to the master. You must excuse me, sir. I'm, I'm a trifle run down. That's the truth. To the mistress. I isn't it, m m madam? The mistress assentingly. Below par. I've been talking about taking a tonic for ever so long. This decides me. Well, under the Insurance Act... Ernie. <laughs> the mistress to the useful maid. Shh, dear, dear. Pull yourself together. I am glad you appreciate what we are doing for you. To the cook, brightly. Now, Mrs. Hackett... It's your turn. Let us hear what you have to say. The cook, heavily. Me, mum? The treat. The visit to the theatre. Wake up, Mrs. Hackett. Apologising for the question, mum. I presume this ply-going ain't intended to interfere with our usual outs? The mistress blankly. Interfere with your... Because I don't think that it'd be appreciated by the girls, by any manner or means. The master looking at the mistress. Upon my soul. The mistress rising stiffly. Extraordinary. The master and the mistress change places. Of course, your usual nights out will not be interfered with. I merely asked. Really, Mrs. Hackett. No offence, mum. The mistress tapping her foot upon the floor. Not the least. Then it would be best on a Monday night, if it's to be at all. If it's to be... Odd man reappears, closing the door as before. There's that fellow again. The mistress to the odd man. Uh, what is it, Gage? The odd man advancing. Gale, ma'am. Think of wind. The mistress, hotly. I shall not think of wind. Does anybody want Mrs. Hackett? The odd man, leaning upon the back of the settee. Not that I'm aware, ma'am. The master changing places with the mistress. Then confound you. It's like this, sir. I've been turning the lady's remark over in my mind as to my not being a regular servant. Oh, pickles. And the conclusion I have arrived at... You will arrive at a still speedier conclusion so far as this establishment is concerned, if you're not careful. Most assuredly. The odd man, argumentatively. You see, sir, my point is... Your pint? It looks as if your pint had been a gallon. <laughs> the odd man, ignoring the suggestion. My point is... That if a employer takes out a inland revenue license for a handyman, how dare you attempt to argue with me? 
that constitutes him a regular servant therefore go, go away. away keep in the basement outrageous oh, what next the odd man producing his paper again resignedly where's my list of duties you've already referred to it it's getting worn out the odd man moving slowly to the door i'm getting wore out fairly oh be off the odd man at the door reading his paper hello four winders he withdraws the mistress walking away to the fireplace oh. Oh. pacing up and down terrible person the master pacing up and down the middle of the room dreadful creature gradually calming himself oh law wiping his brow stupid to allow oneself to be upset by trifles <laughs> to the parlour maid well my good girl phew what observations have you to favour us with eh the parlour maid languidly observations with regard to the theatre precisely with regard to the theatre oh i am quite agreeable i am sure agreeable agreeable provided an extra seat next to mine is booked for my friend your the mistress coming to the breakfast table friend who my fiance i never attend places of amusement unaccompanied by my friend the master at a loss uh indeed to the mistress perhaps you had better deal with this norma the mistress advances and the master seats himself upon the fauteuil stool and glares at nothing in particular the mistress to the parlour-maid this is the first i have heard of a young man beechcroft how long have you and he been walking out the parlour-maid raising her eyebrows higher than ever walking out keeping company keeping company keeping company don't i speak plainly the parlour-maid loftily i have known him for years but our engagement wasn't announced to our respectful families till february respective not respectful if you wouldn't try to use words that are beyond you the telephone bell rings in the hall <sighs> telephone the parlour-maid rises and saunters to the door look sharp beechcroft to the master as the parlour-maid disappears i i i suppose there's no objection the master between his teeth extra ticket an additional ticket the master gratingly i suppose not the useful maid indulging in another fit of weeping <laughs> oh what kindness the master groaning Oh. The mistress stamping her foot. Silence, Trinder. Compose yourself. <laughs> the parlour maid returns. The mistress to the parlour maid. Who is it? The parlour maid going back to her chair. Wrong number. Well, Beechcroft, Mr. Dorrington and I have weighed your application carefully and we have decided to accede to it the parlour-maid resuming her seat an extra fatal for my friend the mistress graciously an additional seat for your friend the parlour-maid arranging her apron thanks awfully two the mistress to the master surprised two two extra seats one for himself and the other for his hat the parlour-maid to the mistress resentfully really madam the mistress to the master in a tone of warning ernest the useful maid stuffing her handkerchief into her mouth <laughs> great scott be quiet trinder oh what liberality 
pretty. <laughs> the cook in a deep voice. Apologising for the interruption. <sighs> what now, Mrs. Hackett? Apologising for the interruption. If Beechcroft is given permission to bring her friend, I shall expect to have a ticket took for my nephew. Your nephew? The master rises, grimly and silently. Your... My favourite nephew. The mistress to the master, falteringly. Ernest? The master, changing places with the mistress, restraining himself with difficulty. Forgive me for reminding you, Mrs. Hatchett. Hackett. The master, with a wave of the hand. Forgive me for reminding you that your favourite nephew is not my favourite nephew, nor Mrs. Dorrington's. Neither ain't Beechcroft's friend your friend, come to that. The master, his fingers twitching. True. The mistress to the cook. What is he, this nephew? He's a dog exerciser. Dog exerciser? Dog? He exercises pet dogs for ladies in the hotels, drags their animals round the park. He's got quite a big connection, Albert has. I reckon he's heard of his profession. The mistress to the master, weakly. Ernie. Albert will end by having his portrait in the Daily Mirror. It is prophesied. The mistress to the master. I... I... I suppose uh, there's no objection. Extra ticket? An another ticket? The master gutturally. I suppose not. The useful maid, unable to repress her tears. <laughs> Trinda. Oh, what generosity. Such treatment I've never met with. The years I've been in service. The mistress, again pacing the room on the left. <laughs> oh, this is maddening. The telephone bell is again heard. The parlour maid, rising. Telephone! The master, furiously. Damn the telephone! The housemaid, with a sudden jerk and a shiver. Oh, oh my! The parlour maid goes out. The mistress rejoining the master and addressing the housemaid with asperity. Oh, I'm forgetting you, Warringham. We haven't heard from you yet. How many young men do you wish us to take tickets for? The housemaid severely. None, ma'am. The mistress ironically. None? Astonishing. The master to the housemaid. Oh, come. A favorite cousin? The housemaid shaking her head. I have been brought up much more strict than what most girls in my station of life have been brought up. Being a dissenter, I have no use for men, young or old. The master, with mock concern. You appall me. Not that men are wholly unnecessary, mark you. I don't go so far as to maintain that. What a relief. Even that partial concession. The parlour maid re-enters. Who is it? Wrong number. The master angrily. Pish. The parlour maid returning to her chair. Where are we? Where are we? The parlour maid sitting again. Where have we got to? We have got to the desolating disclosure that er uh, Warringham. That Warringham has a strong antipathy to the male sex. The parlour maid disdainfully. Ha ha. The housemaid to the parlour maid. Yes, you may laugh, Miss Beechcroft. Drawing herself up. Neither have I, I must avow it. Neither have I the slightest use of theatres or theatre going. Oh! I select cinema now and again, perhaps. But theatres, no. To the mistress. And if I may be pardoned the liberty, ma'am, I do think it would have been more considerate to have consulted each of us as to our particular tastes and likings before seeking to drive us all to the playhouse as though we're a flock of sheep. 
the mistress dropping on the fauteuil stool. Well, I never. By Jove, this caps everything. The telephone bell rings again. The parlourmaid rising. Telephone. The mistress starting up. Oh, damn the telephone. Norma. The housemaid horrified. Oh, oh dear. The parlourmaid goes out. The master to the mistress in her ear. Don't lose your dignity. <laughs> Keep your dignity. Keep your dignity. The mistress passing him and going to the settee. Where's Evelyn? Evelyn? The master pacing the room on the left. Who's Evelyn? The kitchen maid. Stamping her foot. Evelyn! The kitchen maid struggling to the surface. Coming, Mum! The mistress shaking her finger at the kitchen maid as the girl succeeds in making herself visible. Now listen to me, Evelyn. I won't stand any nonsense from you. Are you a playgoer? The kitchen maid, a poor little object with a rough head of hair. I'm willing to be, Mum. I'm game for anything. The master, exultingly. Ha <laughs> Evelyn is game for anything. The mistress, unsteadily. <laughs> That's a comfort. To the kitchen maid. And do you demand an extra ticket, child, for a friend or relation? No, Mum, thank you. I got no relations or acquaintances whatsoever. The cook to the kitchen maid, smothering her again. Eh, yeah, don't you be so talkative. The parlour maid returns. The mistress to the parlour maid. Who is it? Wrong number. The mistress going to the fireplace and clinging to the mantelpiece. <sighs> the master coming to the middle of the room. Curse that exchange of ours. The parlour maid coldly. I have just done so. The housemaid shuddering. Oh! The parlour maid receding herself. Where are we? The master, his hand to his brow. Where are we? Where have we got to? The master wearily. To the discovery of the pleasing circumstance that Evelyn, looking at the settee, who was here a minute ago, that Evelyn is potentially a patron of the drama. The door reopens and the odd man appears again. He is carrying a pail of water, some dusters, and his leather. He closes the door softly and goes towards the window. The master reels against the breakfast table. Norma! The mistress turning. <laughs> Mercy for powers! The master intercepting the odd man and bringing him forward. Blizzard? Gale, sir. Think of wind. I do, but mere wind seems to express the situation inadequately. Pointing to the pail. What's this? The odd man, depositing the pail upon the floor and producing his paper. Where's my list of duties? The mistress sitting in the chair on the left of the breakfast table and clasping her temples. Oh, Ernest. The odd man indicating with a dirty forefinger an instruction in his paper. See here. The master blinking at the paper. The words swim before me. The odd man reading. Thursday. What's today? Thursday. Thursday. Pointing to instructions on paper. Clean morning room windows. He replaces the paper in his pocket and is about to pick up the pail. The master, touching the odd man's arm with terrible calmness. No. You have conquered by the aid of fate and a superior intelligence. Sit down. You are a regular servant. Displaying great alacrity, the odd man takes the chair from before the writing table and seats himself by the parlour maid. The master sits in the chair at the further side of the breakfast table and rests his head upon his hands. The useful maid, her bosom heaving. <laughs> the mistress, stopping her ears. Oh, 
don't. Oh, what soft-heartedness. Oh. Trina. The useful maid, her sobs subsiding. The mistress sinking back in her chair, exhausted. Oh. The odd man, after a look around, coughing to attract the master's attention. Ahem, ahem. May I venture for to ask? The master raising his head. What is all this year about? Exactly, sir. I will answer your question with another. Are you a playgoer? The odd man appealing to the air. Am I a playgoer? To the master, volubly. Don't my mother keep a small shop in Crawford Street, Marleybone, and ain't she continually receiving orders for exhibiting the theatre bills? Indeed. Yes, indeed. And the worse the failures at the theatre, the quicker the orders flows in. Doubtless. Why, Lord bless you, sir. We literally play for fiascos, mother and me. Enough. I am satisfied that you are, in the fullest sense, a patron of the drama. To the mistress, whose eyes are closed. My darling, all that is left to do, it seems to me, is to complete the arrangements for the, um, approaching festivity. The odd man, joyously. What? Slapping his thigh. Do I guess right? Is there a beano on? The master to the odd man. You are correct in your surmise. There is a beano on. To the mistress. Norma. The cook, as the mistress opens her eyes. Apologizing for the interruption. The mistress shutting her eyes again, feebly. <sighs> Apologizing for the interruption, as Warringham ain't to be one of the party. She will be able to mind the house during our absences and warm our suppers. The odd man, following the proceedings with the keenest interest. Ear, ear. The housemaid to the cook, bridling. Oh, no, she won't. Certainly not. The mistress again opening her eyes. That is for me to decide. The housemaid to the mistress. Begging your pardon, ma'am, but I never said I wasn't ready to sacrifice my private feelings and beliefs and to go to the theater. To oblige. The mistress rallying. <laughs> to oblige? Oblige. Yes, sir. For the sake of my fellow servants, as well as for yours and Mrs. Dorrington's. For the sake of your... To give the party an air of respectability, as it were. Respectability. Respectability. The cook to the parlour maid. I'd have you know, Miss Grice Warringham. Insulting cat. The odd man softly. Order, order. The useful maid weeping. Oh, what dissensions! Oh. The kitchen maid endeavoring to bring herself into view. Er, let me say something. The cook to the kitchen maid. You shut up, Evelyn Pletch! The parlour maid derisively. <laughs> the mistress struggling to her feet. Stop! Stop! The telephone bell rings again. Telephone! The parlour maid rising. Damn the phone! Beechcroft! The housemaid clapping her hand to her heart. Oh! Oh my goodness! The parlour maid stalks out. The mistress leaning upon the breakfast table, panting. You! You'll drive me into a lunatic asylum amongst you! The master rising and approaching the mistress. My darling, you must not agitate yourself. Barking his shin against the pail. Oh! The mistress sympathetically. Oh, Ernie! The master in great pain. Ah! Oh. Picking up the pail. This is... The odd man to the master, not stirring. Now you see, sir, how easy accidents happen to us domestics. 
Only yesterday. The master to the mistress. You must not agitate yourself in this way, pussy. Wincing. Your original plan. Tell them. The mistress advancing to the servants. My plan is not to send you all to the theatre on the same night, but in botches. Batches. The mistress to the master on the verge of tears. Oh, don't catch me up so. To servants. Mrs. Hackett and her nephew, Evelyn and Trinder, are to go first. Warringham, Beechcroft and her friend, and... 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 To the master. What's his name? The master savagely. Typhoon. The mistress to the servants. Typhoon? Darting a glance of reproach at the master. <laughs> no, it isn't. Pointing to the odd man. And him, the second knight. The master to the mistress. He, the second knight. The mistress to the master. Don't. The odd man to the mistress. I'll go both nights, ma'am, if it'll promote harmony. The mistress to the odd man. You shall do nothing of the sort. The useful maid weeping copiously. <laughs> I'd stay at home and hot up the suppers with glee. The mistress frenzied. Oh. Apologizing for the interruption. Now what? Apologizing for the interruption. In all good houses, whenever there's a special out, the cook goes with the butler. We, we don't, don't keep, keep a, a butler. butler. And where no butler is kept, she goes with the parlour maid. The master to the mistress in a whisper. Rearrange it. Rearrange it. The mistress to the master. I won't. To the cook, fiercely. Mrs. Hackett. Oh, I merely stated what is customary in good houses. The odd man to the mistress. Count me as the butter, ma'am, if it'll help you out of your mess. I won't. To the parlour maid, who reappears at this juncture and returns to a chair. Who was it? The parlour maid, distantly. My friend. The mistress to the master. Our telephone. The master, changing places with the mistress, to the parlour maid. Impudent. The parlour maid to the master. Really? The mistress discovering that the master is unthinkingly carrying the pail about with him, under her breath. Oh, Ernest. The parlour maid seating herself. Where are we? The master to the parlour maid. Oh, we can't keep on going back for you, you know. Ernie. The master to the mistress, over his shoulder. Hey? The parlour maid deeply injured. Oh, very well. Then I shall lose the thread of it. The master to the parlour maid. All right, then. You've got to lose a thread of it. Ernest. The master turning to the mistress. What is it? The mistress looking at him significantly. Pale. The master self-pityingly. Pale, am I? Passing his hand across his face. I don't wonder. No, no. Taking the pail from him. Give it to me. Oh. The mistress in his ear. You are losing your dignity. She moves away with the pail and stands it upon the floor between the fireplace and the breakfast table. The odd man to the master, highly tickled by his strange behaviour. Ho, ho, ho. Fancy you, sir, walking about with a pail for choice. Oh, oh, that beats me. The master light-heartedly. <laughs> Apologising for the interruption. Don't mention it. Apologising for the interruption. Appears to me. There is only one more little matter to be disposed of. One more? What theatre and what play are we all to be packed off to? Quite so, quite so. Eyeing the mistress, who, with a look of leaden apathy, has sunk down upon the fauteuil stool. Dearest? Oh, I'm for a hearty laugh, I am. The odd man slapping his leg again. 
so am i so am i i was always celebrated for my gaiety till my teeth failed me <laughs> as for laughter nobody can laugh louder than what i can when provoked straightening her back the play i will not consent to witness is the play containing love and passion the kitchen maid coming to the surface again uh i've no such objection the cook to the kitchen maid you hold your tongue evelyn the odd man to the housemaid gone don't be so simple they only pretend pretend <sighs> i've heard lips glued to lips the parlour maid icily if i may pass a remark you may the proper thing to do is to wait and consult my friend the housemaid witheringly your friend <laughs> why not mrs hackett's nephew while you're about it the cook to housemaid yes and why not oh the parlour maid curling her lip at the housemaid cheek the cook to the housemaid utter a syllable against my nephew the odd man pacifically cookie 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 <gasps> oh <laughs> dissension on dissension uh... the mistress rousing herself silence the master to the mistress helplessly norma the mistress starting up and advancing to the servants now understand me clearly once and for all you servants will go exactly where mr dorrington and i choose to send you the odd man to the mistress i haven't been to one of the halls lately ma'am silence to the female servants and that will be to no entertainment of a trivial and frivolous character the odd man urgently mother don't get no paper for the alls be quiet to the female servants what you will see is a play of ideas something to stimulate your imaginations and make you think ideas the parlour maid with a sickly expression make us think the odd man gloomily crikey a slice cut clean out of life in fact you follow me sounds horribly cruel the kitchen maid awestruck does that mean that knives is freely used mum not necessarily except by the censor the cook after a pause during which the servants look at each other inquiringly well anyhow girls it strikes me we're in for a precious dull evening the mistress throwing up her arms oh the master who has been fuming at the back of the room oh coming to grief over the pail again as he hurries to the mistress dash it blow the mistress turning to him ernest the master limping towards her ah tis shaking his fist at the cook you 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 ill-conditioned odious old woman odious the mistress to the cook odious old the mistress to the cook you told me you were forty forty the master rubbing his leg fifty if she's a day the cook to the mistress i was forty a week ago before i entered your service this is the last straw i leave at the end of my month oh do do and what's more i take my kitchen maid with me certainly, certainly. i leave also and me <laughs> and me i really couldn't remain in a place where changes are so frequently made most disadvantageous nor i where such language is spoke as has been spoke this morning in my hearing 
to be thrown with a strange set of girls after being p p p perfectly happy with this set would be more than I could bear. <laughs> the mistress hysterically. <laughs> to the master. And this... <laughs> and this is the result of my new system. <laughs> Led by the cook, all the female servants rise, the cook clutching the kitchen maid, the cook to the mistress. New system, you call it. A nice new system. I hope it'll be a lesson to you both, not to treat first-class servants patronizingly and condescendingly. The master advancing. Oh, go to the devil. The cook to the master. At any rate, with him, I shouldn't have the constant complaints I've had in this house about there being no hot water for the baths. The mistress to the master. <laughs> yeah. Now we've laid ourselves open to repartee. The cook to the servants. Come along and let's resume our lunches. The female servants make for the door, murmuring as they go. The kitchen maid still in the grip of the cook sullenly. Uh, I don't know where I am. I had a foreboding I'd got with this little people from the first. <laughs> Shouldn't be surprised if this exhilarates my marriage. Odious and old. <laughs> they take their departure, and the door is closed with a slam. The mistress clinging to the master and breaking down. Oh. <laughs> Never mind, pussy. Never mind. Pluck up. The mistress crying upon his shoulder. <laughs> All the ground to go over again. All over again. <laughs> they become conscious that they are not alone and that the odd man is standing by the settee and regarding them benevolently. The master to the mistress, hoarsely. No, not all. The mistress in a whisper. Uh, the odd man. Very quietly, she fetches the pail and hands it to the master. The master, presenting it to the odd man with an ingratiating smile. Allow me. The End End of Playgoers, a domestic episode by Arthur Wing Pinero. The Faraway Princess by Herman Suderman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters the Princess von Geldern, read by Sandra Schmidt. Baroness von Bruck, her maid of honor, read by Sonja. Monica M. C., reading Frau von Haldorf. Lady, her daughter, read by Maria Fatima de Silva. Millie, her daughter, read by Maria Joy. Fritz Strubel, a student, read by Thomas Peter. Frau Lindemann, read by T.J. Burns. Rosa, a waitress, read by phone. Narration, read by Todd. The Faraway Princess. The present day, the scene is laid at an inn situated above a watering place in central Germany. The veranda of an inn. The right side of the stage and half of the background represent a framework of glass enclosing the veranda. The left side and the other half of the background represent the stone walls of the house. To the left, in the foreground, a door. Another door in the background at the left. On the left, back, a buffet and serving table. Neat little tables and small iron chairs for visitors are placed about the veranda. On the right, in the center, a large telescope, standing on a tripod, is directed through an open window. Rosa, dressed in the costume of the country, is arranging flowers on the small tables. Frau Lindemann, a handsome, stoutish woman in the thirties, hurries in excitedly from the left. 
There. Now she can come. Curtains, bedding, everything fresh and clean as new. No, this honor, this unexpected honor. Barons and counts have been here often enough. Even the Russian princes sometimes come up here from the springs. I don't bother my head about them. They're just like that. But a princess. A real princess. Perhaps it isn't a real princess after all. What? What do you mean by that? I was only thinking that a real princess wouldn't be coming to an inn like this. Real princesses won't lie on anything but silks and velvets. You just wait and see. It's a trick. Are you going to pretend that the letter isn't genuine? That the letter is a forgery? Maybe one of the regular customers is playing a joke? That student, Herr Struble, he's always joking. <laughs> when Herr Struble makes a joke, he makes a decent joke. A real, genuine joke. Oh, of course, one has to pretend to be angry sometimes. But as for writing a forged letter, my land, a letter with a gold crown on it, there. She takes a letter from her waist and reads. This afternoon, Her Highness, the princess from Geldern, will stop at the Fairview Inn to rest an hour or so before making the descent to the springs. You are requested to have ready a quiet and comfortable room to guard Her Highness from any annoying advances and, above all, to maintain the strictest secrecy regarding this event, as otherwise the royal visit will not be repeated. Baroness von Bruck, maid of honor to Her Highness. Now what have you got to say? Herr Struble lent me a book once. A maid of honor came into that too. I'm sure it's a trick. Frau Lindemann looking out toward the back. Dear, dear, isn't that Herr Strubel now, coming up the hill? Today, of all days, what on earth does he always want up here? He is in such favor at the inn, he won't be leaving here all day. That won't do at all. He's got to be sent off. If only I knew how I could. Oh uh ho -huh. I'll be disagreeable to him. That's the only way to manage it. Strubel enters. He is a handsome young fellow, without much polish, but cheerful, unaffected, entirely at his ease, and invariably good-natured. Good day, everybody. Charming day. Strubel, surprised at her coolness. I say, what's up? Who's been rubbing you the wrong way? May I have a glass of beer, anyway? Glass of beer, if you please. Several glasses of beer, if you please. Sit down. Pestiferously hot this afternoon. Mm-hmm. Landlady Linda, dear, why so quiet today? In the first place, Herr Strubel, I would have you know that my name is Frau Lindemann. Just so. And secondly, if you don't stop your familiarity... Strubel, singing, as Rosa brings him a glass of beer. Beer, beer. Heavens and earth, how hot it is drinks if you find it so hot why don't you stay quietly down there at the springs ah my soul thirsts for the heights my soul thirsts for the heights every afternoon just as soon as ever my sallow-faced pupil has thrown himself down on the couch to give his red corpuscles a chance to grow i gaily grasp my alpine staff and mount to my beloved bah oh Ha, you're thinking that you are my beloved. No, dearest, my beloved stays down there. But to get nearer to her, I have to come up here, up to your telescope. With the aid of your telescope, I can look right into her window. See? Oh, that's why. Perhaps you think I'm interested in all that. Besides, I've no more time for you. Moreover, I'm going to have this place cleaned right away. Goodbye, Herr Strubel. Goes out. I certainly caught that time. See here, Rosa, what's got into her head? Rosa, mysteriously. <clears throat> there are crowned heads and other heads, and <clears throat> there are letters with crowns and letters without crowns. Letters? Are you... There are maids of honor and other maids. <laughs> Permit me. Tapping her forehead lightly with his finger. Oh! Ooh! What's the matter? Why, your head's on fire. 
Plow, plow, and while you are getting some salve for my burns, I'll just... Goes to the telescope. Enter Frau von Haldorf, Liddy, and Milly. Frau von Haldorf is an aristocratic woman, somewhat supercilious and affected. Here's the telescope, mother. Now you can see for yourself. What a pity that it's in use just now. Struble, stepping back. Oh, I beg of you, ladies. I have plenty of time. I can wait. Uh, thanks so much. She goes up to the telescope while Struble returns to his former place. Waitress, bring us three glasses of milk. Liddy, as Millie languidly drops into a chair. Beyond to the right is the road, mother. Oh, I have found the road, but I see no carriage. Neither a royal carriage nor any other sort. Let me look. Please do. It has disappeared now. Are you quite sure that it was a royal carriage? Oh, one has an instinct for that sort of thing, mother. It comes to one in the cradle. Frau von Haldorf, as Millie yawns and sighs aloud. Are you sleepy, dear? No, only tired. I'm always tired. Well, that's just why we are at the springs. Do as the princess does. Take the borders religiously. The princess oughtn't to be climbing up such a steep hill either on a hot day like this. Well, you know why we are taking all this trouble. If by good luck we should happen to meet the princess... Liddy, who has been looking through the telescope... Oh, there it is again! Where? Where? Takes Liddy's place. It's just coming around the turn at the top. Oh, now I see it. Why, there's no one inside. Well, then she's coming up on foot. Frau von Haldorf to Millie. See, the princess is coming up on foot too. And she's just as anemic as you are. If I were going to marry a grand duke, and if I could have my own carriage driven along beside me, I wouldn't complain of having to walk either. I can't see a thing now. You have to turn the screw, mother. I have been turning it right along, but the telescope won't move. Let me try. Struble, who has been throwing little wads of paper at Rosa during the preceding conversation. What are they up to? It seems to me that you've turned the screw too far, mother. Well, what shall we do about it? Struble, rising. Permit me to come to your aid, ladies. I've had some experience with these old screws. Very kind, indeed. Struble busies himself with the instrument. Listen, mother, if the carriage has almost reached the top, the princess can't be far off. Wouldn't it be best, then, to watch for them on the road? Certainly, if you think that would be best, dear Liddy. This is not only an old screw, but it's a regular perverted old screw. Uh, really? Aside to her daughters. And if she should actually speak to us at this accidental meeting, and if we could present ourselves as the subjects of a noble fiancé, and tell her that we live at her future home, just imagine what an advantage that it would give us over the other women of the court. There, ladies, we have now rescued the useful instrument to which the far-sightedness of mankind is indebted. Thanks so much. Pardon me, sir, but have you heard anything about the report that the princess is going to make the journey up here today? The princess? The princess of the springs? The princess of the lonely villa. The princess who is expected at the Iron Spring every morning, but who has never been seen by living soul. Why, I am enormously interested. You wouldn't believe how much interested I am. Liddy, who has looked out back. There, there, there it is. The carriage? It's reached the top already. It is stopping over there at the edge of the woods. 
She will surely enter it there then. Come quickly, my dear children, so that it will look quite accidental. Here's your money. She throws a coin to Rosa and unwraps a small package done up in tissue paper, which she has brought with her. Here's a bouquet for you, and here's one for you. You are to present these to the princess. So that it will look quite accidental. Oh, yes. All three go out. Good heavens! Could I? I don't believe it. Surely she sits. Well, I'll make sure right away. Goes up to the telescope and stops. Oh, I'll go along with them anyhow. Exit after them. Frau Lindemann entering. Have they gone? All of them? All of them. Frau Lindemann looking toward the right. There, there. Two ladies and a lackey are coming up the footpath. Mercy me, how my heart is beating. If I had only had the sofa recovered last spring, what am I going to say to them? Rosa, don't you know a poem by heart which you could speak to the princess? Rosa shrugs her shoulders. They're coming through the court now. Stop putting your arms under your apron that way, you stupid thing. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. The door opens. A lackey in plain black livery enters and remains standing at the door. He precedes the princess and Frau von Bruck. The princess is a pale, sickly, unassuming young girl, wearing a very simple walking costume and a medium-sized leghorn hat trimmed with roses. Frau von Bruck is a handsome, stately, stern-looking woman in the thirties. She is well-dressed, but in accordance with the simple tastes of the North German nobility. Who is the proprietor of this place? A at your command, your highness. I am the maid of honor. Where is the room that has been ordered? Frau Lindemann opens the door, left. Here, at the head of the stairs, my lady. Would your highness care to remain here for a few moments? Very much, dear Frau von Bruck. Edward, order what is needed for her highness, and see that a room next to her highness is prepared for me. I may assume that these are your highness's wishes? Why, certainly, dear Frau von Bruck. The lackey, who is carrying shawls and pillows, goes out with Rosa, left. Mais puisque je te dis, Eugénie, que je n'ai pas sommeil, M'envoyer coucher comme une enfant, c'est abominable. Mais je t'implore, chérie, sois sage. Tu sais que c'est le médecin qui... Ah, ton médecin, toujours cette corvée. Et si je te dis... Chut My dear woman, wouldn't it be best for you to superintend the preparations? I am entirely at your service. About to go out, left. One thing more. This veranda, leading from the house to the grounds... Would it be possible to close it to the public? Oh, certainly. The guests, as often as not, sit out under the trees. Very well, then do so, please. Frau Lindemann locks the door. We may be assured that no one will enter this place. If it is desired, none of us belonging to the house will come in here either. We should like that. Very well. Exit. Really, you must be more careful, darling. If that woman had understood French, you must be careful. What would have been so dreadful about it? Oh, my dear child, this mood of yours, which is due to nothing but your illness, that reminds me you haven't taken your peptonized milk yet. This is a secret which we must keep from everyone, above all from your fiancé. If the Grand Duke should discover... The princess, shrugging her shoulders. Well, what of it? A bride's duty is to be a happy bride. Otherwise, otherwise, she will be a lonely and an unloved woman. The princess, with a little smile of resignation. <sighs> what is it, dear? The princess shakes her head. And then think of the strain of those formal presentations awaiting you in the autumn. You must grow strong. Remember that you must be equal to the most exacting demands of life. Of life? Whose life? What do you mean by that? Oh, what good does it do to talk about it? Yes, you are right. 
in my soul too there are unhappy and unholy thoughts that i would rather not utter from my own experience i know that it is best to keep strictly within the narrow path of duty and to go to sleep ah it isn't only that look out there see the woods ah to lie down on the moss to cover oneself with leaves to watch the clouds pass by high above frau von brook softening we can do that too sometime <laughs> sometime the lackey appears at the door is everything ready the lackey bows the princess aside to frau von brook but i simply cannot sleep try to for my sake aloud does your highness command the princess smiling and sighing yes i command they go out left the stage remains empty for several moments then struble is heard trying the latch of the back door hello what's up why is this locked all of a sudden rosa open up i've got to look through the telescope rosa won't you oh well i know how to help myself he is seen walking outside of the glass-covered veranda then he puts his head through the open window at the right not a soul inside climbs over well here we are what on earth has happened to these people unlocks the back door and looks out everything deserted well it's all the same to me locks the door again well let's find out right away what the carriage has to do with the case prepares to look through the telescope the princess enters cautiously through the door at the left her hat in her hand without noticing struble who is standing motionless before the telescope she goes hurriedly to the door at the back and unlocks it struble startled at the sound of the key turns around why how do you do the princess not venturing to move glances back at the door through which she has entered wouldn't you like to look through the telescope a while please do the princess undecided as to whether or not she should answer him takes a few steps back toward the door at the left why are you going away i won't do anything to you the princess reassured oh i'm not going away that's right but where have you come from the door was locked surely you didn't climb through the window as i did what you came through the window of course i did the princess frightened anew but then i had rather about to go back oh my dear young lady you just stay right here why before i drive you away i'd pitch myself headlong over a precipice the princess smiling reassured <laughs> i only wanted to go out into the woods for half an hour oh then you are a regular guest here at the inn oh yes yes of course and of course you drink the waters down below oh yes i drink the waters and i'm taking the baths too two hundred meters up and down every time isn't that very hard on you heavens and you look so pale see here my dear young lady don't you do it it would be better for you to go down there that is uh, oh forgive me i've been talking without thinking of course you have your own reasons it's decidedly cheaper up here i know how to value a thing of that sort i've never had any money in all my life the princess trying to seem practical but when one comes to a watering place one must have money struble slapping himself on the chest do i look to you as if i drank iron thank heaven i can't afford such luxuries no i'm only a poor fellow who earns his miserable pittance during vacation by acting as a private tutor that's to say miserable is only a figure of speech for in the morning i lie abed until nine at noon i eat five and at night seven courses and as for work i really haven't a thing to do my pupil is so anemic <laughs> compared to him you're fit for a circus rider <laughs> oh well i'm rather glad i'm not one dear me it's a business like any other like any other really i didn't think that and pray what did you think then oh i thought they were an entirely different sort of people my dear young lady 
all people are an entirely different sort of course we too aren't we get along real well together don't we as poor as church mice both of us the princess smiling reflectively hmm. who knows perhaps that's true do you know what if you want to stay down there i'll tell you how one can live cheaply i have a friend a student like myself he's here to mend up as you are i feed him up at the house where i'm staying frightened at a peculiar look of the princesses oh but you mustn't be no i shouldn't have said it it wasn't decent of me only let me tell you i'm so glad to be able to help the poor fellow out of my unexpected earnings that i'd like to be shouting it from the housetops all the time of course you understand that don't you you like to help people then surely don't you mm, no there's always so much talk about it and the whole thing immediately appears in the newspapers but if you help someone that appears the princess quietly correcting herself i only mean if one takes part in entertainments for charity oh yes naturally and those things they always get some woman of rank to act as patroness if they can and she sees to it you may be sure that the newspapers make a fuss over it oh, not every just try to teach me something i don't know about these titled women besides my dear young lady where is your home in one of the large cities or oh no in quite a small town really more like the country then i'm going to show you something that you probably never saw before in all your life oh do what is it a princess <laughs> not a make-believe but a real true blue princess oh really yes our princess of the springs and who may that be why princess marie louise of galdon of course do you know her why certainly really i thought that she lived in great retirement well that doesn't do her any good not a bit of it and because you are such a jolly good fellow i'm going to tell you my secret i'm in love with this princess oh you can't imagine what a comfort it is the fact is every young poet has got to have a princess to love are you a poet can't you tell that by looking at me i never saw a poet before never saw a poet never saw a princess why you're learning a heap of things today the princess assenting mm -hmm. and have you written poems to her why that goes without saying quantities of them oh please recite some little thing won't you no not yet everything at the proper time ah uh, yes first i should like to see the princess no first i am going to tell you the whole story oh yes yes please do sit down well then i'd hardly heard that she was here before i was dead in love with her it was just as quick as a shot i tell you just as if i had waited all my life long to fall in love with her besides i also heard about her beauty and her sorrow you see she had an early love affair what are they saying that yes it was a young officer who went to africa because of her and died there and they know that too what don't they know but that's a mere detail it doesn't concern me even the fact that in six months she will become the bride of a grand duke even that can make no difference to me for the present she is my princess but you're not listening to me oh yes i am do you know what that means my princess i'll not give up my princess not for anything in all the world but if you don't even know her i don't know her why i know her as well as i know myself have you ever met her then i don't know of anyone who has ever met her and there's not a soul that can tell what she looks like it is said that there were pictures of her in the shop windows when she first came but they were removed immediately in the morning a great many people are always lurking around the springs trying to catch a glimpse of her i myself have gotten up at six o'clock a couple of times on the same errand and if you knew me better you'd realize what i meant but not a sign of her either she has the stuff brought to her house or she has the power of making herself invisible 
The princess turns aside to conceal a smile. After that, I used to hang around her garden, every day for hours at a time, until one day the policeman, whom the managers of the springs have stationed at the gates, came up to me and asked me what on earth I was doing there. Well, that was the end of those methods of approach. Suddenly, however, a happy thought struck me. Now I can see her and have her near to me as often as I wish. Why, that's very interesting. How? Yes, that's just the point. Hmm. Should I risk it? Should I take you into my confidence? You promised me some time ago that you would show her to me. Wait a second. Looks through the telescope. There she is. Please look for yourself. But I am... She, too, looks through the telescope. Actually, there is the garden as plain as if one were in it. And at the corner window on the left, with the embroidery frame. That's she. Are you absolutely certain that that is the princess? Why, who else could it be? Well, round about the princess like that, there is such a lot of people. For instance, there is her waiting woman. There's a seamstress and her assistants, and then there's... But, my dear young lady, if you only understood anything about these matters, you would have been certain at the very first glance that it was she, and no one else. Observe the nobility in every motion, the queenly grace with which she bends over the embroidery frame. How do you know that it's an embroidery frame? Why, what should a princess be bending over if not an embroidery frame? Do you expect her to be darning stockings? It wouldn't hurt her at all. Now, that's just one of those petty bourgeois notions which we ought to suppress. It's not enough that we have to stick in this misery, but we'd like to drag her down too. That being far above all earthly care. Oh, dear me. What are you sighing about so terribly? Tell me, wouldn't you like to have a closer acquaintance with your princess sometime? Closer? <laughs> Why should I? Isn't she close enough to me? My faraway princess. For that's what I call her when I talk to myself about her. And to have her still closer. Why, so that you could talk to her and know what she really was like? Struble, terrified. T talk to her? <laughs> Heaven forbid. G goodness gracious, no! Just see here. How am I to face a princess? I'm an ordinary fellow, the son of poor folks. I haven't polished manners. I haven't even a decent tailor. A lady like that. Why, she'd measure me from top to toe in one glance. I've had my lessons in the fine houses where I've applied as tutor. A glance from boots to cravat. And you're dismissed. And you think that I... Correcting herself. That this girl is as superficial as that. This girl. Dear me, how that sounds. But how should I ever succeed in showing her my real self? And even if I should, what would she care? Oh, yes, if she were like you, so nice and simple, and with such a kind-hearted, roguish little twinkle in her eye. Roguish? I? Why so? Because you are laughing at me in your sleeve. And really, I deserve nothing better. But your princess deserves something better than your opinion of her. How do you know that? You really ought to try to become acquainted with her sometime. No, no, no. And again, no. As long as she remains my faraway princess, she is everything that I want her to be. Modest, gracious, loving. She smiles upon me dreamily. Yes, she even listens when I recite my poems to her. That can be said of many people. And as soon as I have finished, she sighs, takes a rose from her breast, and casts it down to the poet. I wrote a few verses yesterday about that rose, that flower which represents the pinnacle of my desires, as it were. Oh, yes. Oh, please, please. Well, then, uh, here goes. <clears throat> twenty roses nestling close. What? Are there twenty now? Struble, severely. My princess would not have interrupted me. Oh, please, forgive me. I shall begin again. Twenty roses nestling close gleam upon thy breast. Twenty years of rose-red love upon thy fair cheeks rest. 
Twenty years would I gladly give out of life's brief reign, could I but ask a rose of thee, and ask it not in vain. Twenty roses thou dost not need, why, pearls and rubies are thine. With nineteen thou'dst be just as fair, and one would then be mine. And twenty years of rose raised joy would spring to life for me. Yet twenty years could ne'er suffice to worship it in thee. Oh, how nice that is! I've never had any verses written to me. Ah, my dear young lady, ordinary folks like us have to do their own verse making. And all for one rose? Dear me, how soon it fades! And then what is left you? No, my dear friend. A rose like that never fades, even as my love for the gracious giver can never die. But you haven't even got it yet. That makes no difference in the end. I'm entirely independent of such externals. When some day I shall be explaining Ovid to the beginners, or perhaps even reading Horace with the more advanced classes. No, it's better for the present not to think of reaching any such dizzy heights of greatness. Well, then I shall always be saying to myself with a smile of satisfaction— you, too, were one of those confounded artist fellows. Why, you once went so far as to love a princess. And that will make you happy? Enormously. For what makes us happy, after all? A bit of happiness. Great heavens, no. Happiness wears out like an old glove. Well, then, what does? Ah, how should I know? Any kind of a dream, a fancy, a wish unfulfilled a sorrow that we coddle, some nothing which suddenly becomes everything to us. I shall always say to my pupils, young men, if you want to be happy as long as you live, create gods for yourselves in your own image. These gods will take care of your happiness. And what would the god be like that you would create? Would be? Is, my dear young lady, is a man of the world... A gentleman, well-bred, smiling, enjoying life, who looks out upon mankind from under bushy eyebrows, who knows Nietzsche and Stendhal by heart, and... Pointing to his shoes. Who isn't down at the heels. A god, in short, worthy of my princess. I know perfectly well that all my life long I shall never do anything but crawl around on the ground like an industrious ant. But I know, too that the god of my fancy will always take me by the collar when the proper moment comes and pull me up again into the clouds. Yes, up there I'm safe. And your god, or rather your goddess, what would she look like? The princess, thoughtfully. That is not easy to say. My goddess would be a quiet, peaceful woman who would treasure a secret little joy like the apple of her eye, who would know nothing of the world except what she wanted to know, and who would have the strength to make her own choice when it pleased her. But that doesn't seem to me a particularly lofty aspiration, my dear young lady. Lofty as the heavens, my friend. My princess would be of a different opinion. Do you think so? For that's merely the ideal of every little country girl. Not her ideal. Her daily life which she counts as not. It is my ideal, because I can never attain it. Oh, I say, my dear young girl, it can't be as bad as that. A young girl like you, so charming, and... I don't want to be forward, but if I could only help you a bit. Have you got to be helping all the time? Before it was only a cheap lunch, now it's actually... Yes, yes, I'm an awful donkey, I know, but... The princess, smiling. Don't say any more about it, dear friend. I like you that way. Struble, feeling oppressed by her superiority. Really, you are an awfully strange person. There's something about you that... that... Well? I can't exactly define it. Tell me, weren't you wanting to go into the woods before? It's so... so oppressive in here. Oppressive? I don't find it so at all. Quite the contrary. No, no. I'm restless. I don't know what. At all events, may I not escort you? 
one can chat more freely one can express himself more openly if one takes a deep breath the princess smiling and you are leaving your far away princess with such a light heart oh she <laughs> she won't run away she'll be sitting there tomorrow again and the day after too and so that is your great undying love yes but when a girl like you comes across one's path frau von haldorf hurrying in and then drawing back in feigned astonishment oh liddy and milly similarly oh well ladies didn't i tell you that you wouldn't find her princesses don't grow along the roadside like weeds frau von haldorf disregarding him ceremoniously the infinite happiness with which this glorious event fills our hearts must excuse in some measure the extraordinary breach of good manners which we are committing in daring to address your highness but as the fortunate subjects of our highness's most noble fiancy we could not refrain from well well what's all this from offering to our eagerly awaited sovereign a slight token of our future loyalty lady milly lady and milly come forward and with low court bows offer their bouquets my daughters respectfully present these few flowers to the illustrious princess i beg your pardon but who is doing the joking here you or frau von brook enters the princess taken unawares has retreated more and more helplessly toward the door at the left undecided whether to take flight or remain she greets the rival of frau von brook with a happy sigh of relief frau von brook severely pardon me ladies apparently you have not taken the proper steps toward being presented to her highness in matters of this sort one must first apply to me i may be addressed every morning from eleven to twelve and i shall be happy to consider your desires frau von haldorf with dignity i and my children madame were aware of the fact that we were acting contrary to the usual procedure but the impulse of loyal hearts is guided by no rule i shall be glad to avail myself of your very kind invitation all three go out with low curtsies to the princess what forwardness but how could you come down without me and what is that young man over there doing does he belong to those people the princess shakes her head struble without a word goes to get his hat which has been lying on a chair bows abruptly and is about to leave oh no that wouldn't be nice not that way what what why your highness let me be eugenie this young man and i have become far too good friends to part in such an unfriendly yes almost hostile fashion your highness i am very much the princess to struble you and i will certainly remember this hour with great pleasure and i thank you for it with all my heart if i only had a rose with me so as to give you your dear wish eugenie haven't we any roses with us your highness i am very much the princess examining herself and searching among the vases well how are we going to manage it i most humbly thank your highness for the kind intention no no, no wait her glance falls upon the hat which she is holding in her hand with a sudden thought i have it but don't think that i'm joking and we'll have to do without scissors she tears one of the roses from the hat i don't know whether there are just twenty holding out one of the roses to him well this rose has the merit of being just as real as the sentiment of which we were speaking before and just as unfading is this to be my punishment the princess smilingly shakes her head or does your highness mean by it that only the unreal never fades that's exactly what i mean because the unreal must always dwell in the imagination so that's it 
just as it is only the far-away princesses who are always near to us. Permit me to remark, your highness, that it is high time. As you see, those who are near must hurry away. Offering him the rose again. Well? Struble is about to take it, but lets his hand fall. With the faraway princess there. Pointing down. It would have been in harmony, but with the... Shakes his head, then softly and with emotion. No thanks. I'd rather not. He bows and goes out. The princess, smiling pensively, throws away the artificial flower. I'm going to ask my fiancé to let me send him a rose. Your Highness, I am very much surprised. Well, I told you that I wasn't sleepy. Curtain End of The Faraway Princess Food, A Tragedy of the Future in One Act by William C. DeMille this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters Basil, a New Yorker. Read by Chuck Williamson. Irene, his wife. Read by T.J. Burns. Harold, an officer of the Food Trust. Read by Jim Gallagher. Narration by Philip Gould. Scene, Basil's home in New York City. Time, 50 years from now. Costumes, Basil, business suit, hat, gloves, overcoat. Irene, soft, clinging tea gown. Harold, military uniform. Lights, no changes, full white and amber. Scene, an ordinary room furnished with rich plainness. Doors, left one and right three. Windows at back. Table right center with two chairs. Small table with chair against left wall above door. Chair left a food safe. Small rug center on curtain line. Sideboard at rear to right of windows. At back, left of windows, is a refrigerator. Made to look rather like a safe. With heavy iron hinges, a large combination lock, etc. Fireplace and fire right one if possible, but not necessary. Food At rise, Irene is discovered sitting at table right center writing a check. There is a blue envelope and paper in front of her. She is a young woman about twenty-five, but very thin. Basil enters left one, wearing hat and coat. He is a man of about thirty or thirty-five also very thin. He comes and kisses her. Hello, dear. Crossing to her, kisses her, crosses to chair left a food safe, takes off coat, etc. Why, Basil, you're home early. Noticing check. Oops, I've done it again. Tears up check. Done what? Written the wrong date. I can't get it into my head that this is 1962, after writing 1961 for a whole year. Starts to write another check. What's the check for? Irene, very seriously. The grocer's bill, Basil. Basil, very serious, pausing, crossing to front of chair left of table right center. Oh, I... I see. Picks up bill. Sits, reads it, then cheers up a bit. Why, it's not as large as last month. No, it's less than $6,000. Basil, scrutinizing items. Yes, $5,867.44. What's the 44 cents? Rather stern manner and tone. Irene, ashamed. Four grains of sugar. Basil lays Bill on table, rises, crossing left in light reproof. We must be careful about sugar, dear. Irene, in pained explanation. I've tried to be, Basil. Rises, takes pen and checkbook with her, crosses to him left. And really, the bill is not much. 
when you consider how food has gone up. Basil in happier, lighter tone. Anyhow, we must live. And I'm as hungry as a wolf. Let's have dinner now. Half an hour early? I'm awfully hungry. Irene crossing to sideboard. All right. Pointing to food safe. Open the food safe, will you, dear? Irene at sideboard arranging plates together, platter on top, with forks and carvers on platter. Starts over to table. Basil opening door of safe. Burglar alarm. Bell rings. Irene starts. Huh? Uh, I always forget that burglar alarm. Basil reaches behind safe and turns off burglar alarm. Irene setting table. What brings you home so early today, dear? Basil crossing from safe to table. I'm on the jury. We just finished a case. Seats himself right of table. A very sad one, too. A, a man was being tried for killing a hen. Irene shocked at the word hen, drops fork on plate with noise. Oh, the beast! Yes. His only excuse was that his family was starving. He was found guilty. Irene, pausing setting table, looking at him in reproach. And you helped sentence him to death? There was nothing else to do. Irene goes to sideboard, gets carafe and two glasses back to table. Don't you understand? He killed a hen. Irene starts. Killed it in cold blood. A man who can do that deserves no pity. Irene coming over from sideboard, filling glasses. But his family. Oh, you women are so sentimental. Irene takes carafe up to sideboard. Leaves it. Gets platter. Starts with it toward safe. Have you forgotten that the hen is the fowl who lays eggs? Irene reels, half fainting. Eggs! Oh! Irene? Springs to feet. Goes hurriedly to her, around chair right of table. What's the matter? Irene recovering, avoiding help. Nothing. Nothing, dear. I'm better now. But wait a minute. I have a treat for you tonight. Continues to safe. Basil returns to table and seats himself in chair right, expectantly. Irene opens safe, takes out cracker, lays it on platter, bears it over to table triumphantly. Basil rather reproachfully. By Jove, dear. But we are living high. Irene returns to food safe is busy there. A cracker. Irene facing him triumphantly. And milk. Turns to safe again, gets out very small bottle, crossing to table with it. Basil almost horrified. Milk, cracker and milk on the same day. Irene with the medicine dropper dropping a drop into each glass half filled with water. Isn't that rather... Irene pausing to explain. But you're making a hundred thousand a year. Still, there's no use squandering it, is there? Happier tone. Irene is now seated opposite him at table, chair left. However, uh, I suppose we can treat ourselves once in a while. Basil carves the cracker, serves her with half, then himself. They eat it with forks. She only tastes hers. And it is delicious. Smacking his lips reminiscently. Remember when we first married? We couldn't have these luxuries. Thoughtfully sad. But you know, whenever I sit down to a meal like this, I think of the poor, who can't buy proper food. Irene also thoughtfully sad. Yes. That's why we could show no mercy to that man today. You see, what made it so terrible was that the hen was about to become a... Irene getting faint again. Don't! Don't, Basil! Head sinks on table. Basil leaning over and grasping hand. Why, my dear child, what is the matter? She doesn't answer. 
You must see the doctor. Irene rises, crosses to behind table. I've noticed you haven't been yourself for some time. You haven't been eating well. Why, look there. You've hardly touched your dinner. Irene looks slowly at plate, turns head away, gathers up both plates, empties crumbs of cracker from both to platter. I'm not hungry. Crosses toward safe, pauses, turning to Basil. You won't mind having these for breakfast, will you, dear? No. Irene turns to safe, puts platter in. But the doctor? Irene crossing back to table. Basil? I... I've seen the doctor. Takes plates from either side, puts them together. I went today. Takes forks and carvers, puts them on top of plates, crosses to sideboard. What did he say? Irene crosses to table for glasses, pauses at table, about to speak, changes her mind. Come, come, dear. Why don't you tell me? Irene crosses to sideboard with glasses. I... I... Oh, what's the use, Basil? It... Crossing back to table. It's something serious, then? Irene sinking in chair left of table, facing him. Yes. <gasps> we... We might as well face it, Basil. The doctor says, I've got to eat another egg. Oh, my God. I can't help it, Basil. You... you know it isn't my fault. <laughs> Basil rises, leans over table in wild pleading. Uh, but... Won't a trip to Europe do? A, a, a change of scene. Crossing past her left. Anything in reason, but... Irene sinks back in chair. Basil crosses to her. Why, it's... Only two years ago, you had an egg, a whole one. I had to mortgage this house to get it for you. Surely you can't need another so soon. I know. It's terrible. But I... Facing front, cold, determined. I must have it, Basil. Basil crossing to left in despairing anger. Oh, how did you ever get this accursed taste? <sighs> Thank heaven the children all starved to death. They might have inherited... Irene, springing to feet in protest. Basil! He stops. That's a cruel thing to say. Crossing toward him at left. I never told you how I came to be this way. Basil facing her in stern question. No, you never told me. You married me without letting me know you had this, this craving for eggs. Oh, how could you? Crossing in sad wonder to chair at left of table, seats himself back to her. Basil. Coming toward him. When I was a little girl, my parents were very, very wealthy. And once they gave me... An egg to taste. My brother had brought it from Europe. You don't know the effect the taste of an egg has on one. The strange feeling of happiness that once felt can never be forgotten. I... I couldn't forget it. The taste of that egg has been the memory of my waking hours, my dream at night. Sometimes the desire for it drives me to the point of madness. Oh, don't look at me like that. I know I shouldn't have married you without telling you of it, but... Going down to him, pleading. I loved you, Basil. Basil rises, facing her. If you had loved me, you would have told me. Turn slowly. Measured steps, crossing from her to chair right of table, where he stands with back to her, saddened. Irene pleading wildly. I tried. I tried, Basil, honestly. Honestly, I tried. 
but I couldn't. And meanwhile, the desire grew. Basil turns to her over table. But I gave you one. I gave all I had for it. Irene tenderly, in sympathy and appreciation. Yes, dear, I know. But it only fed the flame of my longing. And now I've got to have another. I've got to. Don't you understand? Or I shall go mad. I can't go on like this. I've got the right to live my life. To have the food my nature craves. I must. I will have it. She sinks to table, pounds it with her fists, head buried, sobs. <laughs> Basil going to her and putting his arms around her. There, there, dear. Don't excite yourself. Come, go to bed. You'll feel better in the morning. Irene, sitting away from his embrace, facing him. Then you won't? Get it? For me? Great heavens! I can't! Irene turning from him, looking fixedly front, cold, hard, determined. Very well. But I warn you, Basil, I will not answer for the consequences. Do you think you can threaten me? You could conquer this if you would. You have no right to expect me to gratify such... Foolish, extravagant tastes. Irene cold, fixed as before. Very well. I've nothing more to say. Basil, back of her chair, turns to go. Pauses, back of table. Don't take it like this, Irene. Heaven knows I'd do it if I could. But it's out of the question. Good night. Continues toward door, right. You're going to bed? Basil standing at door, partly turned to her. Yes, I... I have a touch of indigestion. Good night. He exits, right. Irene looks after him, desperate, sits a moment in thought, then faces front, her mouth working as if eating, looks back again to door of his exit, then toward phone, then to door. Rises, goes to phone on table left, takes off receiver. Harold knocks at door. Irene, telephone receiver off hook in hand. Come in. Harold enter, stands inside doorway. Irene is startled, rises, leaves receiver off hook. Harold is a good-looking man in uniform. He has a leather case strapped to his left side, a revolver in holster at his right. Harold, you! She crosses backward to table right center. Harold, about to run to her, remembers duty of both, draws back. Irene! Why do you come to me again after all these years? Harold drawing himself erect, importantly. You see my uniform? I am an officer of the Food Trust. Irene, thought of egg. A possible way to get one enters her mind. An officer. The food trust. Harold, cold repressed emotion, sense of duty. Yes. You ordered a slice of bread. She nods. I was sent to deliver it. He hands her a small package. She takes it, puts it in food safe. He crosses across the table right center, stands left, facing front. She comes to him as if to reopen old acquaintance. He has taken receipt from Cap, turns to her coldly. Please sign the receipt. She takes it, signs, hands it back. Their hands touch. Both are much moved. He controls himself, crosses toward left, putting receipt in Cap. Irene, leaning to him pleadingly. Wait, Harold. Don't leave me like this. You never understood. Harold pauses, turns to her stern, brokenly. I only know you broke my heart and ruined my life when you married him, not for love, but for food. Irene turning from him, looking front, brokenly. Yes, and I've been punished. 
The food I crave, he can't give me. Crosses to him, leans toward left side of him. Harold drawing away. Be careful. Irene looking toward husband's exit door as if Harold meant him. What is it? You mustn't touch that case. Why? What does it contain? Hush. Looks carefully toward doors, turns and lays cap on telephone table, crossing to her. An egg. Irene, wondering, incredulous, whisper. An egg! An egg! Harold rushes to her, catches her in arms, stops her mouth with hands. Shh! I... I shouldn't have told you. I'm on my way to a billionaire's house to deliver it. Releases her while he speaks, crosses toward left. Irene, siren-like, pleading. Harold! Harold! Harold, remembering his and her duty, proof against her wiles, bitterly. No, it's too late. Irene, sweetly insinuatingly. Is it too late, Harold? Are you so sure of that? Is there no spark left of the old love? Harold, tottering mentally, pauses, looks at her brokenly. God help me. Yes. Head bowed in shame. Irene, temptingly. You said once that you would do anything in the world if I would be yours. Yes, I said that. Once. Irene, crossing slowly backward to table right center as if luring him to her. Then I give you the chance to prove it. Now. Harold about to rush to her. You mean that you will? Yes, I'll be yours. On one condition. Harold rushing to claim her. Name it. Name it, and I'll... Irene at right of table warding him off, pointing and leaning toward him. Wait. Give me... that egg. Harold recoiling, pleading. What? Oh, no. You don't mean that. You're just testing me. No. Anything but that. Anything else in the world. Irene unrelentingly, determined, leaning over table to him. Harold, give me that egg. Harold, drawing back, in last weakening appeal. My duty. I haven't the right. Irene, passionate pleading. The right. Ah, oh, what is right and wrong to us? We love each other. We've the right to live our lives. For each other. You don't realize what you're asking. They know I left the storehouse. If I don't return soon, they'll search and discover the truth. Then I'll be a fugitive from justice, a hunted man, dishonored and disgraced. Irene alluringly. Am I not worth it? Puts herself alluringly in front of him. They gaze at each other. Then he clasps her passionately in his arms, kisses her. She slowly releases herself, her arm falling over him till it touches the egg case. She is almost on her knees. Now, let me see the egg. After a mental struggle, he undoes the case, first drawing his revolver and looking about carefully. She falls to knees, adoringly sways, about to swoon. He catches her, lifts her to her feet. She frees herself from his arms. Now. We must go, quickly. But wait, you can't carry it in that case. It would be recognized. Ha! Huh, my jewel box. Crosses quickly over to the sideboard. Takes jewel box to table. Faces Harold expectantly. He hesitates with egg case in his hands, remembering duty. She compels him with luring smile. He brings case and lays it on table. Steps back. She takes egg out carefully, gazes at it, about to put it in case, sees jewels fill it, flings them out, puts egg in, closes lid. Basil enters quickly, right. Irene and Harold start and exclaim. She moves away from table, eyes on box, leaves box on table. Why, Basil, I thought you'd retired. Basil, without speaking, moves to table, seizes jewel box, opens, Seizes egg and holds it up. Irene shrieks. 
Harold draws pistol. Shoot, and watch it fall. Harold's pistol drops to floor. Irene timidly, wonderingly. Basil, how did you know? The phone. You left the receiver off. I heard everything. Irene sinks into a chair left of table with moan. Basil crosses beside Harold, stands back of small rug. So she has brought you to this. Very well. You can go. But you will leave the egg behind. Harold starts, cries out. Irene springing to her feet in protest. Basil draws egg protectingly to him. No, no, Basil, you won't do that. You can't be so cruel. Basil lowering arm from above head, gazing at egg in hollow of hand. And this is the price of honor. <laughs> With an hysterical laugh, his face changes to a fixed purpose. Irene, horrified wonder. What? What are you going to do? Basil! Basil! <gasps> Shrieks as Basil dashes the egg to the floor on the little rug at his feet. She sinks to her knees over it. Harold staggers back, powerless from horror. Murderer! Crossing to Basil. Through all your life you'll see that horrible sight. That little egg lying there crushed and mangled, wasted by your hand. Thank God I haven't got that to face. Basil turns up stage, overcome with what he has done. Harold turns as if to go. Harold, where are you going? Harold turning at the door. To give myself up. But it means death. Yes. Goodbye. Exits as if to guillotine. Pause. Door slams. Irene reaching out to touch Basil. Basil. Basil recoiling from her with loathing. There can be nothing more between you and me. You mean... You have betrayed me for an egg. Crossing right to table. Basil. Basil points go. Irene turns, sees egg on rug, glances back to Basil, stealthily rolls the rug up and starts to escape with it. Irene, have you no shame? You would take it now? Yes, it's all I've got left now. He turns from her. They gave it to me when I was young, Basil. When I was young. Basil points to the door and she exits weeping. The door outside slams and he sinks on his knees by the table, shaken by silent sorrow. Curtain End of Food by William C. DeMille A Day Well Spent by John Oxenford This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Day Well Spent, A Farce in One Act, by John Oxenford. Dramatis Personae Mr. Cotton, an eminent hosier and old gentleman. Read by Todd. Bolt, his foreman, quite a gentleman. Read by Thomas Peter. Mizzle. His Apprentice, Wishing to be a Gentleman Read by Devora Allen Mr. Cutaway, An Adventurous Gentleman Read by Zames Curran Sam Newgate, No Gentleman Read by Alan Mapstone Peter Prigg, An Ex-Foreman, Likewise No Gentleman Read by Campbell Shelp Coachman, Read by Nathan Victoriano Waiter. Read by Chuck Williamson. Miss Harriet Cotton, an adventurous lady. Read by phone. Mrs. Stitchley, an old lady. Read by Sonia. Miss Brown, her bosom friend, a middle-aged lady. Read by T.J. Burns. 
Mrs. Chorgley, a beneficent lady, read by Maria de Fatima da Silva. Bridget, a lady's lady, read by Pauline Latournerie. Boy, read by Jasmine Selma. Narrated by Abai. A day well spent. Scene one. A room in Cotton's house. An open door in center flat. Enter Cotton with a letter. Provoking. To leave my shop all day for the sake of calling on this old Wealthington. That I should be required to call on him. Not but he is a rich relation, and I have great expectations from him. And my foreman, Bolt, and apprentice Mizzle, are quite fit persons with whom to entrust my shop. Egad, to make all the naughty apprentices look on those two young men would be as good a lesson as going to see George Barnwell on a boxing night. Enter Cutaway, centre down stage. Hello. No one in the shop? Ha. Huh. Aside. Hmm. She's not here. Have you anything to sell, old gentleman? Of course I have. What do you think I keep a shop for? Ah, <sighs> right, to be sure. What the devil else should you keep a shop for? Cotton, aside. Poppy. But, old gentleman, a young lady used to serve in that shop. She is not ill, I hope. No, sir. On the contrary, my daughter is quite well. Can I do anything for you in the way of business? Cutaway, aside. Oh, this must be the old father she talks about. Ha! Huh. You are the commander-in-chief of this concern, hey? Probably I am, Mr. Cutaway. Cutaway, you know me, then. What a thing it is to be famous. Know me, and yet you were never introduced to me, to my knowledge. Oh, dear, no. I used to see you through the glass door of my parlor, and I intercepted certain letters to my daughter. I saw your name, and I inquired into your connection, and saw no reason why I should not cut the connection. Very cutting indeed. He's a sharp blade, ha ha. Droll, funny, ha ha. Happy to find I can please you, sir. I thus return good for evil since you by no means please me. Is there any way to please you? Oh, certainly. The way to please me lies through yonder door. You can't think how prettily that door is painted on the outside. As for my daughter, sir, I keep her present abode a secret. Enter boy, lift. Please, sir. Your sister sent me to say that she, with your daughter, has been obliged to move to number 19, Moonlight Street, owing to circumstances of the most peculiar nature. Ah, a profound secret. Goodbye, Commander-in-Chief. Next time you have a secret. Mind you, don't tell it by proxy. Exit Center Downstage. Stupid jackanapes. You must open your damn mouth so wide as to let the cat jump out. Exit boy, lift. A connection of which I do not in the least approve. But, oh, those fellows are at breakfast. Bolt! Mizzle! Enter Bolt and Mizzle, right. Yes, sir? Listen, pressing business obliges me to be absent till late tonight. I leave the shop to your care. Thank you, sir. For your confidence, sir. Which I know is not misplaced. Bolt and Bizzle bow. On no account leave the premises. Now, my dear sir, was not that request superfluous? Of course, sir. Without leave we should never leave the shop. You will excuse my mentioning it, however. All foremen and apprentices are, alas, not like you. There are several very wicked foremen and apprentices in the world. Ah. I have heard so. I have read so, but never met any. No, Bolt and I are very particular with whom we associate. Evil communications, you know, sir. Right. Very correct indeed. Robert Mizzle, if you always associate with such as Charles Bolt, you will doubtless at length 
reach an elevated post. Mizzle, aside. Elevated post? I wonder if he means the gallows. You flatter me, sir. You flatter me. I discharge my duty, sir, nothing else. To be sure, taking care of the morals of this young man. Is a heavy charge. I am aware of it. But I must go. Farewell, Bolt. Goodbye, Mizzle. Excellent, steady creatures. Oh, we're all like them. The tragedy of George Barnwell would never have been written. Exit. Lift. <laughs> Why don't you laugh, Mizzle? Because I don't see any joke. Then look at me. I'm a perpetual joke. I'm all point like a porcupine, all fire like a poet's heart, and light as his breeches pocket. Old Cotton has gone out all day. <laughs> don't you take? Don't you twig? Aren't you a fly? Aren't you awake? Yes, I'm awake, but I don't see. We are to mind the shop, are we? I say never mind it. Let's go out. Nonsense. You know Master and we are like a man and woman in the weather house. When one goes out, the other stays at home. And so, when the old man's back is turned, we are to show our heads are turned by stopping in the shop all day, selling checked neck handkerchiefs and baby's red stockings. Not we. We'll go out and have some fun, Bobby. No, no, it won't do. We must take care of the shop. Now look here. How does Master take care of his money? By locking it up. Then that's the way we'll take care of the shop. I'll lock the door, and you shall shut the shutters. Oh, come, come. I shan't go. No, you shan't either. It won't do, Charlie. Better be boxed here than get in the wrong box. Well, I've made up my mind. The next job is to make up my body. I must dress. Well, you may enjoy your own holiday. Pleasant day and fine weather to you and a prosperous return. I shan't go. You have no grandeur of soul. You don't love fun. Come, don't say that. Damn it, I live upon fun. <laughs> you know I do. Give us your hand, Charlie. I'll go. Oh, dear, a day's pleasure. You'll go, will you? Give us your hand. Bolt takes his hand. Here's all for fun, then. Exeunt. Right. Scene two. Street. A porch projecting from flat. On the door is a plate inscribed, Mrs. Stitchley, dressmaker. Enter Cutaway, followed by Harriet. This way, this way, charming Harriet. Your aunt has not missed you yet. But she soon will. She is now so taken up with her ribbons and beautiful purchases that she is thinking but little of her beautiful niece. But this step... Stands before your prison door. Your only step is flight. A flight of steps, each one more imprudent than the last. And what awaits me on my descent? Love. Who will be your guide? A pretty guide. He is blind himself. True. But there is no resisting him. Love is a torrent, and his blindness a cataract. Come, come. The bands have been put up for the last month at Croydon Church. The ring is in my waistcoat pocket. I have appointed a father to give you away. Father? I haven't seen him. Probably not. For though a father, he is not yet a parent. All is right. Away. Fly. When they say love is blind, they only mean he closes his eyes to transgressions like ours. Exeunt. Right. Enter Bolt and Mizzle, smartly dressed. Left. Well, here we are. Out. Yes, out in our reckoning, maybe. And don't I look well? And I the thing. Nothing like the shop, eh? Nothing against me. Nothing counter. No, we have sunk the shop with a vengeance. Hatchment, the undertaker, will be calling to know if Master's dead. Well, but where shall we go? I'm afraid we've gone too far already. Zounds, man, don't keep watering my spirits in that way. And don't pull down the corners of your mouth and make it look like a horseshoe on its legs. Laugh at our setting out, at least. Ha ha ha! I will, for I'm thinking there will be devilish little chance of laughing when we return. Eh? Hey, what's that? Looking off. Right. What are you staring at now? Don't you see something like an old man? Lord bless you, Bobby. It's the young women I always look at, not the old men. That old man may look at you, notwithstanding. Oh, he draws nearer. Oh, the devil! It's the old gentleman. Master, I mean. Hey, that's the hat. 
His cast is an unlucky star. Those are his unmentionables. We'll turn down the next street. But this damp street has no turning for the next quarter of a mile. Confound it! You must be so fond of enjoying yourself. We'll run. And attract his attention. A tallish man and a short one. Bolt, knocking at door. Then we'll call on Mrs. Stitchley. Yes, that's the name on the plate. We don't know her. Who the deuce knows Mrs. Stitchley? No matter. He mustn't pass us. Egad, he's just there. Knocks again. Door opens. They run in. Just as door is closing, Cotton runs across from right to left. Scene 3. Room at Mrs. Stitchley's. Enter servant, left, followed by Bolt and Mizzle. This way, gentlemen. My mistress will see you in a minute. Exit. Right. Well, here is a new feature. Yes, like a broken nose. A very irregular feature. What are we to say? Our wits will inspire us. Wits? I've no wits, nor you either, or you wouldn't have advised this blessed expedition. Enter Mrs. Stitchley and servant, right. Servant exits, left. Good morning, gentlemen. Good, Good morning. morning. May I ask the cause of this visit? Mizzle, aside. Ah, uh, that's the devil of it. Cause, ah, uh, madam, the cause is the reason, ma'am. <clears throat> and the reason is the cause. Aside. She must have a customer named Smith. You doubtless know Miss Smith. No, sir. I have not that honour. Mizzle, aside. Of course not. Everything goes wrong today. Bolt, aside. Smith won't do. I'll try Brown. Miss Brown, madam, you know. Oh, dear, yes. Miss Brown is one of my best customers. Ha, ha, ha. Bobby, the lady and I understand each other now, don't we? Nudges him. Mrs. Stitchley, aside. What odd persons. Yes, sir, but Miss Brown? True, true. About Miss Brown... There is a little account. Oh, between me and Miss Brown. Aside. He is a gentlemanly young fellow, after all. I, madam, will settle that account. Mizzle, aside. He'll settle himself if he does. He must be flushed today. I'll send my servant for a stamp directly, sir. Don't hurry yourself, ma'am. I'll settle it tomorrow. That's what I called for. Uh, to tell you I'd settle it tomorrow. Oh, aside, there's a great vulgarity about him. I've nothing more to say. Good morning, ma'am. Nothing. Aside. Besides, the old man must be a mile off by this time. Goodbye, ma'am. Aside. I say, Bolt, I vote we go back to the shop. This may be a prelude to something further. But one thing more. Miss Brown is an intimate friend of mine, as well as a customer. No, I don't think I ever saw you before. Very likely not, ma'am. It is exceedingly probable. The fact is, <clears throat> the facts are these. There is no such person as Miss Brown. Miss Brown has ceased to be Miss Brown. And I'm a happy man. What? Do you mean that Miss Brown is married and that you are... Precisely. I see she has not disclosed the tender secret. Mizzle, aside. Ha, <laughs> ha, it is funny after all. Miss Brown, you see, is now Mrs. Steele. Yes, my name is Steele, and this gentleman's name is Addison. Yes, ma'am, my name is Madison. Ha, ha, ha. Enter servant, left. Miss Brown, ma'am. Exit, left. The devil. Oh, <laughs> the tender creature. Confusion. Petrifaction. Mizzle, whispering. I say, Charlie. How do you like that? Bother your long-winded stories. Ugh. Enter Miss Brown. Left. Bolt. Aside. Not remarkably handsome, either. How do you do, Miss Brown? I beg pardon. Mrs. Steele, I mean. Mrs. Steele? What do you mean? Mizzle. Aside. Ah, she won't swallow it. She's not soft steel. Well, anything to get off. Goodbye, ladies. Goodbye. What an ungallant husband. Husband? 
yes yes mrs steele that gentleman mr steele has confessed all you sly creature yes yes good-bye you may settle this discussion among yourselves yes yes this gentleman told me he was your husband true madam stick to that he told you so mind i had nothing to do with it miss brown aside it may be an eccentric method of making an offer he is not bad-looking and opportunities are alas not too frequent i'll humour it and so my dear steele's confessed <laughs> yes aside dear steele she jumps at it a magnetic steele whisper i say what's the meaning of this don't ask me you're the man of talent i know the meaning of nothing oh you naughty man when you so faithfully promise to keep it a secret well as i said before we must go farewell my love farewell mrs steele aside be divorced as soon as possible charlie but my dearest where are you going mizzle aside to the devil and taking me for company oh for a holiday just to get rid <laughs> of a few loose sovereigns are you indeed then i'll accompany you now don't look sulky steele you know i will positively i will well my dear if you will i uh, hey ho suppose you must mizzle aside to bolt i say bolt that lady belongs to you you know if we've any refreshment you pay the heads we don't go halves miss brown and mrs stitchley have been conversing apart oh i should be charmed delighted here's my bosom friend mrs stitchley says she would like to be of the party this little gentleman would be a nice bow for her bolt whispers i say bob we shall go halves lend me your arm sir we married folks lead the way two hearts lead yes my little gentleman we can't do better than follow suit oh, we're a couple of trumps i wish i could cut out of this game exeunt two and two scene four a room at an inn a window open with balcony a little to the right in flat a large screen folded up and leaning against a flat the only entrance is by a door in set wing left tables and chairs waiter discovered busied about enter harriet and cutaway left most unlucky hymen has extinguished his link for the day and here we are yet unlinked too late for the parson shocking indeed to say nothing of the impropriety of my thus running about with you true we are like odd gloves a couple unpaired no matter tomorrow will unite us forever this house has a hopeful name the anchor the anchor the very house my aunt was to have brought me to to send to mrs chardsley's my place is booked here for that purpose no matter someone else can represent you a coach is unlike my heart it can just admit another waiter show us into a private room sir. yes sir this way james conduct the lady to the blue parlor blue another omen emblem of constancy single another day what a misfortune exeunt right hello james james bustle about four more on the stairs show them all in here all the other rooms are full what a house we have today enter bolt mizzle miss brown and mrs stitchley left sit down ladies sit down what a charming place yes but any place would be charming in such company the ladies sit at table right miss brown aside if he is only playing tricks i'll be even with him my dear steele you have forgotten your gallantry don't you ask us to take any refreshments there they begin already 
I thought they looked like appetites. Here, waiter. Yes, sir. Four bread and cheeses and a pint of stout. Aside. Egad, they shan't ruin us. The very thing. I dote upon stout, and so does Mrs. Stew. La, my dear. I like nothing so plebeian. It's taking away one's character to say so. And I faint at the smell of cheese. Waiter? Yes, sir. A decanter of water for the ladies, and butter instead of cheese. Exactly. Only a pint of stout. Stay. Have you nothing but bread and butter and cheese in the house? Have you got any onions? Have you no poultry? Bolt. Aside. Poultry? What pretty chickens. A couple of fowls are roasting for master's dinner. However, he will be most happy to let you have them. We'll send them up instantly, with a bottle of your best cherry. Exit waiter. You know, Steele, your loose sovereigns will cover all expenses. Bolt whispers. Here, Bobby, how much have you got? Half a crown. And you? Eighteen pence. Oh, that looks very unlike fowls and sherry. But you must be so damned bounceable with your loose sovereigns. My dear, won't you sit down? You must be tired. Not in the least. Aside. Except of you. Whispers. I'll tell you what we must do, Bobby. We'll tell the ladies all. They can't detain us in a public room, and then we'll... De Camp, the best plan. Only you be orator. The ladies look rather fierce. Uh, um, you see, ladies, that is, you perceive, um, you must be aware, you cannot be ignorant. <clears throat> My dear Steele, what is the matter? Bolt, aside. There she goes again with her dear Steele. The fact is... Enter waiter, lift. I am sorry to intrude, ladies and gentlemen, but have you any objection to a gentleman dining in this room? Not in the least. You may give him our dinner if your larder is scanty. My dear. Yes, and the bottle of wine into the bargain. Bolt and Mizzle go up. Hoity-toity, certainly not. And, waiter, I hate dining in public. I insist on that screen being put up. To be sure. Putting up screen so as to divide room in two, then arranging a small table and chair on the side next to the door. Your fowls are done brown, ladies. Mizzle aside. Done brown? Yes, and so are we done brown. By Miss Brown, too. Enter second waiter and Cotton, left. Here, sir, there's a party the other side of the screen. Our inn is so full, sir. No matter. This will do. Sits at small table. Bring up some cold meat directly. And the paper. Exeunt both waiters. Left. Stay, I've a thought. There may be an Irish cousin or naval officer there. I'll peep through. Looks through crevice of screen. Oh. Ladies, what I have to say is... Mizzle whispers. Hold your tongue. You don't know who is on the other side. No. Nor no, don't care if it is a devil. But it is worse. It's... Oh, old master between us and the door. Sounds. We are blockaded. Boat. Boat, thy carriage is out. What is the matter, gentlemen? You seem uneasy. Waiter brings in, left, fowls and a newspaper. He leaves newspaper with cotton, and then passes on to the other table, where he places fowls and exit left. Well, I shall take off my cloak and bonnet. Does so, and hangs them on a chair. Egad, as there is no exit, I must e'en make the best of it. Sits down between ladies. This wing, a slice of the breast, etc. Mizzle, aside. If I could but pass that old curmudgeon. Egad, I have it. They are all looking at the fowls, far more interesting objects than myself. Makes signs to Bolt, slips Miss Brown's cloak and bonnet off chair, retires to back and puts them on. Cotton, reading. Curious case of stealing clothes. Hmm. Hmm. Sentence, 
transportation. Missile passes back of screen. Mr. Edison is invisible. Oh, never mind him. Missile passes in front of Cotton and exit left. What an extraordinary woman! Mysterious disappearance. Horn sounds. That sounds deuce near the window. Help yourselves to the wings, ladies. Cut off the wings and they can't fly. <laughs> Retires back. The coachman appears at window, right. Anyone going? Bolt is in the act of stepping from balcony. Ladies, seeing him. Stop him! Bolt disappears with coachman. The ladies throw the screen over Cotton, who gets up and beats the waiters. The ladies scream. Scene closes. Scene 5. Chamber. Enter Cutaway. Right. Truly unfortunate and disagreeable. My fair one torn from me in a manner most unfair. Miss Harriet missing. All is gone but hope. And what does hope say? Something false, as usual? The lady loves the marvelous. No, hope reminds me that Harriet is sent to Mrs. Chargley's in this neighborhood, and that if I could enter in a feigned name, True, I can learn at the door if the old lion be in the den, if the young dove be in her cage. Gad, it will do. What name can I take? I have it. Mr. Cotton has a foreman named Bolt. I'll call myself Bolt. I dare say I'm like him. I never saw him, so I don't know the contrary. A happy exchange of names. The part of Bolt by Mr. Cutaway. Exit. Left. Scene 6. Room at Mrs. Chargley's. Large Gothic window opening upon lawn. Mrs. Chargley discovered sitting and Bridget busied about. Bridget? Yes, ma'am? Miss Harriet Cotton, according to the letter I read to you, must soon be here. Hi-ho, a persecuted being, like I was at seventeen. La, ma'am. Yes, her love is disapproved of, and she is sent here to be far from the object of her affections. Hi-ho, just my case. Why, ma'am, I thought the object of your affections ran away from you. Ahem, it might be so, but however, Bridget, it came to just the same thing in the end. My fate teaches me mercy. I am determined to show every kindness to this Harriet, though my letter tells me that Mr. Cutaway is dauntless in pursuing her. Just my case. On the contrary, ma'am, your admirer seems to have been dauntless in pursuing the opposite direction. Well, I will just go and adjust my headdress. You will show the young lady every attention if she should arrive meanwhile. Hi-ho! I dare say... Her delicate heart is in a fine state of palpitation. Just my case. Exit right. I wish you would come. I should so like to see a young lady involved in a new adventure instead of hearing an old lady recount a stale one. A violent ring heard at bell. Bless me. That is exceedingly like a coachman's ring. Enter through gothic window, Mizzle, in cloak and bonnet. Bolt and coachman yes yes we shall sail up right now for warrant mizzle whispers to bolt here's a new row i didn't want to come here bolt whispers zounds there's no avoiding it coachy swears he won't stir without the blunt you it seems are booked here for some confounded person we can't pay he says walk in and they'll pay for you so here we are five shillings a lady and three and sixpence the gentleman they're rather short. Will you pay, my good girl? Oh, certainly. Eight and sixpence. Here, coachman. Gives him money and exit coachman. Center. A gentleman, too. It is a new fashion for ladies to bring their gentlemen with them. Exit. Left. Well, what do you think of this? Nothing at all. It's of a piece with the rest. They'll take us to the station house soon. We're in limbo here. Admire the garden wall from the window. My eye, what a barricado. Oh, we can't get out, 
so we must consider our present situation. You evidently were booked. I was only a chance customer. They set you down here as a matter of course. I might have gone on. Devilish odd, by the way, you crawling into the very coach upon which I jumped. Enter Mrs. Chargely. Right. Oh, my dear, excuse me for keeping you waiting, but I know young ladies love moonlight. Yes, ma'am. Like second pair lodgers just before quarter day. Mrs. Chargely, aside. Elegant remark. But this gentleman. Ah, true. Crosses to centre. I dare say you did not expect me. How do you do? The fact is, I am this young gent... <clears throat> lady's brother. Yes. Oh, did you live all quite well at home? Quite. My mother is particularly well. Why, my dear, your father has been a widower these... Bless you. He has married again since. One calls one's mother-in-law mother, you know. They both send their compliments, Mrs... <clears throat> uh... Indeed. My dear young lady, your name, I believe, is... Precisely. Harriet? You have hit it to a nicety. Don't you think, ma'am, we might take a turn about the country? Yes. There is a most picturesque ruin of a pump. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Enter Bridget. Left. Oh, Bridget, you must provide accommodations for the young lady's brother. Bridget whispers. Madam, you have forgotten her something. The letter called Miss Harriet an only child. Mrs. Chargely, aside. Indeed, an impostor. Oh, I see through all. The dairy Mr. Cutaway has introduced himself. So, sir, you are the young lady's brother. Exactly. Did we not tell you so? Aside. What makes her so damn particular? Now, sir, you know you are nothing of the kind. Crosses to centre. Miss Harriet has no brother. Hey, ma'am? No brother? Aside. Here's a go. You'll allow me to know my own relations. Oh. Indeed. No, I have discovered all. The devil you have. Then we are bowled out. Madam, we throw ourselves upon your mercy. Yes, don't say anything to Old Cotton. Mrs. Chargely, aside. Old Cotton? What a respectful name to call her father. I will not. I am inclined to be friendly. I have some influence over him. I'll prevail on him to pardon all. Will you, though? Then give us your hand. Takes her hand. Mizzle takes other hand. Yes, you are a regular good un. Mrs. Chargely, aside. A good one. Her language is not particularly romantic. Nay, more than that, I think I can persuade him to consent to your union. The lady means a partnership. A partnership? To be sure, for life. Marriage. I'll be blowed if we understand one another now. Yes, we do. Fie, Miss Cotton. Do you think I do not recognise your clandestine lover, Mr. Cutaway? Mizzle, aside. Cotton? I, old master's daughter. Bolt, aside. Sounds. She knows nothing after all. Yes, ma'am. You've hit it. My name is Cutaway. Ah, ha! You confess. You see, I was too sharp for you. I found out you were Mr. Cutaway. To be sure you did. You are so sharp, ma'am. <laughs> you found out Mr. Cutaway. <laughs> Enter Bridget. Left. Please, ma'am, Mr. Cotton's foreman, Mr. Bolt, is here. He is not. No, no, my name is Cut... Uh, Cutaway. Mr. Bolt is not here. No, nor Mizzle either. This gentleman's name is Cutaway. My name is Miss Harriet. But Mr. Bolt is at the street door. Bolt, aside. Who the devil can this be? Mizzle, whispers. I say, Bolt, there ain't two of you. Desire Mr. Bolt to walk in. Don't be frightened, my young friends, though I guess the cause of your alarm. Mizzle, aside. I'm blessed if you do. Enter Cutaway, left. Cutaway, aside. All right so far. The young lady here. 
and the old boy not here. Come forward, Mr. Bolt. Come forward. Nobody here except Mr. Cutaway. Mr. Cutaway here, madam. You start. I guess the cause of surprise. Yes, and Miss Harriet. Mizzle hides his face by letting Bale fall. Cutaway aside. Hmm. She has got a new cloak, by the way. But I have not introduced you. Crosses left center. Mr. Bolt, Mr. Cutaway, Mr. Cutaway, Mr. Bolt. They both bow. Cutaway aside. How queer it is to be introduced to oneself. I'm beside myself. Mizzle whispers. I say, Bolt, how do you like yourself? Not at all. Curse me if there isn't another incident. A second me will walk in next. How embarrassed they seem, and I see through all. Miss Harriet seems afraid of Mr. Bolt seeing her. How well I understand her feelings. Enter Bridget, left. Mr. Cotton, ma'am. Who? Who? Mr. Cotton. Bolt and Cutaway instantly run off through Gothic window. Mizzle, right. Gentlemen, young lady, what a dispersion. Why, at any rate, Mr. Bolt should vanish. Enter Cotton, Harriet, Miss Brown and Mrs. Stitchley. Left. Exit Bridget. Left. Ah, Mrs. Chargely, how do you do? I have brought some ladies with me. Happy to see any of your friends, Mr. Cotton. But one little thing I must say to you. Draws him apart. Don't be too severe with your daughter. No, no, madam. I don't intend it. I have promised to be her friend. Promised, madam? May I ask, to whom? To herself, to be sure. What? Have you seen her before? Harriet, my dear. Yes, papa. This is not your daughter, Harriet? Yes, but it is, though. Don't you see the strong likeness? Yes, madam. I am Harriet Cotton. I am petrified. Thunderstruck. Why, another daughter, Harriet, came here just now, and is here still. Bridget! Enter Bridget, right, with veil. Please, ma'am, Miss Harriet has bolted herself in one of the bedrooms and won't open the door. Her veil caught against the banister, ma'am. Here it is. Some impudent impostor, Mrs. Chargely. And I'll confess the truth. Aside. How are my benevolent designs frustrated? Mr. Cutaway was with her. Daring scoundrel. The faithless wretch brought a sham me. Oh, papa, papa. Sobs. I told you what he would turn out. Mrs. Bridget, I think I heard you called. Allow me to look at the veil. <gasps> Observe, Mrs. Stitchley. I do, my dear. The iron mold and everything. Mrs. Chargely, this veil is mine. There are thieves in the house. Had the lady a silk cloak? Yes. And a bonnet and feather? Yes. It is all discovered. You know we were wronged, Mr. Cotton. Cotton, aside. Yes, and I know I had to pay for it. But we will be righted. Mrs. Chargely, don't let your house be a nest of thieves. Send for the officers. I will. Bridget! Bridget! Lock sham Miss Harriet's door outside. Send for the police. What a hurried and romantic adventure. Exit right. You shall be righted. I will indeed. I'll recover my cloak. The villainy shall be uncloaked. Exeunt Miss Brown and Mrs. Stitchley left. Come along, Harriet. We'll see the end of this. To a nice house I seem to have brought you. A pleasant day we have had. A day beautifully spent. Exeunt left. Scene 7 Mrs. Chargely's garden. At the back of stage, a high wall. To the right, part of the house, with door and practicable window. Dark. Enter Bold, from back, right. Egad, I've succeeded in concealing myself among the statues and the shrubs, etc. I wish that wall was not so devilish high, and that gate not quite so firmly fastened. I wonder where Bobby is. Mizzle still in cloak and bonnet, looking out of window, right. Charlie, is that you? Yes. How snug you look up there. How do you like your day's pleasure? 
Amazingly. It is a spicy sort of pleasure. Keeps one awake. I told you we should have something to laugh at. Yes, the wrong side of our mouths. If ever I do go out with you again... Enter cutaway with ladder, left. Bolt steps back. Fortune favors the bolt. This is an unexpected prize. Found it in the knife room. And the dear creature at yonder window. She shall descend. Then will be over the wall. By the by, I wonder what has become of that inefficient representation of myself. Harriet? Hello, you there? There she is. Beautiful as ever. Bolt, aside. True. All cats are alike in the dark. Come to the arms of your ever-faithful cutaway. You make me blush. I have a ladder, dearest. Will you descend it? I believe you. I will. Come, look alive. Put it up. Her every word inspires confidence. Bolt, aside. An unconscious auxiliary. Cutaway puts leather against window, right. Descend, dearest, descend. And take care of the water butt. Do not, star as you are, set in the ocean. Mizzle descends. Now, let's away. Stay, my bundle. Oh, my bundle. What bundle, sweetest? A bundle I have left. So do you bundle up the ladder and get it. Your desires are commands, lovely one. She is hoarse. Quite cold, poor thing. Ascends ladder and goes in at window. I say, Bob, what did you send him in there for? Why, the cursed officers are breaking open the door. I heard them, so I gave him for a sop. <laughs> <laughs> Poor devil. Now away with the ladder to the garden wall. Mizzle plants leather against wall. Left. Now we'll ascend and drop on the other side. Cut away at window. Right. Harriet, Harriet, my love. I can find no bundle. Can't you? Then here is one for you. Takes off cloak and bonnet. Wraps bonnet in cloak and throws them in window. A man. Duped. Cheated. Up the ladder, Bobby, my boy. Yes, we are off. The devil take the hindmost. Goodbye, my own true love. Cut away, feeling about. The ladder. Where is the ladder? A crash is heard in the house, as of a door breaking. Officers appear at window. Exeunt over wall. The ladies scream. Scene closes. Scene 8. Outside of shop. Shop shut up with cotton, hosier, etc. written on it. The shop door to open. Stage dark. Enter Bolt and Mizzle. <laughs> yes, you may ha ha ha, but I don't see anything to ha ha at. No, nor to ho ho at neither. I have done with fun forever. Oh, don't say so. We are all right, you know. Have not I got through beautifully? Steered through all the windings and intricacies? Do you suppose a skilful coachman would give a fig for a drive on a smooth road? No, it is turning the sharp corners that displays ingenuity. Ah, uh, but don't let me be on the box with the said ingenious coachman. To be sure it was lucky we overtook young Rattle with his gig. If he had not given us a lift, we should not have been home till breakfast time. No, and Master would. A pretty figure we should have cut if we'd arrived in time to find him opening the shutters. Well, we'll go in. Feels in his pocket. Here is the key. Uh, no, cursed, there is not. Nor in this pocket. Nor in that. Bobby, did I give you the key? No. Feeling. No, I have not got it. The deuce. Then we have... No. You are not going to say the key is lost. Don't say so. It is, though, whether I say so or not. And now I remember. I heard something chink on the ground when I jumped off the wall. Ah, oh, what a devil of a chink that was. It's confoundedly awkward. It is. I like that. You were confoundedly awkward, you mean. Why did you not do as I do when I carry money? Put it in my breeches pocket and tie pack thread round. <laughs> Don't be downhearted, Bobby. Here is a third adventure. It will have an end. But give me time, my boy, and I'll get through anything. Then if you could get through that keyhole, it would be the best exercise for your ingenuity. Rain heard. 
Gad, it is coming on to rain like the very deuce. Here is a shelter. We'll get in here. Yes, and we shall soon have the pleasure of seeing old Cotton let himself in. Crikey, what a well-spent day. Retire. Left. Enter Sam Newgate, right, followed by Peter Prigg. They are dressed in large greatcoats. Newgate has a lantern in his hand. The heads of two pistols are just seen one from each pocket. Prigg has in his hand a black mask. Come along, man. Don't crawl. I don't like it a bit. Sure. You're not half a fella. You're a humbug, Peter. What two respectable individuals. Ah, you and I may look like them if we take many more holidays. The streets are clear. So you were old Cotton's foreman. Yes, sir. I was some time ago. Ah, Cotton's foremen are always pretty blossoms. And you left this same old Cotton. He made me leave, on account of a little exercise of my ingenuity. But you see, I was down upon him. What, by taking the impression of the street door key in wax? <laughs> but why the devil did you not go in before? Because I had not the pluck. When I met with you, I was inspired. I say, ain't you fly? Oh yes, I'm awake. Don't look so frightened, man. I have a bulldog in each pocket. Showing pistols. Sanguinary wretch. Don't let him see you, Charlie. He'll blow out the few brains we have in no time. Newgate, opening door with key. Here, the door is open. Follow quick. Good examples should always be followed. Exit through door. I'm blessed if I like it. Oh, I must put on the mask. Does so. Old Cotton knows my good-looking face as well as his own. If he caught a glimpse of me, I should be caught too. Bolt rushes on him and throws him down. So you are, my chicken. Think yourself lucky if you don't get your neck twisted. Bravo, Charlie. I'll stand and see fair play. Take care number one don't come and fire some Dartford superfine in your face. Oh, sir, I am very unwilling to be hanged. Then, most worthy character, take off that mask as I have unmasked you. Take off that great coat as I have dismantled your villainy, and your hat off, because, because I want it. And now take yourself off. Yes, yes, I'll reform. I feel a moral change already. Runs off, right. Bolt dressing in Prig's clothes. Why, Charlie, what the deuce are you doing now? Disguising myself as a thief. I have not the slightest doubt of your being able to support the character. But why? To walk in after that respectable gentleman. I shall not follow. Better be sent home than shot. There will be two of us. Yes, and he has two pistols. Can blow out our brains in succession. Highly advantageous. Bolt, feeling pockets. There are no weapons in these pockets. You had better follow. Newgate, within. Where the devil are you? No, I shan't. Newgate comes to door. Come along, thick-headed snail. Snail, do you call me? Ah, oh, you don't know where I am. Exit through door. Mizzle comes forward. Egad, there's one chance. When Master goes home, that fellow may shoot him through the head. He can't find me out. That would be lucky. But one linen draper should never desert another. I'll go into the kitchen. Get the poker and surprise the rascal in the rear. Exit downstage. Scene 9. Chamber. Large cupboard in center. Newgate and Bolt discovered at back, taking plate and putting it in bag. Newgate has a lighted lantern. Dark. Come, bustle about, man. You'll see twice as well if you take that mask off. Bolt, aside. My head would follow, I'm thinking. Now I can see. That's right. There go the spoons. There's the silver. There's the godpappy's mug. Yes, we are in for the plate. Ho, ho, you call that a joke. Bolt, aside. More than I do anything else. 
I am caught with this fellow, I shall be hanged. And if I move, I shall be shot. Don't mumble, but pack, pack. Enter Cutaway, Harriet, Cotton, Miss Brown, and Mrs. Stitchley. Left. My dear Mr. Cutaway, you should have explained to me you were the son of the great bobbin maker, and my ideas on the subject would have been very different. Come, ladies, if you can find your way in the dark, I have just discharged my servants and am forced to wait on myself. Goes to closet, right, for matchbox, etc. There's someone in the room. We are in the wrong box. Put up that cup. Oh, I think we have taken a cup too much. It's all up. We're floored. There they are. Damn it, take his bulldog. Defend yourself. Gives Bolt a pistol. So I will. Holds it at Newgate's head and throws off mask. Oh, thieves! House! Ho! Mizzle enters left with candle. Stage light. What the devil? Why, Bolt? How do you do, sir? And this gentleman? Came to lighten you of your odd movables, to fork out your knives and dish your plates. Give me your hand, Bolt. You're a fine fellow. Bolt, they call him. I wish that Bolt was shot. They put Newgate in cupboard, centre. I think I have seen your face before, sir. You have, but pray don't mention... Don't bear malice. That face, too. Oh, horror. This is my foreman, ladies, Mr. Bolt, whom, for his valuable services, I intend instantly to take into partnership. Miss Brown to Cotton. Sir, sir. <clears throat> there is one thing I have not confessed. I mean, sir, my passion for this lady. Wonderful. <gasps> How? Bolt runs to her and whispers. Say nothing, and you shall be my real wife. Sir, you will consent to our union? Aside. It's a horrid plunge, but I can't help it. Mizzle, aside. Egad, this is jumping from the frying pan into the fire. I hope the old woman won't be looking after me. Cotton takes Mrs. Stitchley's hand. This, Harriet, will be your mother-in-law. Mizzle, aside. A lucky escape. Then, Papa, there will be three weddings. Yes, we can give away one another. While Mr. Addison is content with merely being a spectator. Come, this troublesome day's work is well over. You have some time had my forgiveness, Harriet. I wish not to say anything unpleasant, but when I contrast your conduct with that of these two excellent young men... Oh, sir, we have done but our duty... Come forward, Bobby. I repeat it, our duty. Our duty is to amuse these ladies and gentlemen. And if anything we have done has contributed to that desirable end, we certainly think our day has been well spent. The End End of A Day Well Spent by John Oxenford Bridges by Claire Kummer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bridges by Claire Kummer. Characters Penfield Parker, Jr. of Parker and Son, Bridge Builders. Read by Chuck Williamson. Wally Breen. His friend, also in the office. Read by Philip Gould. Enid Birdsall, the girl who wants to have a bridge built. Read by Carmen Fulmer. Narrated by Avai. Scene. The inner office of Parker and Son on the 18th floor of an office building downtown in New York City, facing the river. At the back, a wide window looking out on the sky, which is deep blue, but changes to rosy sunset light during the scene. 
there is a door leading into the outer office right on wall right a picture of a suspension bridge on wall left a map of the united states a large table with blueprints scattered about right center a smaller table down left against the wall on this table a walking stick and hat belonging to penfield time about five o'clock on a spring afternoon on rise penfield and wally discovered they are in the midst of a heated discussion the rest of the office force has gone the large table separates the arguing pair penfield down left of table not looking at wally what's the matter with artists wally above table i don't know what's the matter with them they're all right i suppose i should say they are all right and i'm going to be one i can paint can't i i suppose so i know i can paint i know you can build bridges that's your inheritance a fine inheritance bridges to build well why not do both did you say both i did i said both why not do both doesn't everybody know that doing both is responsible for all the failures in the world don't you have to concentrate to succeed well can't you concentrate on both how can you do two things at once it's perfectly easy sometimes i do three things at once i'm not speaking of you whoever did both that amounted to anything well i'm sure there have been people only you get me so excited i can't think of them well who who i've thought of one he was just what you are too pin an architect and he broke loose and did something else ruskin john ruskin nothing to do with the case ruskin was a writer pure and simple well i don't know how pure and simple he was but i know he did two things at once and did em darned well i don't want to be an architect i don't like anything about it i don't like blueprints taking one up i hate the color of em isn't that horrible that blue is positively profane i don't like measuring things i don't like arches and rivets i want to paint that requires a man's life and i'm perfectly willing to give mine and incidentally your father's you don't think it's going to kill the old man do you if i leave the office it might picking up long envelope and document attached if your father knew you'd got the commission to build this bridge and thrown it down i think it would come pretty close to finishing him well i won't let him know it i'll just tear it up right now give it to me wally without giving up the envelope why pen it's tremendous with all your father's done he never had anything like this it puts you right at the top why a bridge like this it'll be in all the geographies it'll change the map of the world the map of the world's all right i wish people would let it alone and there's something so inspiring about it a beautiful bridge spanning a river think what it might mean in wartime think of seeing an entire regiment marching across the bridge in perfect step the bridge falls down if they do that you know well marching any old way as long as they get across but what's the use you're going to give it up and i may as well get out before i'm fired lays envelope on table fired why they'll need you more than ever who will i don't believe there'll be any parker and son anyway your father only let me in because he thought it would please you i'll never be anything in this business i only love it that's all all why that's the whole thing that's why i expect to be a good painter wally because i love it i know you can afford to expect things i can't when you paint your first sunset that lets me out 
I promise that you shall stay in this accursed place till you have a long gray beard, my dear fellow, <laughs> if that's what you want. Thanks, but— oh, my first sunset. It's going to be one that I saw at Marblehead last summer. Saffron and mauve, with the sky turquoise and some puffy clouds smudged in with your finger, lined with rose and gold. I don't know where the rose and gold came from, but there they were. I wouldn't start in on a sunset like that if I were you. I'd try a quiet one. I shall start in on the noisiest sunset I can think of. I'll go forth to be a painter joyously, Wally, with bells ringing and— A table bell in the outer office rings. Hasn't everyone gone? A knock on the door. Enid opens it. I beg your pardon. Is it all right for me to come in? Certainly. Come right in. I thought perhaps I ought to wait out there until someone asked me who I wanted to see, but there was no one to ask me. <laughs> I should be out there, but, you see, I'm in here quarreling with the firm. Enid to Parker. Oh, are you the firm? <laughs> I'm the son part of it. My name is Birdsall. Enid Birdsall. Well, can we do anything about it? Any relation to Rufus Birdsall? Excuse me. Introducing Wally. This is Mr. Breen. How do you do? Yes, he was my great uncle. How splendid. You mean because he's left me all his money? No, I didn't. That's splendid, too. But I meant we're sort of related because he was in my great-grandfather's class at college. Really? I didn't know they had colleges then. Oh, yes. They had colleges and campuses and everything. Yes, indeed. Why, yes. Penfield, wishing to check the garrulous Wally. Mm, pardon me for interrupting, but what did you want to see me about? Well, maybe I shouldn't have come at all. I, I mean... I'm not sure that this is the sort of place where one asks about such things. Why, of course it is. You can ask about anything here. Uh, just a moment, Wally. What things, Miss... Uh... Enid. Enid Birdsall. Was it all right for me to ring the bell out there? I saw it on the table and I... Perhaps I shouldn't have rung it. Certainly. It was splendid. But that's not what you wanted to ask me about, is it? No. Why, you see, I want to have a lot of things done by reliable people, and Uncle Rufus talked so much about you, about Parker. Your father's name is Parker, isn't it? Yes. So is mine, as it happens. Yes. Uncle Rufus said that everything that Mr. Parker had anything to do with was so splendid. I hope he included me. Your father built a suspension bridge when Uncle Rufus was in Congress. And that seemed to endear your father to Uncle Rufus. It probably endeared your Uncle Rufus to my father. I don't know why a suspension bridge should endear people to each other particularly. They might have gone through a lot of suspense together. But you were saying... Oh, yes. Well, you see, I want to make 500 acres up on the Hudson perfectly beautiful as a sort of memorial to uncle. And then I want to make about five acres beautiful, just a little way, for me to live on myself. And one thing I especially want. Is it all right for me to go on? Go right on. It's fine. Penfield, offering chair. Sit here, won't you? Enid, taking it. Thank you. You see, there's a Darling little island, just a little way out in the river, with trees and rocks and everything that cats and birds and little animals love. I want to have it fixed up for my pets when they get old. You know, pets don't like to be talked about. They don't like to have people say, Poor old Fido, he must be 19. He really ought to be chloroformed. Any more than we do. And they know. When people say those things, well, I want to separate them from people. 
So I thought of the island and having a darling little rustic bridge. Oh, a bridge. I should say a landscape gardener is what you want. Penfield, giving him a severe look. I build bridges, don't I? Then we can really talk about it? Certainly. I'll get a piece of paper, and you can describe the place to me. Goes to table for pad and pencil. It seems queer to do all that for animals. Does it? But animals are so wonderful. I know, but... Animals are just as nice as they know how to be. But we're not, are we? I'm so sorry for them that they have to be with us. Penfield, returning. Now, what's the shape of the island? He sits on left end of table. It's sort of long at one end and round on the other and hilly in the middle. Penfield, sketching rapidly as she speaks. Anything like that? Showing her what he is doing. Precisely like that. You want some sort of a building for the old pets to live in, don't you? Of course. And I want a lovely fountain. Like an Italian fountain, with part of it sunk in the ground for them to drink out of. My idea is that they will become sort of wild, in a nice way. And that they'll prefer drinking under the trees to having water bowls in their house. Penfield, sketching. I see. Jungle stuff. All meet at the fountain at five. Yes, the way they do in Kipling's books. Are these animals all friendly? Oh, yes. The cats and the dogs and the birds. There's no trouble about that. But do you think they'll remain friendly, living in this way? Oh, yes, because they'll all sort of get wild together, you see. Penfield showing sketch. How's that? Oh, how did you do it all in a minute? It's perfect. And that railing, it's just the kind of a one Gilbert loves to lie on. You're wonderful, Mr. Parker. Gilbert? He's the oldest cat. Wally, strolling down right. Are you going to have any pictures in the animal house? Because I know a very fine one of a sunset. It's not finished yet, but I think almost any cat that cared for a sunset would like it. Pictures? Why, I don't want pictures in my own house. Penfield, looking up. See if there isn't a book on Italian fountains in the library out there in the office, Wally. Will you? Certainly. Excuse me just a moment. Exit Wally. Penfield, seriously, laying down pad. Tell me, why don't you like pictures? Why, I just don't like to have them around, do you? I mean, if the wall is nice. But why? They prevent me from seeing my own pictures, I guess. When life is wonderful, when real things are wonderful that we see ourselves, pictures are disturbing, don't you think so? Oh, disturbing? Yes, that was the only trouble with Uncle Rufus. He collected pictures. They were everywhere. Strange people's grandfathers and grandmothers, and artists' pictures of themselves, and Madonnas, and ballet dancers, and girls with oranges, and fish, and vegetables. You couldn't get away from them. One evening, I remember I sat by the fire in the library. It had been such a wonderful day, and I was living it all over again. I looked up and my eyes rested on the picture of a large pumpkin, a perfect pumpkin. You could have taken it and cut it up and made it into a pie. Only the trouble was, no one had. Think of my beautiful reverie, interrupted by a pumpkin. Uncle paid thousands of dollars for it. But don't you like pictures of the sea and sunsets? Why, I've lived by the sea through nearly all my summers, and my eyes when they're closed are full of sunsets. 
Strange, isn't it? When you came in, I was just talking of becoming an artist. Oh, don't. That is, don't if you can help it. Because you don't like pictures? Oh, no, not that. But people who paint and write and do those things, well, they're out of it, aren't they? Out of it? Yes. I mean, they miss everything. While they're painting and writing, we're living. When they get through, if they ever do, it's too late. Or they're too tired. They must be. You can't do both. It's impossible. Penfield, looking at her curiously. Uh, but you wouldn't have people stop writing altogether, would you? No, they have to, of course. And it isn't so annoying anyway. Books don't stare at you like pictures. What a horrible idea, stare at you. Yes, they do, don't they? Of course there are times when they might come in. If you had just killed somebody and looked up and saw Judith and the dagger, it would be all right. Or if you'd had fish for dinner and were thinking of it, and looked up and saw a large plate of mackerel and whatever goes with it. By who was the wonderful fish man? Don't, I beg of you. No, because I didn't come to talk about pictures. We're not getting on at all. Penfield, looking at her with interest. Oh, I don't know. About the plans, I mean. Oh, well, you know, it seems to me that before we can really get anywhere, I must see the place, <laughs> actually see it. This is all... Refers to sketch. Just what we've been talking about. Pictures. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. How do I know there is an island? I want to see it. I hoped you would. When do you want to start the work on the bridge, and so on? I thought in the fall. I'm going to be away, traveling the summer. Oh, that's too bad. Is it? Why? Well, only that the best time to build bridges is in the spring. They, well, they seem to thrive better somehow. Do they? Well, I don't have to go away. But could you do it this spring? You must be so busy. I don't like to ask you to build my bridge before you do anything else, because you must have such important ones to do. I haven't anything important. Just one small commission that can wait. Picking up contract and laying it down again. Well, when could you come? Would tomorrow morning be too soon? I know. I can't imagine anything sooner. Uh, better, I mean. Enid, taking card out of her bag. Here's a timetable, and if you're not afraid, I'll meet you at the station. I'm afraid, but do it. I say that because I'm just learning to drive my car. Don't without someone with you. Promise me you won't. And, and I'll tell you. If you could only stay until tomorrow, I could, that is, if you'd let me, I could drive you up in my car. Oh, how splendid. But would it be all right? I mean, I feel as if I ought to ask someone, and I haven't anyone to ask but you. Do you really think it would be all right? I know it would. It would be magnificent. You see... I'm all alone in the world. And when I say alone, I really mean it. I've no one to be responsible to but Margaret Hindley, my old nurse. She lives with me, and I consult her about everything. It's wonderful because she's such respectable ideas. And yet she always agrees with me, because she loves me so, you see. I see. She's such a dear, and she's a little deaf, too. Would you mind if she went up with us? In the car? Mind? I should say not. From your description, she must be altogether delightful. They go to window where the glow of the sunset is deepening. 
Enid, seeing the sky out the window. Oh, what a beautiful sky! What a wonderful sunset! Isn't it? Now, honestly, wouldn't you like to have a picture of it? But I have it. Enter Wally. They do not notice him. Enid, looking out of window. Oh, look, it's changing. It's getting pinker. Penfield, watching her. Beautiful. Wally exits, rings bell in outer office, and enters again. Well, I found a book on Italian fountains of the time of Benvenuto Cellini. Couldn't you find something a little earlier, or a little later? I might. Enid to Penfield. But I must go, really I must. I think it's just wonderful of you to do this for me. But I do think it's important to have bridges built right, don't you? Even if they're only little ones. Oh, most important. Big bridges are splendid, with trains rushing over them and ships sailing under them. But little rustic bridges are sweeter. Don't you think so, Mr. Breen? Sweeter? Oh, yes. Yes, undoubtedly. And then yours, with all the animals going over to the old lady's home. Why, that's going to be a very affecting spectacle. Enid to Penfield. Goodbye. Until tomorrow. You will hear from me the very first thing in the morning. We must let Margaret decide it, of course. But I'm sure she'll say yes. When shall I call for you? About seven o'clock. And where? At the St. Regis. All right. I'll be there. Wally to Penfield, aside. You'll be in bed. In case I should be detained, you might call up my house. Gives her a card. Thank you. Goodbye. I shouldn't have said all those things about pictures. I'm so glad you did. Goodbye. Exit Enid. Wally returning to the original argument. Well, are you going to build the bridge? Wally, I'm going to build such a bridge as was never seen before. I'm going to have roses on the bank where the bridge takes off. Those climbing, spreading, rambling roses. They will reach out to the bridge and they will climb all the way across it. It will be actually a bridge of roses. Then what will you do? I'll go and stand on it. That's not what the specifications call for. I should think it would look funny all covered with those things. What bridge are you talking about? The bridge for the government. Oh, I'm not going to touch that until fall. But you will do it then. Hurrah! After all, Wally... There is something wonderful about bridges. The bell rings. The door opens. Enid enters. Why, the elevators have stopped running. And I want to ask, is it many flights down? Only eighteen. He crosses to table left, takes his hat and stick, returns to Enid, holds the door open for her. Allow me. Exit Enid, followed by Penfield. Wally looks after them with a benign smile. Curtain End of Bridges by Claire Kummer Efficiency by Robert H. Davis and Purdy Poor Sheehan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciation by Theodore Roosevelt Office of Theodore Roosevelt, November 8, 1917 Gentlemen, I very heartily congratulate you, as an American, upon having produced this piece in the form of a play and in now producing it in the form of a story. You teach a great lesson. You show in dramatic manner how the Prussianized militaristic autocracy of the Hohenzollerns has turned Germany into an inhuman machine for the destruction of what is highest and best in mankind. 
Germany today occupies toward other peoples, and to a great extent toward her own docile and deluded working men and peasants, a position which in point of international morality does not essentially differ from that of the Mongols under Genghis Khan and the Tartars under Timur. But in addition to their imitating the Mongols and Tartars, the Germany of the Hohenzollerns has brought every resource of a materialistic civilization, and especially every resource of a materialistic science to aid in the widespread application of their brutal, treacherous and merciless world ethic. In consequence, Germany has made herself a source of horror and of danger to all free peoples. You have well set forth the hideous evil of German militarism. To complete the picture, however, we must steadily keep in mind how this brutal militarism has been aided by the advocates of a non-moral and unmanly pacifism in certain other countries, including our own. The American professional pacifist has been the efficient ally of the brutal German militarists. Each alike has failed to understand that righteousness must be our aim, that we must endeavor to secure justice and fair dealing and mercy as between man and man, as between man and woman, as between nation and nation. In the long painful struggle to achieve these ends, weakness and timidity are traitor virtues, sham virtues, and those who profess and practice them give aid and comfort to the apostles of brutal wrongdoing. Sincerely yours, Theodore Roosevelt. Mr. Robert H. Davis, Mr. Curly P. Sheehan, 8 West 40th Street, New York. Cast of Characters The Emperor Modeled on Kaiser Wilhelm II Read by Chuck Williamson The Scientist Read by Abai Number 241 Read by Philip Gould Stage Directions Read by Phone The Persons of the Play The Emperor, a person attired in military costume, indicating the highest order of elaborate modern mode, sage green in tone. He wears a short, olive-colored cape coat, the left flap of which is thrown back disclosing 1. The Order of Merit 2. The Triple Cross 3. A seven-starred emblem of diamonds, emeralds, and rubies, known as the Reward of Heaven, designed by the Emperor himself and bestowed by the grace of the Almighty upon His Majesty's Imperial Person. The Scientist, a small thin man, garbed in frock suit, flowing black tie, thin of face, bulging eyes, horn spectacles, heavy head of grey hair, thin straggly grey beard, and small moustache. He is very animated. He wears a long Inverness-style dark overcoat and carries a portfolio containing reports and statistical matter. Number 241, stands six feet, is very erect and stiff of posture. Closely cropped hair, large face, rather heavy of expression. Upon entering, he is garbed in full-length war grey cloak, with white band and waist buttoned in front. The conventional metal war helmet now in general use. Hands in white cotton gloves. He moves with the deliberation of an automaton. In reality, he is 50% human and 50% machine, being composed of 1. Left artificial leg. 2. Two artificial hands. Three, artificial right forearm and elbow. Four, artificial left eye, which scientist has converted into a telescope. Five, artificial left ear, which is also a telephone. Six, all his teeth are metal, synthetic gold, but cheaper and harder. He can bite barbed wire in twain. Underneath his great cloak, he wears the regulation infantry uniform and a bayonet in a scabbard. His speech is laboured. Scene Private audience chamber of an emperor, in purple and gold, with magnificent throne chair curved elaborately, a canopy extending over the seat. Regal flat-top table left centre containing mounted figure of the emperor, in bronze and a large mushroom gold gong. A purple and gold cloth falls over both ends of the table. The cloth is decorated with crown and sceptre. Heavy purple curtains fall from back wall. A modern rifle leans against the left back corner. Efficiency At rise of curtain, stage empty. Enter the emperor, followed by the scientist. 
the emperor with a curt and preoccupied air the scientist with an air of fawning enthusiasm emperor crossing toward throne chair in which he seats himself proceed proceed scientist placing portfolio on table and smilingly rubbing his hands modesty sire causes me to falter my time is limited the crown prince awaits me when your majesty comprehends this greatest of all birthday gifts a million cripples transformed into a million fighting units your majesty's might becomes terrible emperor indulgently generalities i particularize as emperor makes sharp gesture that he is ready to listen the keynote of efficiency is the elimination of waste our problem was to eliminate the waste represented by the wounded in brief we have succeeded emperor beginning to display interest how so after countless experiments we can now take a soldier no matter how badly wounded and return him to the trenches a super soldier no longer a bungling mortal man but a beautiful efficient machine <laughs> you are enthusiastic but not contagious deprecatory gesture but your promises have not always been kept the proof your majesty i foresaw your doubts i brought huh. a specimen scientist appreciating the jeu d'esprit perfectly he's in the ante-room bring him in bring him in uh i beg your majesty's pardon but he is not altogether pleasant to look upon nonsense whatever makes for the strength of the dynasty is agreeable to the imperial eyes scientist with tremulous delight may i certainly make haste scientist nimbly crosses to door opens it and ejaculates command attention forward Hep. there is a momentary silence then a metallic clatter as if caused by a movement of iron then a heavy step enter two for one erect with measured tread observing nothing he comes down to centre of stage where he stops in response to the scientist's order halt as two for one stands at military attention the scientist with manifest delight flutters bowing before emperor and explains the ultimate triumph our two hundred and forty first experiment hence number two hundred and forty one during this explanation two for one does not stir the emperor stares at two for one with a sort of horrified fascination he marches splendidly the least of his accomplishments permit me returns to two for one whom he prods two for one remaining impassive magnificent gesture of approval as he carries on inspection of arms hands body and head of two for one runs finger around left eye taps gently left ear contemplates ensemble and makes gesture for two for one to open mouth two for one opens mouth and shows glittering array of metallic teeth he shuts them with click like a steel trap perfection right arm two for one lifts right arm in stiff but sweeping gesture left knee two for one crooks left knee twice hands two for one opens and closes both cotton gloved hands and manipulates fingers you guarantee his efficiency absolutely demonstrate scientist approaches two for one who continues to stand immobile and very swiftly removes helmet long cloak and cotton gloves disclosing two metallic hands and wrists you ask me your majesty if he is efficient i reply more efficient than before he fell in battle crosses to corner and gets rifle returns to center two forty one attention observe your majesty scientist tosses rifle to two for one who catches it surely but stiffly in his metal hands against which the weapon clangs scientist puts two for one through manual of arms 
The whole scene following is punctuated by military commands in the following order. Attention! Carry arms. Present arms. Shoulder arms. Parade rest. And now, Your Majesty, mark this. Fix bayonets. Make ready. Aim. Fire. Two for one completes maneuvers by pulling trigger and snapping lock, whereupon scientist takes rifle and tosses it to Seti. Emperor, leaning forward with look of wonderment in his face. Colossal. Two for one comes to attention and is inert again. Are not the possibilities impressive? Beyond our dreams. I estimate the restoration of five army corps now immobilized because of missing arms and legs, deafened ears and blinded eyes. Something of a shock to civilization. Stupendous. We recruit from the hospitals. Emperor, with dawning realization of the magnitude of the suggestion. And the hospitals are overflowing. My dear professor... Science is the hope of the dynasty. Is it not amazing? Quite. Scientist, proceeding with examination. A test for the ear. Scientist taps left ear of two for one gently, then crosses behind throne chair right and makes three light taps on back of chair discernible to audience, while two for one bends ear attentively in that direction, half turning body. Scientist reappears. Two for one resumes original posture, salutes, and holds up three fingers. Emperor, peering round at scientist. What are you doing? I tapped the throne three times very gently. Did your majesty not hear? No. Ah, but the super soldier did, ten paces distant. Oh, it is stupendous. He crosses the table, opens portfolio, takes out a small white card. To Emperor. With your permission? Two, two for one. What is written hereon? Two for one closes right eye and stares fixedly with left. Nothing. Scientist smiles knowingly at Emperor. Turns card over. Ah, very good. Scientist holds card up again. Once more. Two for one. After a moment of staring, he reads deliberately. A nation's will should be the will to power. Emperor takes card from scientist and glances at it. Correct. Scientist, crossing to center and returning card to portfolio, then addressing Emperor. This is my greatest achievement. Never has science done so much for the human animal. From a shattered, bleeding wreck of no value to this country, I have made him into an efficient man. Hands of steel, leg of bronze, arm of nickel and aluminum, telescopic eye, an ear that... Two for one bends his ear off stage left. You hear something? What do you hear? A bugle call sounding the assembly. Impossible. Open the door. Scientist opens door, and distant bugle call is faintly heard off stage. God in heaven! Miraculous! A scientist gently closes door aglow with triumph. What have you accomplished? Scientist, with fervor. A resurrection. Complete! A triumph over matter. The fragment of a soldier reconstructed under the magic touch of science, without which he would today be rotting on the field, a source of pestilence, a worthless thing. Science set him on his feet, gave him a leg, an arm, hands, a telephonic ear, a telescopic eye. Emperor leans back and deliberately inspects two for one. How long have you been in my service? Two for one hesitates and salutes. You may speak. Eighteen years, Majesty. Married? Yes, Majesty. Children? Seven, Majesty. Five sons. Two for one, bitterly. One, dead. Three, at the front. My youngest follows. His age? 
Two for one. Swallowing. Sixteen. Emperor. Coldly to scientist, referring to two for one. When does his furlough end? Noon. Tomorrow. By nightfall he will again be in the trenches. Emperor. Reflectively. And if he returns, I will award him the triple cross. More brightly. This will stimulate the military ardor of the crown prince. It will delight him to see this reassembled soldier. Scientist, recalling an important detail. And moreover, your majesty, there is this aspect to be considered. We are manufacturing human extremities on a standard interchangeable basis. For example, as your majesty perceives his left leg... Picks up ruler from desk and wraps left leg of two for one, which gives out metallic ring. Is metal. As is also his left forearm, including the elbow. Taps it. And both hands. Taps them also. Two for one receives these attentions stoically, as each member of his body clangs in a different note. Furthermore, your gracious majesty, if any or all of these parts are shattered in the course of battle, our corps of trained mechanicians, ever at hand, supplies the parts by numbers, and the fighting unit embodied in the individual returns with but little loss of time and the minimum of inconvenience to your majesty's service. What does he weigh? Equipped? Emperor nods. 175 pounds. And without his equipment? 105. Emperor, brushing his hand across his forehead. Little more than half a man. True, your majesty. And therefore requires but half the rations, half the care of a whole unit. There is that much less to nourish. You have brought about the greatest advancement in the history of civilization. Tell me, what else of the telescopic eye? That interests me. I shall be surprised at nothing. Your achievements baffle. The telescopic eye, your majesty. Scientist circles the left eye of two for one with his finger is superior to the human eye in two important characteristics. First, it possesses the telescopic quality, as you have observed, and second, its power is undiminished by darkness. Emperor, with incredibility. You mean he can see in the dark? Just that. And moreover, your majesty... Halt. This is very interesting. We will test that also. Demonstrate. Scientist, dubiously. Does your majesty object to darkness? Emperor, hesitates, then replies with an effort. No, the electric switch is there. Points to white button on the table. Scientist, to two for one. Right about face. Give attention to his majesty. Scientist crosses to table and lays his finger beside the button. Two for one observes the whole transaction carefully. To Emperor. I will switch off the light. Be so kind as to perform any act you may, and he will describe your movements. Are you ready? Emperor. Bracing himself in the chair. Lights out. Scientist presses button. Stage is in total darkness. Describe my movements as they occur. Voice of Scientist. To two for one. Do you understand his majesty? Yes. He leans forward in his chair. He lifts both his hands. The palms come together. He bows his head in prayer. Voice of Emperor, sharply. Lights? Scientist presses button. Lights on, disclosing Emperor exactly in the attitude described by 241 with a startled look on his face, palms still together. Enough, your majesty. Emperor, relaxing nervously. It is beyond human understanding. Recovers himself and rises. And it gives me infinite happiness to bestow upon you this mark of our esteem. Takes from his own breast the order of merit and pins it on breast of scientist. The order of merit. There is but one higher decoration. The symbol of divine right, the reward of heaven. Emperor lays his hand on the seven-starred emblem. Which, 
I alone possess. Scientist, overwhelmed, bows and kisses Emperor's hand. Your gracious majesty, to have received this from your imperial hand on your majesty's birthday is indeed a distinction. A furtive glance escapes two for one, a thin smile reveals his metallic teeth, a sinister look comes into his eyes. Emperor reseats himself with a gesture of benediction. I marvel at his dexterity, at his auricular powers, at his incomparable eyesight. What is his range of vision? Your Majesty, he can see the enemy twenty or thirty miles away, count its cannon, its horses, its equipment. Wait, I will make another test. I carry next to my heart the smallest copy of the Bible extant. It can be read only under a microscope. Is the test too severe? On the contrary, Your Majesty, it is preferable. Crosses and takes Bible from Emperor's hand. Turns to two for one. Attention! Right about face. Two for one salutes. I open the book at haphazard. Read a verse from this page. Matthew 5th chapter, 4th verse. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The 5th. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Scientist turns to Emperor and bows, the book still open in his hands. He is right. I am familiar with Matthew. Turn to another page. Scientist opens the Bible elsewhere, holds it up. Scientist to two for one. Attention. Read. Isaiah third chapter fifteenth verse. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor? saith the Lord God of hosts. Uh, stop. Emperor leans back in his chair under stress of great emotion, his hand sweeping his brow repeatedly. Scientist closes the book, bows again with greater humility, and returns the book to Emperor. Emperor takes book and thrusts it in his bosom. His powers are diabolical. I wish to experiment with him alone. Relaxes and gazes vaguely into the distance. Scientist drops portfolio and coat on settee. Hasten. I will summon you with that bell. Two for one remains stolidly at attention, an expression of awakening purpose in his eyes. Your Majesty commands. Bows elaborately. Exit left. Emperor with imperial dignity stares two for one down after a duel of the eyes, imposing his will upon the soldier follows a moment of inspection in which wonderment is the dominant note. He rises from the throne and walks slowly halfway around the impassive soldier, studying him critically. Emperor's expression changes to bewilderment, tinged with fear. The situation is uncanny. Where were you born? In the South, Majesty. Your trade? Two for one. With a helpless, involuntary gesture, extending his hands. I was a florist. Emperor stares at the metal hands, two for one observing the expression. I made bouquets. Not with these. Emperor averts his face. But with my absent hands. Emperor reseating himself. War is not a festival of flowers. Majesty. A wreath I could make, slowly, for the dead. He leans toward the Emperor. Emperor, observing the somewhat cynical note of the soldier, becomes grave. Are you not grateful to science for these wonders performed? Two for one salutes. Speak. What shall I say? You are a man again. You are whole once more. Yes, Majesty, but my heart is broken. Why? My people are starving. My wife is lonely. 
then you are not proud that science has found a way to double the strength of our army by bringing me twice to slaughter emperor leaning forward with ferocity his hands on the arms of his chair what ingrate by doubling the strength of your army you have multiplied human grief takes two steps laboriously toward emperor you dare rebel in the presence of your emperor dare the fear has gone out of my tortured body into yours takes another step toward electric button his heavy feet sounding ponderously emperor cowers back in the chair hollow-eyed down on your knees and crave your emperor's pardon that part of me which is steel cannot bend to mortal man i will get down on my knees only to god and ask him to forgive me what i now intend to do twice in the red shambles of the trenches i am the hope of the dynasty throws his arm wide no i am the hope of the people with trembling rigidity two for one reaches toward electric button the day of your birth shall henceforth be known as the day of your death and celebrated as the birthday of liberty two for one smashes electric button with a steel hand total darkness follows two slow footfalls are followed by a gasping intake of breath from the throne chair voice of emperor in terror lights lights i need no lights lights you have made me live in the dark and now you shall die in the dark voice of emperor choking <laughs> mercy you cannot escape me in the shadows i can see you i can hear you come to my iron arms don't tremble don't shrink go as a king should go to meet the king of kings a rush of feet, an overwhelming impact of bodies, a shriek of agony from the depths, the overturning of the throne, a scuffle in which the human body mingles with the rattle of metal, a long, choking, gasping blast, a ripple of stertorous breath, the clink of metal as two for one gets to his feet. Silence. Again, the ponderous footfalls are heard crossing the room, which is still in darkness. Two for one puts on his overcoat, his helmet, etc. Footfalls are again heard crossing to the table. Two for one presses the electric button. Lights. There stands two for one in full equipment, the emperor lying at the foot of the shattered throne, crumpled up in the most unkingly attitude, the emblem known as the reward of heaven glittering in the light. Two for one bends down, rends it from the emperor's bosom, fixes it upon his own left breast comes to attention and rings the gong on the table which gives out a low reverberating note two four one then turns to the door and stands with his arms stiffly suspended at his side his chest thrown out and a light of victory in his eyes enter scientist left he takes in the whole terrible scene cowers back scientist gasps as he stares at two four one <gasps> what is this two four one raising his metal fingers to heaven with an air of thunderous, choking finality. Efficiency. Curtain. End of Efficiency by Robert H. Davis and Purdy Poor Sheehan. Biscuits and Bills by O. B. Dubois. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters Jack Maynard, 
Read by Ryan Bissett. Mrs. Maynard. Read by Maria de Fátima da Silva. Mr. Brainerd. Read by Philip Gould. Stage Directions. Read by phone. Biscuits and Bills. Scene. Dining room of the Maynard flat with doors center, left, and right. Large table in center with two photographs on easels. Sideboard on left. Telephone down right against flat. Shaving table and chair back of it down right. Easy chair and couch with six cushions down left. Discovered at rise of curtain, Mr. Jack Maynard in coat sleeves, without collar, seated at small table, shaving. Mrs. Maynard examining her hat, holding it at a distance and rearranging the feathers. My father always shaved in the bathroom. Jack Maynard, awkwardly trying to shave left side of face with right hand. Your mother never used your father's bathroom for a storage warehouse. Mrs. Maynard, trying on hat in front of sideboard. It was not necessary in my father's home. You have probably forgotten that I came from a very luxurious home. And you have probably forgotten that your father commenced housekeeping in two rooms for which he paid $10 a month. And that's the way my Uncle Henry commenced, too. That is what our washwoman pays. There are seven Negro tenants in the house. Shall I engage rooms there? Bell rings off stage. There is our groceryman, and I am ashamed to meet him. His bill has not been paid in three weeks. Exit center. Jack, wiping lather from his face. He partially buttons on collar, allowing free end of four-in-hand tie to hang loose. Uh, times must have changed. Why, I have treasured that argument about Papa's early start for weeks, waiting an opportune moment to present it. The moment it arrives, I present it. Biff! Bang! Argument is busted. Walks. Something wrong, I know that. Good salary, debts, bills, duns, weeping wife. Oh, there is something wrong. Now, if Uncle Henry had only... Oh, what's the use? He'll live twenty years longer, I suppose. <sighs> Enter Mrs. Maynard, center exit. She lays the grocery bill on the shaving table while Jack adjusts his collar. I say, uh, how much do we owe this, uh, uh, blooming grocer? Twenty-four dollars and thirty cents. And the last time he was paid, it was with the money Mama gave me when she was here. Jack throws himself in easy chair and takes up newspaper. When is, uh, Mother coming again? She suggested that I drop her a line right after we had settled up with our tradesmen. Well, anyway, I paid the laundry bill last week. It's all right, and I'm glad you did it. But please don't become festive about it, because I have the bill right here. Hold it up. Twelve cents. And here is another one. Cigars. Nine dollars. Well, I'm thinking about being economical all the time. I am. And I'm going to change several things around here. Things have got to be reduced. Where do you expect to start in? I'm going to cut that laundry bill down next week for one thing. Mrs. Maynard, placing another bill on the table. The milkman was here this morning and wants his money. Jack, giving close attention to his paper. Much? About thirteen dollars. Jack, starting from his chair. What? Have we been buying a cow? Mrs. Maynard places another bill on table. And the gas bill is running up something awful. That is the only bill we can make light of, eh? Oh, you can evade this situation if you want to, but I am crushed, mortified, discouraged. When I think of the wardrobe I had before marrying you, why, I am the laughing stock of the block. Stock of the block. <laughs> that rhymes. Mrs. Maynard, growing excited. I am the most forlorn looking woman in this neighborhood. I am frumpy, shabby, dowdy. Jack, rising. Hold on, say that again. Mrs. Maynard, turning her back to him. 
No, I won't. Well, uh, if I understood you correctly, you said you were dowdy. Yes, dowdy, 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 dowdy. Jack, hand to face, thoughtfully. Well, by George, I never thought of it before, but I guess you were right. You said dowdy? Yes, I said dowdy, and I am. But pray, tell me, do you know the meaning of the word dowdy? Jack, after a pause. Who, me? Yes, you. Certainly I do. Well, what is it? Jack, seating himself again at shaving table. Fat. Mrs. Maynard, shaking him in her wrath. How dare you tell me that I am becoming stout? Isn't it enough that I must dress like a fright and look like a, a, a... Jack, arms folded on table in front of him. Dowdy. I want you to understand, Jack Maynard, that I do not have to put up with your insults. If I should tell Mama of your cruel, cutting remarks, do you suppose I would have to live here? No. Mama would say, come home as quickly as you can, dearie. That's what Mama would say. Jack, polishing his eyeglasses and holding them up to the light as he leans back in his chair. Would you go? Mrs. Maynard, shaking her finger in his face. In a minute, Jack Maynard. Jack, tipping back his chair and adjusting his glasses. Then why not run along and tell Mama now? Mrs. Maynard, trying to be very dignified and impressive. When I leave this place to go home, I shall never return. Remember that, sir, never. Jack, glancing at her from the corners of his eyes. Er, uh, a heavenly home or Mama's? Mrs. Maynard, walking about very excitedly. Say it, say it. Say that you wish I were dead. I know you do, but let me tell you this, Jack Maynard. I intend to live. Live just to spite you. Oh, don't consider me. Say just one word more, and I will go now. Just one word. Dowdy. Oh, I am through with you, Jack Maynard. Puts on her hat wrong side foremost, feathers dangling in her eyes. I have stood what no mortal woman would stand, and Mamma shall know of this at once. We shall see, Mr. Maynard, we shall see. Goes to telephone and commences to talk into the receiver instead of the transmitter. Jack goes to chair left and places one foot upon it. Hello, Central. Give me Mamma's. No, excuse me. To Jack. Oh, you can laugh, sir. In receiver. Hello, Central. Give me 348L. Hello? Why don't you answer me? I shall report your inattention, young lady. How dare you talk back to me, miss? How dare you? Hangs up receiver. No, I will not mortify myself this way. I will not demean myself to this extent in your presence. Exit left. Jack goes to telephone, imitating his wife's voice. Give me mammoth. <laughs> Hello, Central. In transmitter. Give me 348L. Is this my dear father-in-law? This is Jack. Say, Dad, can you come over? What's the matter? Oh, nothing except that the roof is off, the boiler is busted, the pipes are frozen, tires all punctured, and the gasoline tank is empty. Noise of furniture being tossed about by Mrs. Maynard off stage. An empty traveling bag is thrown by her to the center of stage from left. It is followed by a large paper parcel. Tornado coming now. Goodbye, Dad. Hangs up receiver. Enter Mrs. Maynard, left. She is wildly excited, drags an open dress suit case, and has an armful of feminine wearing apparel. She deposits the suitcase on edge of table and thrusts the garments in without order. Suitcase falls to floor several times. Jack, hands behind his back. Going so soon? I cannot get away from here quickly enough. Then you take away everything that belongs to you because I will not be responsible for anything you leave behind. Brute! Silly ninny. Mrs. Maynard, drawing on gloves. Oh, if people only knew what a hard man you are. 
That's all right. You take your stuff with you. How can I take my piano? Since you ask my advice, I suggest a truck. But say, sit down. There are a number of things we'll have to fix up. How about that combination bookcase and writing desk? Half of that belongs to me. How about it? Well, since you ask my advice, I suggest an axe. Jack, on each side of large table. Jack pounds on table. Look here, young lady. This matter is far more serious than you imagine. I will give you one more chance. Tell me you are sorry, and he will commence all over. Mrs. Maynard, adjusting button on gloves. Me? Me? Sorry? Ha! I am not sorry. I am very happy. Very well, then. Call in your truckman. Takes a picture from table. Here's a photograph taken just before we were married. We were holding hands. Do you want it? No. All right. On the junk pile for that. He scales it to the rear. Mrs. Maynard picks it up and brushes it off. How dare you throw away that picture? Here's a picture of your cousin Gertie and myself taken at Atlantic City. I want that. Puts it in his pocket. Cousin Gertie, goodness, she tried hard enough to get you. But she didn't. Telephone rings. Jack answers. Hello? Yes? Oh, is that you, Billy? You were at the club. Certainly I will come over. Ah, you did not think I would leave my happy home? Well, you've caught me right this time. I will be there in about ten minutes. Do you mean to say that you are going over to that clubhouse? Jack, putting on hat and gloves. I certainly do. Then go. It is all over between us. Jack, with hand on door. Before I go, there is one thing I wish to say. Mrs. Maynard, stamping foot. Go now! But... Mrs. Maynard seizes a cushion. Not a word with me, sir. Go now! Points to central exit. Look here. I'm not going to allow you to. Mrs. Maynard, throwing cushion at his head. You scoundrel! You impudent rascal! Jack, who has dodged through center exit, returns. Say. Mrs. Maynard, throwing second cushion. Don't you call me say. Jack exits hurriedly, center exit. Mrs. Maynard, with cushion in each hand, awaits his return at center exit. Enter Jack sullenly, right exit. By Jove, I won't stand. Mrs. Maynard, throwing cushion. Not a word from you, you pinhead. Exit Jack, right exit. You, you noodle. Oh, if I could only think of the names I would like to call you. Enter Mr. Brainard, center exit. Mrs. Maynard, thinking it is Jack, throws cushion at him with great force. Oh, Papa, did I hurt you? Oh, he is to blame for this. Oh, I did not mean to hurt you. I only wanted to kill Jack. No, Papa, I wish I were dead. Throws herself in his arms. Tut, tut, little lady. This is treason. Come now, sit down and tell dear old dad all about it. He gathers up the cushions and tosses them on the floor between the sideboard and center exit. As he throws the last one, Jack enters center exit and it hits him. Jack, tossing arms over his head. Help! Please, help! What does this mean, sir? Come now, I want to know the worst. When it I think means what a kind that the fondest dreams of my life are over, that man. my ideals are shattered, and tomorrow I go forth into the world with no hope, up, no anchorage, left behind. no object in oh, life but to exist. Hold on now. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this? A Chinese kindergarten? Now then, one at a time. He Not one no man in a thousand would have stood for what I have. I have given up my club, him, given up smoking, given up inviting my in friends life. here. And Mr. Brainard hurriedly takes him by the arm and leads him to right exit. Jack resisting. Given up? Say, hold on, I want to talk. Given up? Stop, I tell you. Why, I have even given up. Mr. Brainard thrusts him through right exit. I'll give it up myself in a minute if I can't keep these turtle doves apart. Now, young lady, 
let me hear your tale of woe. Then I will put you out of the room and listen to his awful story. Oh, Papa, I have tried hard to please that man. I have slaved and toiled, planned, and, and suffered, and, and suffered, and everything. I see. I see. I have just one question to ask you. How do you feed him? Mrs. Maynard, sarcastically. Why, I sterilize all his milk, and I'm very, very particular about keeping his bottle clean. Kindly eliminate all sarcasm and answer my question. Do you supply him with good, wholesome food? He never complains. Aside, and doubling up her fist so that her father does not see. Oh, if he ever dared to complain. Look here, you headstrong little silly. You think you know it all, and by George you have missed the very first thing of importance. Don't you know that the best man who ever lived cannot tell the difference between sentiment and a full stomach? Now see what a sentimental man I... No, no, I mean see what a good cook your mother is? Can you cook as well as your mother? That's the question. You have hurt my feelings very much by asking that question. For while I am not by any means as good a housekeeper as Mama, yet I can assure you that her instructions have not been wasted on me. I will now give you an opportunity to converse with that poor, hungry, half-stuffed gentleman in the other room. Takes position near left exit and pauses. Now wait a minute. Come back here. I want to get this thing adjusted so that you will both be satisfied. There is nothing under the blue canopy of heaven but a divorce or a separation that will ever satisfy me. Exit left. Mr. Brainard silently gazes at left exit, then places hand in trouser pocket and faces audience. I'm a fool. That's what I am. I ought to be chained up nights. What I need is a messenger boy who will lead me around so that I won't get hit with the cars. Walks to shaving table. I wonder how this domestic row started anyway. Picks up one of the bills. Hello. This is a grocery bill. Now that dear daughter of mine became very touchy on the question of food supplies. I wonder what she orders from the grocery man. Puts on glasses. Pickled pig's feet, pickled Bismarck herrings, pickled eels, dill pickles, and pickles. Now wouldn't that give a man yellow jaundice? Continues reading. Liverwurst, head cheese, hand cars, schmear cars. Hmm. Drops the bill, turns away, and daintily wipes his fingers on his handkerchief. Everything on this bill is either canned or pressed or pickled. Think of a man who goes to a picnic every time he sits down to a meal. I guess the only thing under the blue canopy of heaven that will satisfy him is a square meal. Sits down at table and takes out checkbook. Well, it is a good thing that I have some cash in pickle, because I've got to pay these bills, I suppose. But this is a sour pickle for me, all right. Lays check on the bills. I will now listen to the troubles of my dear son-in-law. Position near right exit. But what is the use of listening to a man with a delicatessen liver? By Jove, I will take them both around to the house for dinner. I will find out what that blessed wife of mine intends to have tonight. At phone. Hello, Central? 348L, please. Hello, is that you, Harriet? This is John. Say, what are you going to have for dinner tonight? Yes, hot biscuits and an old-fashioned meat pie. Fine. Say, can I bring Jack and Emma around? All right, good. Say, how did you correct this sweet little daughter of yours? Ha <laughs> ha, spanked her. Well, excuse me. How are they? Oh, all right, until they break out again. No, nothing like the measles, just a little rash. And I've got one locked in the bedroom and the other in the kitchen. Enter Mrs. Maynard, left. All they need here is some good old-fashioned cooking. That's all. Goodbye. 
hangs up receiver. Hello. I thought I would fix it up to have you and Jack around to dinner tonight. Mr. Maynard can do as he likes, but I shall not go, Mr. Brainard. Look here, young lady, I know what you need, and if I had your mother here, you would get it. Why do you refuse? I refuse because you always take his part in every disagreement we have. You pamper him, you coddle him, you baby him, and you never lose the opportunity to contrast my cooking with Mama's. Hasten. Why, I can cook as well as Mama every day in the week. For fifty-two weeks in a year, I can. Mr. Brainard commences with suppressed laughter, holds his sides, stops, glances at her, and commences all over. Ends by placing his arms on the table before him, his head on his arms, convulsed with laughter. <laughs> Do not believe it? Mr. Brainard, looking up. Who? Me? Stop making me laugh. Rising. Come, put on your things and I will call Jack. I am not going. Oh, yes you are. Why, your mother is going to have hot biscuits tonight. Mrs. Maynard, laughing boisterously. Hot biscuits? They are nothing to make. Any woman can do it. And a fine old-fashioned meat pie with a brown brittle crust. Ooh, it would melt in your mouth. Mrs. Maynard, laughing again. A meat pie? Why, it is the easiest thing in the world to make. I have it often. Say, little daughter, you could not get up a dinner like that if you tried. Why, I've looked over your grocery bill, and the trouble with that husband of yours is that he is pickled. That's what ails him. Mrs. Maynard flies the sideboard and puts on a large bib apron. Oh, I have heard enough of this. He shall have his hot biscuits and his meat pie, and you shall remain here to dinner and witness the fact that I can do these things as well as Mamma. Mr. Brainard, alarmed. Hold on. Your mother expects me. Sit down. You make me nervous. Mr. Brainard collapses in chair. Tomorrow, points right exit. That man and I may separate forever, but tonight we'll prove that our separation is not due to the fact that I cannot cook. Exit left. Mr. Brainard, pathetically. I wish I was home. Takes a small vial from vest pocket and examines it. Well, I've got three indigestion tablets left anyway. I wonder if I've got my liver pills. Feels in pocket. Enter Jack, hurriedly, right. Say, I'm not going to stay in there all night. Why, where's Emma? She has gone to get dinner. I'm invited and we are going to have meat pie. What's that? Why, it's one of those brown, tempting, luscious, dreamy creations your dear old mother-in-law makes. Jack, pointing left exit. She is going to make one? Certainly. And hot biscuits. Jack sits down in big chair. I'm in the Royal Arcanum, and I don't want much fuss made, just a few flowers and a few kind words. Crosses his legs and waves one foot. Brainard does the same. Few moments pause, and from time to time they glance at each other. Audible sighs, etc. She... she says she can cook as well as your mother-in-law. <laughs> stop it! I tell you, stop it! I've got a sore lip. Mr. Brainard, rising. I ought to go home. I seldom, or seldom, don't you know, stay out as late as this. Takes coat and hat. Jack, taking hat away from him. Soon, not yet. You are going to stay to the funeral. Look here, I've got to go home. My wife expects me. I've reached the age where my dinner at home is an important event. I don't enjoy. Say, who expects you to get any enjoyment out of this? You are a mourner in this, that's all you are. Well, I'll just take my forty winks in the other room before dinner. I always do that at home. Go as far as you like. Exit Mr. Brainard, right. Huh. 
Not one, but two lambkins shall be laid upon this altar of indigestion. Places Brainard's hat on the table and takes position left center, back to table. The idea. Who's providing this show for this mournful function? Enter Mr. Brainard, right. He tiptoes to table, secures his hat, and executes dumb show of great glee as he exits right. It's me. I've got something to say. I'm the remains. Anybody would imagine that I was a dead one. Enter Mrs. Maynard, left. She has a wooden mixing bowl in her left hand and awkwardly extends her right to Jack. Her right hand is covered with sticky dough. Oh, Jack, this is terrible. Oh, what shall I do? I've got it all over my hand. Oh, Jack, get a coal shovel or something to scrape it off with. Jack, aside. I'll get the hook. Aloud and very dignified. Did you address your remarks to me? Don't, please don't. Oh, I'm so nervous. I think I will die. Jack holds his side in merriment and points at her. In her indignations, she sets the bowl on table. How dare you ridicule my efforts? How dare? Plunges left hand in the dough. Ooh, what have I done? Help, help! Extends both hands helplessly. Ooh, I've put my other hand in. Oh, you dear sweet darling Jack, help me. Oh, what a silly woman I am. Oh, Papa just pushed me right into this awful business. Honestly, he did, Jack. Oh, he exasperated me so, and I told him I could beat Mama at cooking. And oh, Jack, I can't even beat an egg. I don't even know how to boil water. Cries and puts both hands to her face. <laughs> oh, Jack, I'm blind. Help, help. Jack, wiping face with towel from sideboard. There, there, don't cry. I'll help you, you were a sweet little doe face. What can I do? Tell me what to put in to make it raise. Some kind of a powder. Seedlitz powder. Sounds all right. Wait, I've got it. Hurried exit. Left. He's so smart. I'm sure that's it. I'm sure that Mama used to say something about Seedlitz powder on rising. Enter Jack. Left. With two small boxes. I've got it. Here, hold this. Places box in right hand and extends her arms. Now the other one in this hand. Same business. Now I'll toss up a half dollar and see which one. Tosses. Right hand. She dumps entire contents in bowl. Oh, Jack, you were so clever. What was it? Rochelle salts. How perfectly wonderful of you, Jack. Now hold on a minute and I will get a tablespoonful of tea. What for? For the tea biscuits, of course. Exit left. Jack, stirring contents of bowl. Something has gone wrong somewhere. Stirs slower and slower, finally stops. Stuck. Takes box to light, goes back and examines contents of bowl, drops box. By Jove, it is plaster of Paris. I wonder what I am, a bricklayer or baker? Am I making statuary or biscuit dough? Enter Mrs. Maynard, left. Oolong or mixed tea? How long have I mixed it? I mixed it till it was nix on the mix. Look it over yourself, it resembles a frozen mustard plaster. Sits at small table. Well, we've got to think up something now. Just take a peep into the other room and see how Papa sleeps. We may have to chloroform him before we get through. Mrs. Maynard, open door, right. He's gone. Gone. Well, what do you think of a man who will bust up a funeral? Sir, I demand an explanation. I said, uh, a fun all. That's it. A fun all from an old Dutch word. See, fun, having fun, all, uh, that is all having fun. See, fun all, fun all, fun all. He busts up a fun all. Sees check on the bills. What's this? A check? Examines the bills. The bill's all paid and fifty dollars over? Hooray! Fifty dollars to spend! Press the button! Call the hall boy! Mrs. Maynard presses button near center exit. 
Oh, this is beyond my fondest hopes. Fifty dollars. Enter whole boy. Here, boy, go to the janitor at once and tell him that we desire to move into the large $75 apartment on the first of the month. These rooms are too small and mean for us. Exit hall boy to Mrs. Maynard. Now, sweetness, what do you want? I want a new spring suit with... That reminds me. I need a new suit. Hurriedly writes and thrust letter in envelope. Dear Taylor, duplicate my suit of last spring. Press the button, love, quick. Enter hall boy. Mail this at once. Half dollar for a stamp. Keep the change. Exit hall boy. Now, sweetness, what do you want? A new spring suit, a new hat. By Jove, that's what I need. A new silk hat. Boy, ho, boy. Enter hall boy. Dashes off second letter. Post this, boy. Exit hall boy. Now, sweetness, what do you want? I want a new spring suit, a new hat, a new pair of shoes. Ho, oh boy! Enter hall boy. Take this to the shoe store on the corner. Writes. Dear Jim, send up one pair of patent leather pumps, one pair of tan shoes, and one pair of French calf walking shoes. Hurry, boy! Exit hall boy. Now, sweetness. Say, where do I come in? All I have heard is, now sweetness, now sweetness, now sweetness. Well, that's all right. You haven't soured on this thing, have you? In the last three minutes, you have spent three times the amount of fifty dollars. By Jove, I never counted it up. Say, you should have held me back on this. Walks to position behind center table. Mrs. Maynard, position lower left of stage, turns her back to him indignantly. Me? Jack, standing between center table and center exit. That's exactly what I said. You, 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 I'm, you see, I'm altogether too liberal with you on money matters, I am. Enter Hallboy with letter, taps Jack on shoulder with it. Jack does not notice him. I'd spend every cent I made on you, I would. That's my trouble. Hallboy repeats business as above. Maynard, with hand behind him. Assumes thoughtful pose and faces sideboard. Hallboy quietly places letter in Maynard's right hand. Exit Hallboy. Mrs. Maynard, turning. Jack Maynard, the very hour a minute of our separation has come. Jack, advancing and bringing his right hand forward to point at her in his wrath. Not one single word from you, you ungrateful. Sees the letter and pauses to examine it in great wonder. What's this? A letter in a morning envelope? Both center stage. He tears it open. Uncle Henry is dead. This is awful. Reads. Mr. Maynard, dear sir, the sad duty of informing you of your uncle's death devolves upon me. Both stop and take out their handkerchief, crying. <laughs> Poor, dear, kind, lovable old Uncle Henry. Oh, this is very sad. Mrs. Maynard, crying. Dear Uncle Henry, kind Uncle Henry. Jack, turning over a page, continues to read. <clears throat> For a number of years, we all suppose that he intended to leave his property to you, but he has willed it all to your cousin Willie. Crushes the letter and folds his arms. Well, what do you think of Uncle Henry for a stingy old miser? Oh, Jack, how contemptible. I never did like him very much anyway, did I? It just shows how near right I always am when I depend upon my intuition. Jack, who has been slowly straightening out the crumpled letter, turns it over and reads the last page. However, it pleases me to inform you that all of his stocks, bonds, cash etc., have been left to you. <laughs> oh, poor, dear, kind, lovable Uncle Henry. Oh, this is sad. Ooh, dear, kind Uncle Henry. We will never see him again. Repeating the above, they commence the waltz about the stage. Curtain End of Biscuits and Bills by O.B. Dubois